This is the team of Island Air. Every day, they risk everything. The Kodiak Peaks and Wicked Seas make the island the world's most treacherous place to fly. These are the tales of Alaska's ultimate bush pilots. Kodiak Island, one of the most volatile areas of Alaska. Kodiak's extreme weather, rugged landscape, and rough seas make this place the deadliest piece of the planet to access by bush plane. For over 30 years, we've got an annual coming up in about two months. Bob Stanford and Island Air have kept Kodiak running. And all summer long, this plane's been working hard. 3-1, go ahead. From flights to remote villages, to transporting hunters and anglers on adventures of a lifetime. All right, guys, we're ready. Let's load up. Do it. Let's go hunting. Here down in there, the fleet consists of a Piper Cherokee 6. We've got a de Havilland Beaver on floats and a Britain Norman Islander. They're all very tough airplanes. They're your pickup trucks of the north. Yeah, we're just dropping off mail. I think we got a little bit of freight for them. It takes more than just machines to make this business work. So the wind is going down, which is good. Emily Pack is the dispatcher at Island Air. We're not moving. She keeps everything on the ground running smoothly. I love Island Air. We're all a big family, and we watch out for each other. In the air, Bob has veteran pilot Eric Howard. Uh, I wanted to fly here in Kodiak for the, the challenge. Lots of adventure around here. Float plane pilot in training, Peter Rosendahl. I'm the pilot, I'm the cargo guy. Got to be a jack of all airplane trades to uh, do the kind of flying up here. We're a lifeline to everybody out here. That's the story. Here you go, Shannon. Here's the last of it. I like flying. I always have. That's where I go to my happy place. Beaver's a 54. Pilots of 56, they're both good years now. So. <laughs> 1,000 scattered, ceiling 1,800 broken, 3,000 overcast, temperature 7, dew point. Meteorologist Craig Eckert forecasts the weather on Kodiak. So this, this evening storm should be pretty interesting. Here's the main front from this giant low out in the Bering Sea. Precipitation is all on uh, right over Kodiak. This looks like 35, maybe 40 knots. Three days ago, Bob dropped off a couple hunters in Hidden Basin. The storm has turned their trip of a lifetime into a nightmare. We're in a bad spot. Uh, we, need, we need help. The wind speeds have reached 50 miles per hour and have destroyed their tent. Without shelter, hypothermia could set in within a matter of hours. We need something. We need help. The hunters are requesting an emergency rescue flight. But the weather has grounded Island Air's planes. 40 miles per hour is a no-go for our airplanes. From the forecast, we got two more days of bad winds coming and rain. We know we're not flying. We're used to fast-moving weather, but it's, it's not moving. It's just sitting here, churning away on us. The hunters need help. We're soaking wet. We're, we're cold. But it's not coming anytime soon. A massive storm has brought Kodiak's air traffic to a standstill. Bearing the brunt of the weather, a group of hunters in Hidden Basin. We need help, and we need it soon. They've called Island Air for an emergency rescue flight. But the planes are grounded because of a severe storm. The 
weather's the biggest obstacle. These low pressure areas built out there in that environment, and they just come barreling down, you know, along the Alaska Peninsula. And, you know, it's bad as when they stop and decide to park here for a little while. This storm's not moving. So all the hunters can do is hunker down and wait. Overnight, the storm has slowed slightly, giving Bob a chance to rescue the desperate hunters. Looked out there, the wind's dropped. I see sunshine off the east. It's like, you know, go time. Tower Beaver, 47 Alpha Kilos, Basin, outbound uh, Middle Bay. Hey, copy the Beaver, we're clear. And I saw that winds down and weather break. You don't know when they're going to come, but when they do, you just kick it gear. Off we go. Temperatures dropped to 39 degrees last night and the island was pelted with three inches of rain. They probably had a potentially a pretty miserable night. Bob has no idea what shape the hunters are in. We're breaking records with rain, wind, and we've got nothing but rain and fog ahead of us. Well, just looking at the rivers right here, they are, there's a lot of water here. I mean, these overflowing their banks. I'm expecting them to be right into this area. But on this 3,500 square mile island, locating a few hunters is like looking for a needle in a haystack. Oh, there they are. set up there with the tarp. I'm guessing the wind came falling through here and just blew their whole camp flat. It's a good way to stay warm and dry right there. Hey, how you guys doing? Got swamped. Well, that's where we were sleeping tonight. The hunters have survived the frigid night by using their tarp as shelter. You can't stay out there for long without a tent, so. We're surprised he came, and we're happy to see it. Yeah, I asked him about blowing 50, 40, 50, he goes all above that. We're trying to keep the tent up, standing there, it breaks flat. They don't have a single dry item in their camp. The break in the storm is quickly coming to an end. Angry skies are lighting up the horizon, and the wind speeds are ramping up again, making takeoff a challenge. There's a big swell there, 10 foot seas. I thought it died down, but it must have been just for that moment. Now the question becomes, can they make it back home? Unwavering commitment is a requirement in this dangerous business. So we're definitely not going anywhere today. I don't want to say definitely, but the weather's really not looking good. Every day, the pilots are faced with life and death choices, dangers that Bob knows all too intimately. Anton Larson. It happened uh, June 30th of 1995. It's one of the few dates I can remember. We flew out to a village and picked up a, a group of people. They were all close friends. We all knew each other. And there was a line of nine of us, and I was in the lead. I flew around a place called Unizinki Narrows, which is all over water. 
had this gut feeling to hang around and wait for Chris. You know, everything in my life, my natural life, told me this is not what I should do. I flew down to the basin, landed in the channel. Chris got into the pass, but he tried to turn around at the very narrowest portion of the pass. About 10 minutes later, I heard these, uh, all these sirens headed back up there, just going by me. And I knew right there, you, you see crosses on the side of the hill, I see the faces. It changed me as a pilot, it changed me as a person. It affected me, it still does. Gale force winds and heavy rains have hit Kodiak Island. A break in the system has allowed Island Air to rescue the hunters from Hidden Basin. But the calm window in the storm is closing fast. Bob has precious little time to make it back to base. There is quite a swell. In these big seas easterly, it just shows right in the water, so I'm... between those areas, you're gonna have shears. Shears are quick changes in wind direction that can be deadly. I'm just gonna stay down. Mission accomplished. We work the windows, that's what we gotta do. We wanted to stay out six days. The campsite got flooded and uh, this morning about four in the morning, we got a gale force wind in, kind of broke the tent up. It was so great to hear Island Air today. The plane, boss. Kodiak is one of the toughest places to fly in the world. Rapidly changing weather, rough seas, and high mountain peaks make this a location that only the best pilots can navigate. I would say we average 75 hours of training. And it takes probably a month and a half, two months to get a pilot online. Bob. Working for Bob's unique because he will take a brand new pilot to Alaska and train you up from day one Alaska flying. Let's go on down and we'll see how you do. I started flying in high school in Richardson, Texas. My dad was an airline pilot. His dad was also a pilot. I always wanted to be a pilot, so I packed a couple bags and moved to Kodiak. So we might just do a couple of loops around. I'm sure my grandpa's looking down on me, really stoked on what I'm doing, and my dad's always excited to hear my new stories. Let me show you something on this line. Island Air only accepts pilots who have finished traditional flight school. They need that experience under their belt before they can tackle a float plane. All right. When you get into the Beaver, there's no wheels on it. It's only floats. The idea is not to fight Mother Nature. You want Mother Nature to do the work. To do this job, you need to be pretty confident in what you do. You definitely learn from your mistakes. So we're just going to practice sailing into this ramp. He's tacking the plane, basically driving it right in front of the ramp, and then he's going to shut it off if all goes right. Ready? You notice how it shifts? So the plane will consistently move this way, so he has to get over on the corner, and it'll slide back to it. But the only way to figure that out is miss the dock 20 times. We come this way. This is a fun stuff. If you don't like it, this ain't a good place to come fly. How much fuel has he got on board? Add a little power. Cut it. Cut it, cut it, cut it. It's there. 
Um, Bob knows what he's doing, and he can be pretty intense. Um, he'll let you know when you're doing something wrong, and he'll let you know when you're doing something right. Now swing your tail that way. Cut it. Too late. Too late. So you had it perfect, and then but you had to kill the engine. You can either fly or you can't when they come to me. I go out and figure that out really quickly. What I want to know is how to apply them for our environment. All right, good job. You can see yourself grow. I'm a completely different pilot than I was when I got up here. We're just going to call it good for now. OK. Hey, I'll be in in about seven minutes. Flying is second nature to veteran pilot Bob Stanford. So we got some gusts coming here. He's had his wings for 30 years and has weathered everything Kodiak has thrown at him. Been a little overrolled here. But at any point, things can go south fast. Yeah, we've got a little problem with voltage just going up too high. It should be around 27 volts. We're up to 33. That's one of my lights on. Bob's alternator has suddenly stopped working. A huge problem. With the alternator offline, the sole source of electricity is the Beaver's battery. There's always adventures. His first step is to hit reset to get it back online quickly. I'm not going to take a chance. I'm just going to shut off. I don't want to cook a battery here. Bob must conserve what power is left in case the alternator doesn't reset. So I got my alternator shut off, but if I shut my master off, <laughs> my GPS goes down. You know, I've got my chart right here. You go right back to your old school, what you need to do. A younger pilot might panic, but with thousands of hours in the pilot's seat, it's no big deal to Bob. It's just a machine, so. It adds a different quirk, and you, you deal with it. The good news is Bob's got Peter flying with him in a second plane. The bad news, the fog's rolled in, and Bob has lost sight of him. Uh, do you have me in sight? Nope, I don't. Uh, OK, then I should just be a little bit ahead of you. I do not see you. A little overrolled here. While on a routine flight, Bob's alternator has mysteriously stopped working. Now it's not coming back online. Without an alternator, Bob must conserve what battery power he has left. I'm just going to shut off. I want to cook a battery here. Bob knows Peter is close by, but can't make visual contact. Even though they can't see each other, constant radio communication helps them avoid a mid-air collision. Uh, do you have me in sight? I do not see you. Nope, I don't. Uh, OK. Yeah, I couldn't hold it, so I'm coming around. See what we get when we get up here, I guess. Let's go another 100 yards. I think we're just going to keep heading this way. To make matters worse, the storm is beginning to hit again, and this time with a vengeance. Come up a little bit now. I'm not going to get in a hurry. Never hurts to ask the good Lord to be on your side, too. Keep us safe. 40, 45 out of the east. Oh, baby. Finally, Bob sees a landmark he recognizes. Just went by the point there. OK, then I should just be a little bit ahead of you. Bob finally puts eyes on Peter. OK, I see you now. We're almost there. You know, I've got several more trips down this direction. I personally don't think I'm coming back down. It's, uh, it's just too much. Yeah, 
correct error. We were 47 out kilos off Calcium Bay for uh, the base on Point Papa. Good to have this one done. Adam Lutz has been an airplane mechanic in Alaska for the past 10 years. You earn your pay on a day like this. One of his favorite planes to work on is the de Havilland Beaver. These beavers are a part of history. They're, they're monsters. That's it. I trust the beaver. It's tough. It's got a lot of power. You can have things go wrong, and it's just going to keep going. It's just a badass. For the team of Island Air, being Kodiak's lifeline is more than a business. It's a passion. I think Kodiak pilots are some of the best in the world. We have to deal with a lot of weather. Your younger pilots, when they first get here, they're scared to death. They have a healthy awareness of what's going on. If I can't impart what I know to the pilots who work here, then I've failed. This is the team of Island Air. Every day, they risk everything. The Kodiak peaks and wicked seas make the island the world's most treacherous place to fly. These are the tales of Alaska's ultimate bush pilots. During hunting season, Island Air transports hundreds of hunters around Kodiak. Today, they're flying a group to Eagle Harbor for their annual Sitka black-tailed deer hunt. That's one of the beauties of living in Alaska is you, can, you have a lot of opportunities to, to do hunts like this. Pretty fortunate to be able to do this. Eagle Harbor is 30 miles southwest of the basin in an isolated and remote part of the island teeming with dangerous brown bears. Hunting here is only for the very experienced. It's remote and uh, there's no road system to it. It's only accessible by boat or airplane. Beautiful place. A fast moving cold front from the Bering Sea has created colossal waves, making the harbor a perilous landing strip. A single wave can easily slam a plane into the rugged rocks. So for now, the hunters are in a holding pattern. Island Air, this is Emily. Oh, dang. Eagle Harbor is a no-go. Um, the swells are too big. There's no way we'll be able to get the float planes in there. Those swells break onto the beach, and you have to be able to manipulate that airplane. Handling these planes in Kodiak's wild weather takes hours of intense training. 18 months ago, pilot Peter Rosendahl began flying float planes at Island Air. His training with Bob has been a rigorous education in expert aviation. You notice how it shifts? Add a little power. Cut it. Cut it, cut it, cut it, it's there! Too late, too late. We're just gonna call it good for now. Okay. Absolutely essential knowledge to master the third most dangerous profession in the world. To do this job, you need to be pretty confident in what you do. Uh, you definitely learn from your mistakes. Um, take, take every flight and apply it to the next flight. Today is Peter's final exam. Bob will take him to Marka Lake, about 30 miles northwest of Island Air. The lake is tough to navigate due to its short landing sites and rocks hidden just under the water. 
And it's kind of like teaching your teenager to drive the first time. You can imagine giving them the car and it's a nice Camaro with a 300 plus horsepower. Okay, we're gonna enter the freeway <laughs> for the first time. So I'm a nervous wreck. Dear Lord, keep us safe. <laughs> But it's a technical little place here. That's uh, yeah. I get that right here. Yeah, that's it. Okay. So you can see the one rock on the corner. Yeah, I think I see it just below the water over there. I don't want to get too tight on that rock now. There you go. Okay, push it over. Push it over. Push it over. Power back. Okay, round it out. All the way. I'm gonna have to probably do it on a turn. There you go. You got it. Yep. Okay. It's gotta come back. His training thing, like he's over there talking a whole lot and telling me what how he wants it to be done and how it should be done. You gotta take the the loud talking or yelling, whatever you want to call it, you know, with the bit of salt. He did good. He did real good. I mean, I was impressed. Made it out, didn't bend any metal, so didn't seem to scare Bob too much. So I'm proud of him. Trust me, you know, I just kept my mind go back to last year when you saw him doing that training. That's why we train. That's pretty badass, <laughs> actually. Top dog today. <laughs> so hey guys, what's happening? Hi. Hey, how hey. you doing? Welcome to Kodiak. Thank you. I got uh, two sightseers going now. We're gonna show them the island, show them the sights. Mike and his wife, Stacy, have recently moved to Kodiak from Phoenix. Big, big difference from Phoenix to Alaska. I mean, big is an understatement. It's a huge difference. <laughs> to get to know their new home, they're taking a sightseeing flight around the island with Peter. So this is the uh, De Havilland Beaver. Have y'all ever been in a beaver before? No. no. Fantastic. Well, it's an awesome airplane. How right? long have you been in a beaver? Uh, well, I got here this morning about 8 o'clock, so, yeah. so here we go. Being the first time on a float plane, a little nervous, but I know it'll be, the views will be worth it. Riding in a Kodiak bush plane isn't like flying on a commercial airliner. High winds, wind shears, and squalls can cause massive turbulence and appear out of nowhere. The entire beaver, I don't want to go on the base of Yard Romeo, I'm going to head out towards Castle Bay. Can we just take off really fast? Uh, yeah, it'll be pretty quick. So there's no complimentary drinks? <laughs> uh... <laughs> Here we go. Oh, God. A lot different than the... A... I don't know if I should look at close my eyes. Oh, that's so different. We're cruising here at 600 feet right now, just so we can see stuff a little bit better. Wow, such a different view. You fly around all day. Is this your happy place, or do you have a happier happy place? <laughs> <laughs> no, this is my happy place. <laughs> have you ever had to leave anybody? Uh, just the ornery passengers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we got some goats down there. Oh, there's a bunch of them. Wow. Yeah, they're running on stuff full speed that you can hardly stand on. Wow. That's pretty cool. Every day is a new adventure, that's for sure. All right, guys, it might be getting a little bit bumpy here. Oh. Yeah, that wind coming up over that mountain is close. Oh. I don't like when you do that, Peter. The storm that grounded the hunters has expanded quickly, throwing winter squalls right into Peter's flight path.
sudden squalls have kicked up and the weather is deteriorating fast. When you're flying around, you know, the whole time you're thinking about a million things a minute, but you always gotta keep your composure and uh, you may look calm and collected on the outside, but on the inside you're going crazy thinking about what can go wrong, what you need to do to make it all right. You know, we're also playing with the wind factor here. Peter decides to cut the flight short and put down at the closest body of water to fish and wait out the weather. stay grounded until the squalls pass. What did y'all think about that flight? The oh, views? Yeah. Very nice. The turbulence? Mm, not a big fan. <laughs> <Did Yeah. you? laughs> yeah. But on the ground, Mike and Stacy face other threats. You got some activity going on out here somewhere. Holy guacamole. Kodiak brown bears can grow to be more than 10 feet tall and weigh over 1,500 pounds. Are you trained in first aid survival? <laughs> Peter knows the bears shouldn't pose a problem this time of year. It's the end of salmon season, and bears are more interested in hibernation than people. OK, fishy, fishy. I need you in my life. I'm going to get that one right there. That one's mine. Look, you see that big old fish grab it? Wow, you That's see that? the same one I'm going for. Go try over there. I always take my thunder when it comes to fish. Oh, I got it. Oh, I got something. Ooh! <laughs> oh my God! What happened? Look at I caught some grass. <laughs> uh oh, there's another one. Look, got him. Oh, that's yeah. a big one. Oh! Uh -oh. <laughs> if it wasn't for bush planes, I wouldn't be catching all these big old salmon out here. Come on. <laughs> hey, stay. Yeah. Check this guy out. Oh, that's pretty big. <laughs> nice catch, babe. Thank you. Whoa. Sorry, buddy. I got it, though. <laughs> <laughs> All right, time to go. Thank you. <laughs> Got a big salmon in Alaska. Gentlemen, this is the best experience I've had in my life. The squalls have passed, and Peter is cleared to fly. The interrupted flight seeing tour has paid off in spades with Mike Salmon and Stacy's first ever float plane ride. I would do it again. I would definitely do it again. Pete has aced his first ride with passengers. If you ask me what my job is, it's, it's training. It's to watch who is out there. So when my customer asks me, who's flying? Who's the new guy? We have new guys every 18 months. It's an 18-month commitment. We don't rush it. It just, uh, there's, there's a lot to cover and a lot of confidence to build, never knowing what's around the next corner. You know, you have to be, you got to go to your happy place. And if you can't do that, then uh, this is not the place to fly. Although it's not hitting the entire island, the storm has intensified on the southwest side. We've got a pretty good storm moving in on us now, bringing us heavy rain and some big winds. And now 10-foot seas are forecasted to come in here. Bad news for a group of hunters who are trying to get to Eagle Harbor 30 miles southwest of Island Air. Pretty typical in Alaska, you know, any you go, you go on a remote hunt, you know, and it's, uh, you're always gonna, weather's always a factor. Hunters will get stuck here in Kodiak, the weather will be too bad here or where we're trying to get to. Weather days are always a fun time at Island Air. Clients can get crabby. Especially when a storm decides to stick around for days. I have you scheduled to go out to Eagle Harbor with us today. Weather is not looking good for that area. The wind is blowing pretty hard, and so we won't be able to fly you out there.
Good morning, Jay. More bad news. I just heard from Eagle Harbor though, and they have big swells, and so we cannot get to the beach today. Uh, no, we're not up again today. Oh, you're killing me here. Everybody's kind of getting really antsy, and tensions get high, but um, you know we're just trying to provide a safe transportation service to and from their from their hunt. Sometimes people want you to fly when you know darn well you shouldn't. It's not safe for you, it's not safe for them. The biggest challenge for bush pilots is learning when to say no. Saying no today might be the difference between life and death. An intense cold front from the Bering Sea has Kodiak in a stranglehold. The storm has kept Island Air's planes grounded for the past six days, frustrating for a group of hunters who are stuck in Kodiak until the storm passes. We've been trying to get out to Eagle Harbor for six days. It's coming in. Sometimes these storms don't stop for 20 days. Yeah. Holy moly. It's described as the worst weather in the world and its unpredictability can wreak havoc on everyone. This was about 20 years ago, and I tell you, it really messed with me. I was going along right where we're at now, and right about now, I should have been climbing. We have a wind that's a little different. It would have been coming from my right, but in that day, it was the left. I started right down this this pass, but I was, I'll tell you, I was quite a bit lower. I was literally skipping along the, uh, the surface, and I could not get the plane to come up. To this day, I do not know why it didn't rise. And I was right about here, literally at treetop level, staring at those trees right in front of me. I should have been able to just climb I'm like a bat out of hell going out of there. Could not get the plane to climb. I said a prayer right then. That's one of the moments I, uh, I said a prayer and I told this aircraft to rise. And finally, right about now, it released me. I came right up over these trees and it let me go. Why did that downdraft finally release me? Honestly, in my heart, I believe that the good Lord uh, was trying to teach me something, and uh, it's one of the few times in my 40-year career that I asked for definite action and help, and uh, I got it. That was a moment that uh, I'll never forget. That was a period in my life where the fun went out of it. It was all work, all the time. And for the next year, I was hyper aware of everything I was doing in a plane. And I just, the enjoyment level went out of it. It wasn't a fun period. Honestly, it took me a whole season. It took almost a year to get that feeling to go away. So I guess it's a trust in yourself. Uh, in your decision-making uh, ability in, in that aircraft. The storm that's been battering the island has dissipated. Great news for a group of hunters that have been trying to get to Eagle Harbor. The weather broke for us this morning. We're actually seeing some sun out, so uh, hopefully we'll be able to sneak these guys in. The hunters are carrying more than 2,000 pounds of gear. Too much weight for one plane to handle, so Peter will fly a second beaver. The planes can now take off, but can they land safely? All that energy built up by the, the storms, it's been building up this swell, and it just doesn't turn off overnight. 
We've had easterlies now for uh, over a week, upwards of, uh, you know, almost 40 knots. The swell was still quite pronounced. I mean, you need to head off this direction. Next stop is uh, Antarctica. Many planes have perished by attempting to land in these rough seas. Yeah, I don't think we're gonna make it in that lagoon. Some of the biggest tidal swings in the world, Kodiak beaches can become a float plane graveyard. If we get a really big wave, we get pushed up too high, and then we're kind of on dry land. That's not where a float plane wants to be. Just think about it. If it was pointing towards the beach and started going dry, there's nothing we can do. We have to wait for it to float again. Pull it around, and then get that tail rolled. Get my bow pointed out! Point it out! We're definitely getting beat up on the beach a bit. Trying to unload the airplane, and the airplane's rocking up and down. Don't let him push on that elevator! We just don't need to get it too high. on their side today. The swells didn't beach the planes, and the hunters are finally off to start their adventure. I'm not gonna say there's any glory in this. You learn your trade, it's hard, it's uh, just tiring. I guess we ask, why do we keep doing this? I don't know if it's the adrenaline at times, it's just the seeing mother nature and her glory around here. I mean, just uh, it's the animals, it's all the awesome people you meet in the villages, and I just think I'm supposed to be doing it. This is the team of Island Air. Every day, they risk everything. The Kodiak peaks and wicked seas make the island the world's most treacherous place to fly. These are the tales of Alaska's ultimate bush pilots. Hey, listen, I just got a call. They're out of food. A group of hunters in a remote area of Kodiak are in bad shape. A grizzly has torn their camp apart and destroyed their food supply. Hungry and desperate, and with life-threatening snow squalls on the horizon, they turn to Island Air for help. I'll get the plane ready. On this 3,500 square mile island, the weather changes drastically from one mile to the next. The weather might be calm and sunny at Island Air, and just over the mountain range, it's a blizzard. Veteran pilot Eric Howard sees situations in Kodiak that would rattle most pilots. Flying in Kodiak is unlike flying anywhere else. Uh, you basically wake up every day not knowing what's going to happen out there. Island Air's fleet of six planes are crewed by the most seasoned pilots on the island. They are essential to Kodiak's 14,000 residents. 
Today's flight takes Eric deep in Alaska's bush. The island feels prehistoric, with 1,800-pound Kodiak brown bears and a rainforest that grows ground moss three feet thick. In the bush, there are no towns, no emergency services, no dependable communication. If a pilot gets in trouble here, there's no coming home. Facing the challenge head on, Eric charts his course to check on hunters whose status is still unknown. Suddenly, Eric hears something he doesn't like. Never a sound a pilot wants to hear 3,000 feet in the air. Oh, how are you? I can't make it back. I've got a center down somewhere. Trouble is nothing new to bush pilots like Eric. He makes quick calculations and realizes he has only seconds to determine where he can put down. Eric is five miles away from the nearest body of water, Seal Bay. If he loses his only engine, the beaver will drop like a rock. I don't think I can make it to Seal Bay. But one thing is certain, the hunters aren't coming home today. Well, we got a group of hunters that are um, down in Dead Man's Bay. Dead Man's Bay lies on the southwest side of the island, 75 miles from headquarters at Island Air. It's a hunter's paradise, with everything from mountain goats to the largest brown bears in Alaska. They're going on four days overdue now. They haven't contacted us. They were supposed to have called me. Island Air dispatcher Emily Pack is the communications lifeline between Island Air and hunters in the bush. There's any number of things that could go wrong. The hunters are running out of food, and a once-in-a-decade winter storm is putting their rescue in doubt. Veteran pilot Eric Howard's plane is experiencing an unknown mechanical failure. I can't make her back. I've got to set her down. Eric is desperately trying to find a place to land in Seal Bay before it's too late. We're headed up to uh, Seal Bay. Bob immediately dispatches fellow pilot Keller Wadham and mechanic Richard Bellinger. The question on everyone's mind is whether this is a rescue mission or a recovery mission. Richard, you just have to grab the carb. It's already in there. OK. There's a number of things. There's obviously a problem. If Eric makes it to Seal Bay, the crisis is still far from over. Not knowing what's truly wrong with the beaver, landing the 60-year-old plane could be disastrous. Eric makes it down safely, but Keller and Richard don't know exactly where he is. Got about an hour and a half with the way the sun is right now. So what was it doing? About 20 minutes in, it started to do the bull backfire. Pop. Good 
could be a magneto problem or a car problem. So always better to safe, be safe and just land and figure it out on the ground instead of trying to push your luck and get the plane back. Richard is up against the rapidly dropping sunlight. He has to get it fixed in the next 30 minutes or the entire crew will be spending the night in Seal Bay. So yeah, I think we figured out the problem is in the carb. Cold temperatures and water tend to cause things to freeze up a little bit around here. The crew now knows what the problem is, but will their quick field fix do the trick? Keller and Richard follow Eric home. There's no guarantee that their repair will get him back safely. Eric, how's she feeling? So far, so good. Wilderness wear and tear takes its toll, even on a de Havilland Beaver. The planes need to have a full checkup every 100 flight hours. So for sure then tomorrow night then we got... Yeah, it'll be finished tomorrow night. These are our lifelines, so we, we like to take care of them, look them over pretty good. With one float plane in the hangar, the other beaver has to work twice as hard. It's time to get started. Weather's changing. We're going to get moving. The weather window isn't wide enough to rescue the stranded hunters in Dead Man's Bay. They're too far away. But life on Kodiak continues. They've got to get essential supplies out to the rest of the island, food, mail, medicine, before the weather shuts them down. We'll probably do four and four now, so we'll, we'll have all up. this and four. Okay. Yeah. This may look like miserable flying weather, but this is the best it's been in days. We're way backed up. Yeah, when you're running a commuter, uh, you, you definitely have to have the bodies and the boots on the ground. The island there, uh, 7 Alpha. 7 Alpha Kilo, go ahead. Yeah, were you trying to call me? Yes, um, we still have the Alatac mail sitting here. Okay, coming back. Thanks. Another prime example, I'm focused on getting my trip done. And, uh, they don't have the mail on board, so we're going to turn right around and get it. So one thing that happens, you know, when you're hyper-focused on things as a pilot, particularly when the weather's uh, marginal, it's easy to keep all your focus on your airplane, forget the littlest things. I mean, my brain's all on how to safely get the job done instead of paying attention whether I got the mail on board. You know, it just tells me, slow down. The predicted storm has hit Kodiak Island hard. Bad news for the hunters in Dead Man's Bay. Island Air has been trying to contact them for five days, but still, no word. I don't know if they have enough food. There are bears out there, because they're staying in a tent. And with the kind of wind that is down there right now, I mean, I don't think, I don't know that the tent is intact still. The longer it goes, the more urgent things become potentially when you don't know. Why don't you call Kostya? OK. Kostya is uh, he's a lifelong resident of Okyok. He's, uh, he's been our weather source for all the years I've been here. Hello. Hey, Kostya, it's Bob at Island Air. Hello, Bob. Hey. How, what's the wind speed? I actually got a group on floats that I have to pick up it's at, say, 2025. 20, Still coming out of Northeast. All right. You can see the weather is just 
marginal and uh, yeah, bursting downdrafts. Now, we can see these on the water when we land, but for takeoff, that's the biggest problem, is are we gonna have a safe takeoff and departure path? So from experience, I'm gonna wait. But the hunters are braving severe wind gusts, and one more day could be catastrophic. Man, that wind is howling. Hold that side of the tent, it's coming down. This looks like dangerous flying weather, but to Island Air, it's a calm in the storm. We are leaving as soon as we can. And their only chance to save a group of hunters in Dead Man's Bay. There comes the dawn rain. After six days with no communication from the hunting party, Bob fears for their safety. Without communication, you just don't know what their uh, what their status is. They could be suffering from hunger, hypothermia, or worse, a bear attack. We've been getting nothing but bad weather reports the last couple days. We had a little bit of break this morning, so I'm gonna go down there and see if uh, we can make this happen. Forecast is just for about a one day lull, and that's gonna hit us again, so we can't miss this window. We have to get it done. We don't really know what to uh, to expect when we get down there. We know the wind direction and what we think it's going to be doing, but just the way it's tucked in there, you know, you get the bad uh, the bad weather and the bad winds. It'll get pretty exciting. You know, after doing this 30 years, you just know how the guys feel, and they're wondering from their perspective, you know, have they forgotten us? You know, their minds are telling them, you know, why haven't they come? That's why I'm anxious to get going. Everybody wants us to help out on other stuff right now. Yeah. We haven't got time. These guys are priority. Adding to the pressure, four hunters with over 1,200 pounds of gear is gonna take two beavers. De Havilland first built the plane in 1947. Of the nearly 2,000 beavers built, hundreds are still in service around the world. The beaver is a war horse. It, uh, it's tough. It's our go-to machine when the weather really starts to kick up. It was built to land on water, snow, rough terrain, in the most unforgivable climates imaginable. But even with a beaver, stormy weather plus the Kodiak wilderness equals danger. You can see the gusts on the water. She's bursting. I'm sure 35 or better right there. It's got to be to throw me around like this. This has been the concern this whole week. I'm going to move to the far side, but where we're going, if it's like this, and I, you know, it's not impossible that we're going to get all the way down there, and we're not going to be able to get them. Yeah, this job's long from over. Long from over. Island Air has four stranded hunters in Dead Man's Bay and haven't heard from them in nearly a week. Bob is in the air to attempt a rescue, but his lifeline, dispatcher Emily Pack, has lost contact with him. Bob has been down trying to pick up those guys out of Dead Man's. He's been down there for about 45 minutes, so I'm kind of wondering if there's a problem. There is a problem. Bob's trying to read the waves. He's concerned about the wind shear, a quick change in wind direction over a very short distance. As the airplane passes through the shear, lift and airspeed are lost, which could be the end of this rescue. Oh, I gotta circle around the lamp. You can see the shear is right here, so we, we're gonna have a pretty long taxi, I think. The other thing, too, is I don't see the guys. Oh, yeah, there's one. Uh, 
great to hear those beavers coming. I'll tell you what, Bob's our hero. With their sat phone malfunctioning, the hunters couldn't make a distress call. Their only hope was Bob. These are the days when people go, man, your job looks like fun, you know. Happy to be alive and out of here at the same time. The celebration has to be short. Time is of the essence, because the tide is going out. And the hunters could weigh the plane down so much, the rescue team could get stranded as well. Now we've got tides going out, so when we load it, we have to make sure we don't get stuck or we'll be on this beach another 12 hours. What's up, boys? Got a really long taxi ahead of us, just uh, so we can get in the right position to take off and do it safely. I just got a call, and they're telling me that the winds are 45, 50. Bob can get in there, but it's a question of getting out, which could mean that our my planes are going to be stuck. But Emily can't reach Bob so he's unaware of the dangerous high winds that are threatening his takeoff. So I got some gusts coming here. Oh, baby. Now accelerate like hell. This is where you don't slow down. If we're low enough, I don't want to tip my wing. We're going to get over to that other side. Nice job, Bob. I was the part I was worried about the most on this entire trip was right there. We've been thinking for days about that take them too, I'll tell you. It's kind of what I call a skid turn sometime. I don't like to bank. I just boot the rudder and slide her over. Well, we love you, Bob. <laughs> you look down here now, it's blowing harder than when we came down. It's picking up again. If I'd rounded this corner and seen this on the way down, I wouldn't have kept going, I don't think. I'd... I'm glad you did. Yeah, so am I. <laughs> Sleep better tonight. One night, we spent 16 hours standing up, holding the tent, grabbing the beams, and, and t sewing things with cords, and then t following the... We knew if we got out of that tent, we were hypothermic and we weren't going to make it. We had to keep that frickin' fort alive. Thanks, Bob. That's good. You did it, man. Woohoo! Oh, yeah. Bob and Pete have completed their mission. The hunters are finally safe and sound back at Island Air. <laughs> Why, buddy? We got down to a couple days left of food. And no one wanted the apricots because I ate a bunch of apricots one day and that didn't turn out so good. And uh Truthfully. and then and then we had the deer meat out there, but we had this real cantankerous bear that was like every time we'd get a deer down, he was running us off the deer, and we knew that deer meat was the last that was it, man. That was gonna keep us alive. So it was either that bear or us, and it was not gonna be us, it was gonna be the bear. This will go in the story bunker for sure. Yeah, if you're looking for adventure, Dead Man's Bay. It's all out there. <laughs> yeah, I'm feeling pretty good, actually. I got this one done. Well, thank you, buddy. <laughs> Having this smile on your face is just worth gold to us. Now, that's a familiar sounding voice. How you doing, sweetheart? Uh, I've been so worried about you. Just thinking about you, and the kids kept me going. So, I love you, babe. I love you. Everything's just going, but it's a good feeling. I can relax now. I've got, uh, I've got them out. This is the team of Island Air. Every day. They risk everything. The Kodiak peaks and wicked seas make the island the world's most treacherous place to fly.
These are the tales of Alaska's ultimate bush pilots. Ready, set, go. Get comfortable. All right. Hunting season is a busy time in Kodiak, Alaska. He's the guide. We're busy, We're backed up. In a 12-hour day, Island Air can make up to 22 round-trip flights. Hey there. Hey there. How are you doing? At this time of year, do you guys need help? Much of their work is transporting hunters around Kodiak. Come on down. Should be a good day for hunting. Your chariot awaits. An early cold front is descending. He's our guide. And three hunters venture out to beat the weather. They plan to hunt Sitka, black-tailed deer near the Uganic Cannery, a half-hour plane ride northwest of the basin. But the frigid temperatures may alter their plans. Oh, wow. Are we going to be able to land? I will let them know, and we will go from there. I just got a call from Uganic, and apparently there's ice in the bay. The ice on the water by the cannery is thick, making a float plane landing impossible. Hi, James. I just got a phone call from Pam Pingree. There is ice right out in front of the cannery, so we won't be able to land there. The best we could do is take you to Quartz Creek. If the float plane drops them at Quartz Creek, they have to hike two miles through thick brush and across rocky cliffs. OK, we can walk. You, you can walk? Have you been out there and hiked that area? Uh, no, this would be my first time. All right, thank you. Thanks a bunch. Yep. These guys are determined to go. For me, it's kind of a, should we send them? Yeah. Come on, guys, split up. There's that question in my mind if they're going to make it. Trekking two miles on this bear-infested island through unfamiliar territory is tough enough. On top of that, a monster cold front is heading right for Kodiak. In Alaska here, you know, weather's a matter of life and death, and we've got a pretty good storm moving in on us now. We're getting ready to launch a weather balloon into it and see what, uh, what the winds aloft look like and what the temperature profile is. Tower, National Weather Service request permission to launch the weather balloon. National Weather Service balloon launch approved. Wind 0501 So this is our balloon inflation room. This is where we fill up our balloons. They're made of natural latex. Craig fills the balloon with 1,500 grams of helium, which will keep it afloat for 90 minutes. Up, up and away. Launch this balloon. Go! Oh. A data recorder and GPS are tethered to the balloon. And there you have it. This is my favorite part of the job. Balloons collect temperature, speed, and wind data. Critical information when making flying decisions around the island. This is the track of the balloon right there. The balloon is doing its job, and that makes my life easy. Island air relies heavily on meteorologists. But even when clear skies and calm seas are predicted, they aren't guaranteed. Squalls barrel into Kodiak with little warning. I was coming down a pass had some hunters on board, and it was all sunshine behind me. And I could see a squall up ahead of me going down through this pass and the water. And I, all I had to do was land where I could see at the end of this bay. Drop my hunters off, turn around, and head right back to town. Started flying back up that pass. My brain kept telling me, it's good ahead of me. Well, long story short, it never did get good. It got worse. 
that squall came around and I ended up on a beach. It built up to over 40 miles an hour, the wind speeds and blowing snow. Thinking I'm gonna lose my airplane, bobbing around in the beach environment. But that was a good lesson for me, is don't ever think it can't or won't. You fly every day knowing it will, and it is. Despite Kodiak's temperamental weather, hunters flock to the island because of the abundant wildlife. Just like incredible. It doesn't matter what the weather is. You cannot be disappointed. Karen Seaman has been hunting in Alaska for five years. But this is her first trip to Kodiak. Sitka black tail, obviously, only here in Alaska. So thought it'd be a great chance to be able to hunt something I've never hunted before. Taking pictures of the sea otters, they're like so cool. Although she's excited about her adventure, she's nervous about the island's infamous brown bears. All I ever hear is when you shoot black tail on Kodiak, it's like a dinner bell for the grizzlies. She has good reason to be nervous. A few days ago, two deer hunters were mauled by a Kodiak brown bear just a couple miles from where she's headed. Kodiak brown bears here are known for being the largest bears in the world. Population-wise, they're at an all-time high right now. Luke Randall is a hunting guide at the Afognak Wilderness Lodge. He's had his own close encounters with bears. He happened to be on the beach. The bear was kind of confused, and then it started walking straight at us. Got to about 25 feet, it smelled us. It was locked in on us and started charging. Hunting season brings a mass of sportsmen through island air. The wide variety of wildlife on the island is extraordinary. It's teeming with black-tailed deer, mountain goats, and Kodiak's infamous brown bears. Yeah, blew hard yesterday. Luke Randall is a seasoned hunting guide who's had his own up close and personal experience. And he got to about 25 feet. It smelled us. It was locked in on us and started charging. I shot it when I got to 12 feet just to save everybody's life. Oh, yeah. man. Not a story that hunter Karen Seaman wants to replicate. So she's headed to Sportsman's Warehouse to get some advice from the experts. Now, tell me about these uh, uh, Kodiak brown bears that I, <laughs> that I well, hear about so much. So heard, what do you think I need? I would definitely uh, make sure you have some bear spray. All of the brands that we carry here at Sportsman's Warehouse are all great. My favorite, I like the counter salt here. No, you, you haven't had to use it, right? I have never had to use them. What's your ammo situation look like? Pretty good. I'm using a 308. 308. So how many boxes do you think you're going to need? Boxes? Well, let's hope I only need one bullet. You've got your ammo, you've got your gloves, you've got your bear spray, you've got your snacks. Let's go get you a license. OK. Can't wait. Oh my gosh, it is pouring. All righty, Karen. Hey, Peter. Peter, are you a pilot? I am the pilot. Oh, yeah? Pilot Peter Rosendahl will be transporting Karen to the Afognak Wilderness Lodge a half hour north of the basin. Before they take off, she has a few concerns about the weather. So are we flying? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah? We just talked to them. They're calling a couple thousand feet with uh, good enough visibility and 20 knot wind, so we're, we're good to go. <laughs> OK. Fantastic. Good thing I brought my waterproof mascara. Seal Bay Island Air will be on the water shortly. We're ready for you. It's a little bumpy. It might be a little bumpy. Make sure your seatbelt's tied tight. I'm sure you've run it worse. Oh, yeah. To some people, this wouldn't be good visibility, but this is pretty much a normal day up here. Good 
guiding Karen on her first Sitka blacktail hunt is Luke Randall. Lovely weather we're having. Good for deer hunting. Is this good for deer hunting? Yeah, they can't hear it coming. <laughs> they can't, yeah. Okay. I just had uh, people leave this morning. Oh, did they? A couple Su hours ago. Successful? Actually. Yeah. Yeah. Really good. Got a ten and a half foot bear and a real nice buck. Oh, you got a bear? You went bear hunting as well. Yeah. If you're out hunting for deer or elk, you still have to be bear aware. I look over my shoulder all the time when I'm out. One more risk for the hunters hiking to Yaganic Cannery. We don't even know what we're getting into until we get there, so. We'll definitely have an adventure. We get pretty gnarly, I think. I definitely wouldn't do that hike. During hunting season, the pilots of Island Air work 12-hour shifts. In the course of just a few months, they'll fly hundreds of sportsmen all over Kodiak. Getting ready to start our deer hunt. These hunters are tackling a risky hike. The bay is iced in, so we have to get off here. And we're headed for that cannery down there. For some, Hunting is a necessity in this remote part of the world. The meat they harvest today will sustain them for the entire winter. Heavy. The whole terrain's all steep. Steep, steep, steep. I'm ready. Happy hunting, guys. Emily has asked the hunters to check in with her daily. Should something go wrong, she will be their only lifeline to the outside world. It is definitely cold outside. When you're getting ice in the ocean, you know it's freezing. I, I worry about their safety, um, what we're gonna find when we go out to pick them up. It's really uh, steep. A lot of rocks to climb over. Affected, the hunters were scheduled to call from the cannery. It's been more than six hours, and still no word. I hope to hear from those guys soon. On the other side of the island, Karen is ready to tackle her first Kodiak hunt. She's pretty confident she'll get a Sitka black-tailed deer. What she's not sure of are Kodiak's mammoth brown bears. Since I probably smell like bacon, let's get rid of that scent. Luke Randall, longtime Kodiak hunting guide, will share the experience with Karen. All right. All right. Let's go find a buck. All right. The forest here, it's hard to believe, but it's like, you know, think Hansel and Gretel walking through the woods. You are just stepping on moss, huge big pine trees, and it's just so quiet. that you cannot even hear the deer. So you're just like walking very quietly. And then you realize, wow, the bear probably walked just as quiet. So the whole time I'm like, okay, looking around, making sure there's no bear around. Because bears are like ghosts in the forest. They hear us and see us way before we see them. So their natural incl inclination when they hear or see us is to run. Or hide. Or hide, okay. Yeah. Luke uses a rattling tool to call the bucks. But no luck in this location. I think a lot of the deer are gonna be on the other side of the ridge because of that hard wind the last two days. So. It's a doe. We spooked this deer. It runs past the next one. Then we went another couple hundred yards, and uh, Luke spotted a buck. There's a big buck right there. You need to see his face. He's looking at us, OK? Luke's like, he's right there. And I'm like, where? Right out there. OK. Look at him. Oh, 
Look with your eyes. Shake that tree's in your way. Let's go over here. See him? Yeah. When he walks out right there, get ready. Load, load, load. Right there. See him? Straight down there. There, see him? Hunting season is a chaotic time at Island Air. The team of pilots hauls a multitude of sportsmen all over Kodiak. Beautiful bear, isn't it? So where'd you hit it? It nicked the heart. Caught him right? Right here. I love to see a successful hunt. <laughs> Island Air feels personally responsible for the hunting parties they transport. We had three hunters go out the other day. We were supposed to drop them off at the Ugandan cannery, but we weren't able to get to the Ugandan cannery because of ice in the water. We dropped them off two miles before the cannery, so they had to hike in. It's not easy to get in there, and especially when you're trying to carry a load of gear in. I don't know how it went, and not hearing from them, it worries me a little bit. They may not have made it to their destination. On the other side of the island, Karen Seaman and guide Luke Randall are hunting Sitka black-tailed deer. Found him. Got set up. Ready? Shoot. Took a shot. Straight over his back. Oh, reload, reload. He's Was not I moving. High? Was I high? Yeah, you hit high. If you're going to miss, miss high. And he just kind of stood there and was like, what was that? So it gave me the opportunity to jack it out of the shell in, realize I needed to go low, a little bit lower. Oh, you smoked him. All right. And was able to take him with that shot. OK, I'm going to go check on him. It looks like you got him. OK, come on. Headed down the hill and came upon him, basically right where I had shot him. Oh, yeah. Oh, you smoked him. Good shot. That's a gorgeous buck. Beautiful Sitka. Wow, look at him. Nice and wide. He's a really big body for here. He's pushing like 180 pounds. Wow. Look at that. It was a nice three by three, and Luke was excited. So, you know, obviously, I was excited that, uh, you know, I took a, was able to take a great deer. Congratulations. Thank you. And then he's like, well, we'll get it here. And I'm like, we're going to get it here? She had been hearing all these stories going around Kodiak about uh, bear mauling that had just taken place. I'm like, OK, so like three days ago, there was a mauling on deer hunters. So now we just have to worry about bears. And so she was pretty worried about that, rightfully so. All of Kodiak is known for the bear attacks. Of course, the whole time, I'm really nervous. And I'm just pacing, and he starts gutting it. But Luke is not concerned. Bears haven't been really introduced to that, where when they hear a gunshot, they think of a gut pile or a deer that they can have. They either don't know what the gunshot is, or they are afraid, because they know it means death. With no bears in sight, Karen packs up her trophy and carries it out herself. Wow. Successful day. Woo! This was my first trip to Kodiak. Totally awesome. And it's amazing. These beavers and island air keep this island and everyone around it running. Bob, I'll see you in August when I'm back. See you in August. Uh, we'll be here. All right. See ya. Thank you. Success all around. Done. Emily Submitted. finally has news from the hunters at Uganic Cannery. They made it to the cannery. I'm really glad to hear about that. I didn't really expect to hear that that was going to be a success. They did go hunting and they got a deer, so we're going to go pick them up tomorrow.
that's keeping your ass alive. <laughs> it's doing a safe job. It's taking care of those people in the airplane, getting the job done. You know, the attachment to the machine, their tools, they have no value. But the people and how you interact when you, when you need each other, making a small air taxi in Alaska work. It's, it's been a good life. This is the team of Island Air. Every day, they risk everything. The Kodiak peaks and wicked seas make the island the world's most treacherous place to fly. These are the tales of Alaska's ultimate bush pilots. Bear with a bow. There you go. Pretty awesome. <laughs> Island Air flies thousands of people around the island of Kodiak every year. You got hip boots and you're definitely going to want those on. I'll be back in 40 minutes. Have a good flight. Thank you. Who's the next victim? <laughs> the team works together like a well-oiled machine. What are we doing? Mail groceries. We're living the dream. We're windy here, and the pilot's thinking that we should reschedule for tomorrow. I mean, if we do get those 100 mile an hour, not if, when we get them, right. we're going to want to ratchet this thing to the dock. I think that's what makes it work at our company. You know, we've got a, we've got a mix of experience. It's a good balance. It works. It makes it fun, too. Check on the weather. I ain't going. I can't take it anymore. It's all you, Bob. <laughs> we have the new guys that are coming in all the time. They've got lots of energy. They help get us old guys off the couch. You know, they're, they are the future. They're the next wave. You know, they definitely have the youth and the stamina to grind it out, and it's, it's long days. So how many are we going to need? Two, two. Two pilots. Every potential new pilot is intensely scrutinized. We like to see somebody as actively, you know, flight instructing. You learn a lot from flight instructing. Trying to teach something, it definitely is a little different than just doing it yourself. So we like to see a four-year degree and desire to be in Alaska. Because it's kind of like Africa, you know, people who come here are people who want to fly in Alaska. This grueling career choice isn't a good fit for everyone. You know, we don't try to sugarcoat it. We tell them that, you know, you work hard, um, long days. When you get done at the end of the day, you, you pretty much eat, go to bed, and wake up the next day and do it all over again. Because Bob invests an incredible amount of time training up a new pilot, he wants to make sure it's the right pilot. So this is the main guy I've been talking to, one of the most interesting, Jeremy's his name. He's flight instructing, living in California. He's got a four-year degree. Now what about uh, his ATP? The guy David was... Uh... Guy, David's friend was living down in California also, but he hasn't flown for a year. You know, he should go get a little flight time just to get your hands back on the stick. And mm -hmm. You know, he's got a wife and kids too, so, you know, a little tougher moving all the way to Kodiak. So I'd say we pursue this Jeremy guy mostly. You know, if Jeremy doesn't work out, then give Aaron a call and see what he's uh, got going on. Being a bush pilot in Alaska is considered the pinnacle of success for many aviators. It's a good way of life up here. It's not easy. There's a certain mystique and challenge of this. You do a lot of living flying in the bush in Alaska. One of Island Air's newer hires is pilot Ben Haug. I used to fly in, in Santa Barbara where it was sunny every day. Came up here to Kodiak and it was about as opposite as you can get. It's pretty hard when you're playing bouncing around and you've got two foot breakers on the beach, you know, you're going to find a whole new, uh, you know, set of issues you're going to have to deal with that you didn't have to deal with on those float on the wheel planes. Ben has spent hours flying beside other Island Air pilots. Today, he's ready to get behind the stick with Peter. Training with Peter is going to be great. He's smooth, he's calm. He has a great way to teach you without getting you all worked up. 
It all starts on the dock. You know, this is where you're gonna be the hero on the dock looking like a badass. I got this. Ben's gonna do great in the floats. He's got a good head on his shoulders. We're gonna start uh, pumping floats. What, you mean we don't have dock boys? We do a lot of our own work, Ben. <laughs> I think you stuck a hose in the <laughs> hole just so you can watch me work out here. Yeah. Look here. See the back of your float there? Oh, yeah. So I was all that kelp. So if I were you, I'd crawl over there and kick that off. It'll make your life a lot easier. Gotcha. You planted that for me, didn't you? Oh, well, you know, we got to throw something in here. <laughs> That'll work. Being able to teach this to Ben, you know, it's a lot of fun. We're good buddies, and uh, I can harass him a little bit more than a normal student. So jump in that front door there, Ben. Give her a whirl. Today is nice and easy for him. You know, his first day, and Bob kind of threw me under the bus the first time I got to do this. It's kind of like that uh, teenager that just learned to drift mom's car. <laughs> so we go out and we put the shock collar on you now and then and light you up. Uh, you know, do they always listen? Nope. So we light them up again. <laughs> it might take a while, but once she cuts you loose, you got to know that he's he knows you're ready for it. The thing about the basin is this this is an uncontrolled um, uncontrolled spot. There's nobody directing traffic here, so we're always looking both ways as we cross the, the street, basically, when we're pulling out into the water. So you got to keep your head on a swivel. Turn it right Swing in. Swing it around. We'll see if he, uh... It's a good first day in the beaver. You know, didn't say anything I needed to really whoop you about. You know, it's the first day, so I can't be too hard on you, but... Uh... Yeah, it's fun. Looking forward to it. Oh, yeah. Cool. New challenge. Yeah, new challenge. Flying a beaver in Kodiak is about as good as it gets. This is definitely my dream job. By next season, Ben will be ready to fly float passengers all around Kodiak. Right now, okay. the responsibility is on the other pilots. A heavy burden, but one they consider an honor. To come to Alaska to do a trip like this, people stay for years. And so it's exciting that we get to take them out. Today, one of Island Air's many trips is dropping hunters off at an unusual lodge. A 46-foot boat they'll call base camp for the next week. It's a trip we've been looking forward to for three years. We planned this three years ago. The trip of a lifetime for this close-knit group. But the experience is bittersweet. Last year, uh, November 6th, I left a really dear friend of mine, hunting buddy, uh, in a plane crash. And so he's going with us on this trip in spirit. The boys are headed to Salua Bay, about 77 miles southwest of Island Air. We are trying to get things moved quickly today so that we can hopefully get everything done before the weather starts coming in. You guys heard about the storm that's in the Aleutian chain at this point? Really here? big. Yes, yeah. big storm. Big storm. Big seas out there? Pretty possibly. Yeah. Yes. Big seas mean big winds. The flight will not be an easy one. It's been a busy day at Island Air. Time to rock and roll. Good job, Bob. Betcha. Thanks. Betcha. They haven't quite decided where they're going yet, Hidden Lake or Molina. We have a few trips going. One of them is we're going to a boat. We're going to be taking six guys out. They're going to go hunting from a boat and travel around the south end of the island. The group is headed to Salua Bay, about 77 miles southwest of Island Air. You guys heard about the storm that's in the Aleutian chain at this point? Really here. big. Big Pretty seas, gnarly. Kind of big wind, big seas out there. Pretty possibly, Yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah. it's all our first time on a float plane. Right first, yeah. All, yeah. none of yeah. you have been on a float no, plane no. before. No. You guys are in for a treat. That's, yeah. it's my favorite way to fly. Flying people that have never been flying in a float plane before is always pretty exciting because they either really, really like it or really, really hate it. Let's get you guys loaded up and get you on down Let's to go. the boat. We're ready. Right, Let's ready. go. Have it, have it, have it. The group of six will split up into two float planes. Peter will take half and pilot Keller Wadham the other half. We're going to have a lot of easterly wind. It's just been really nasty. Oh, man. This is nuts. Come on in. Get comfortable. 
Okay, suck it in. <laughs> Kodak Tower, Beaver 9 Alpha Kilo, the base in southbound, got November, and uh, 671. Beaver 9 Alpha Kilo, Kodak Tower, transition approved. I can't believe that we're flying out on a boat plane to a boat. This crazy plane. Woohoo! <laughs> Taking off in a small airplane. <laughs> Man, that's awesome. Hey, Devin, watch out. Your door does come open. Oh. <laughs> I got him. No, I was okay. I was hanging on to Steven. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That thing. Oh, it's awesome. Did you see those ghosts? We can rock yeah. them. Yeah. Yep. That's cool. Yep, those are buffalo. <laughs> Hey, Peter, you're our new binoculars. All right. <laughs> that was awesome, yeah. My neck is going to be sore from just being on a swivel. I don't know where to look. <laughs> Unfortunately, their sunny outlook might soon turn dark. The predicted storm is now a reality. The boat drop off, we are headed down here to Salua Bay. And the storm that's coming in is coming in from down here. Um, so, I mean. It's not far off from us, and it's hard to know when it's going to hit. With this pressure system coming through, there's really no telling what we're going to get in between here and there. Hey, how was it uh, going through Eagle Harbor there? Oh, that's good. I went through it about uh, 1,800. I got gotcha. you. So we might get a few bumps in here. Do you guys have your seat belts nice and tight? Oh, yeah. One of the biggest challenges Kodiak pilots face is fast-changing weather conditions. Dude, you guys, it's frickin' hell, man. We tried going through Eagle Harbor there, and it's clo completely closed in. He went through at 1,800 feet, so it was wide open. We just tried going down, it was closed all the way to the ground. So it changes pretty fast. And just heavy rain everywhere today. Look how high the tide is, man. Oh, Up wow. top. Yeah. Oh, wow. You can see the waves on the beach. They don't look like much from up here, but pretty big swell for a plane. There's a little bit of rain. Yeah, a little rain jar. Is this supposed to blow? 40 still? Uh, that's what they were calling with that load. Yeah, this is way more than I expected. Oh, I know. Hey, Keller, yep. So what's the hey, plan? Devin, I think we can... Hey, guys, be quiet. Peter can't reach Keller by radio. Keller's plane is banking hard to the right, and Peter doesn't know why. Oh, oh my god! While Peter and Keller are dropping off a large group of hunters, Looks like a little rain ahead, huh? A storm has made landfall on Kodiak, dramatically reducing visibility. We tried going through Eagle Harbor there, and it's closed, completely closed in. Hey, Keller, yep. Hey, Devin, I think we can... Hey, guys, be quiet. Huh? Hey, Keller, you got me? Peter has lost radio contact with Keller, and his plane is banking hard. Without communication, Peter doesn't know if this is Keller's flight plan or if his fellow pilot is in trouble. Oh, oh my god! Hey, Keller, you got me? Yeah, the plane, oh my god. Roger. Oh, there they are! Woo-hoo! Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> yeah! Oh, <hell. laughs> Keller banked hard because he spotted the boat below and didn't want to overshoot it. Tell me to go back the other one, Peter. Roger. As soon as the wind comes the other way, It'll lie down waves like fast. Coming down. There's the boat. All right. We're here. <laughs> That's actually a fairly good sized boat. Oh, my. All these years, and we're finally here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> About ready to touch down. Giant toy, isn't it for you? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. That was awesome. Well played. Well played. 
We can swim that far, probably. Nice. I thought the hunt was going to be the big deal, but the, but the plane ride was, was fantastic. It felt like we could reach out and touch the, the uh, mountains as we were flying by them. It was incredible. Happy hunting, guys. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, Pete, for the great fight. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks again. Cheers, guys. Excellent. Yeah. It's a great ride. Get something on the ground that we can take some more pictures. All right. Oh, yeah. Guaranteed. Right on. Technology has made bush pilots infinitely safer. We have GPSs now, we know where we're at. Imagine if you didn't have this. We're flying through this valley, if all of a sudden it closed up on us, the only chance you'd have back then would be to hold your heading and just hope that you made it out without hitting anything. Many of Kodiak's older pilots could have benefited from this new technology. Dave Oberg. Bob's friend and fellow pilot has been flying around Alaska for nearly 40 years. I was hired to work for Island Air Service down in Kodiak. Bob had gotten there a couple months before I did. So we were both a couple of young pilots, you know, trying to break into the Alaska flying world. Not an easy training ground for a new pilot. Kodiak is a tough place to fly because of, um, you know, challenging terrain and even more so is the challenging weather conditions. Within a period of 15 minutes, you can go from sunshine to um, nearly zero, zero in fog. A quickly changing weather pattern was to blame for one of the worst days in Dave's life. July 13th, 1989, I was going on down to uh, a fish camp near Mosier Bay to pick up some, some folks and bring them back into Kodiak. And on the way back, as I was going along Sheratine Mountain, as soon as I got to the top of the pass, I was in the clouds. Now I don't know how low I'm getting. To me, the thing that's most frightening is when I can't see where I'm going. But within a minute or two, I saw a patch of grass off to my, off to my left. And I realized then that I was closer to the mountain than I thought I was. I was scared to death. So I just cut the power, started pumping flaps. I'm gonna cut my losses here and make sure that touch down under control. You know, this should be survivable. And so that's what I did. I set it down on the side of the mountain. And we slid along for just 40 or 50 feet. And then the plane slid sideways down the mountain. And then we hit a gully. Both the front seats ripped out of the floor. Of course, I was knocked unconscious. When I came to, about that time, the male passenger said, Dave, it's on fire. Kodiak, Alaska, braves some of the world's worst weather. Yeah, when the weather comes in here, it's real fast. It's, uh, and it's over a very, very short distance. Mother Nature's a force to be reckoned with. Pilot Dave Oberg has firsthand knowledge of Kodiak's deadly storms. In 1989, he was piloting a bush plane that crashed into the side of a mountain. I reached down you know, between my legs, grabbed the fire extinguisher, handed it to him, and he put the fire out. So I had three adults and one two-year-old little guy in the back seats um, who received just, just bumps and bruises. I broke both ankles and had my uh, head split open. I knew that 10 minutes getting help might be the difference in surviving or not surviving. They managed to lift us off the mountain that evening. I had a few days to s s lay there in the hospital thinking about what had happened and time to analyze it. And I understood where I, you know, what mistakes I'd made. When the accident happened, I had had uh, about 7,000 hours of flying on Kodiak. I was pretty experienced. When you start getting too comfortable with where you are in aviation, then you start getting these little voice in your head saying, think about what you're doing. You know, what, what could go wrong here? And so it's made me a more careful pilot. I don't fly in weather now that I flew in, in Kodiak. I won't do it. Accidents that obviously all over Alaska. And I am a firm believer in disseminating that knowledge and 
You know, I don't hold back my mistakes. I, I still, to this day, call, uh, I'll call guys in and we'll talk about it. Hey, this is what I did to gay and this is why it wasn't a good thing to do. Bob Stanford's mission in life is to teach new pilots how to navigate Kodiak's challenges. Young pilots not having a lot of experience flying the Alaskan bush, every area has its own unique attributes. And there's one pass, Zachar Pass, that uh, I flew down one day, and it, uh, I had sunshine behind me, just like you see here, beautiful. And I flew down the pass, just like we're going through right here, down to the water unloaded the hunters came right back and and the squall was coming straight at me and if you don't have your heading or a moving map gps like we have here you can just end up running right into the side of the hill technology has made flying this terrifying landscape slightly less dangerous what's improved in the last in my tenure 40 years of doing this is now we have a moving map GPS. And so now the pilots, he can sit and instantly see where they're going. Whoever uh, invented the GPS system, in my book, he gets the Nobel Prize. He has saved a lot of lives. Even with modern advances, Bob believes nothing beats good old fashioned training. We have to make sure we're the standard. You know, and that's a. Uh, that's important. I mean, I can't tell you countless guys that have said, I thought I knew how to fly. Yeah. You know, and then you start throwing in really short strips where you have to hit the first 10% of the runway, high gusty wind shear situations. I mean, it's, uh, it's amazing, actually. Honestly, I think uh, all the pilots that have come through here, when I'm trying to teach them, they're teaching me at the same time. This is the team of Island Air. Every day, they risk everything. The Kodiak Peaks and Wicked Seas make the island the world's most treacherous place to fly. These are the tales of Alaska's ultimate bush pilots. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are you guys ready to load up? Whenever you are, yeah. Right. Island Air is more than just an air taxi service for Kodiak. They are essential to the well-being of the entire island. Island Air, they're definitely a lifeline because we have no service that goes around the island and delivers goods. This is how people get their mail, their food. So they are an integral part of our economic engine here. I got for you. Everything you move in a car down south, in your truck, and your delivery vehicle, it all moves in an airplane or a boat in Alaska. Cargo! I've been on a few different uh, search and rescue type flights. I've picked up uh, people that have had heart attacks, burn victims, and a pretty wide variety of uh, medical emergencies. It's the interaction between everyone out in the bush and, and, and helping them and Helping them help us. It goes both ways. Sure, Pete. Thanks for the mail you wanted to grab. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, yeah. it's awesome. The benefits of being the mailman out in Kodiak. <laughs> the pilots serve a wide range of clients, including the watchmen at Alaska's closed down canneries. I have a presence on site, I just keep an eye on things. I enjoy all the fishing and hunting, and it's just been a hoot since I've worked here. Throw them in it. <laughs> For some caretakers, Island Air is one of their only links to the outside world. Hey, Pete. Island Air brings the mail here. They bring my groceries with on the mail plane. They're kind of a lifeline. So how's weather in town? It's starting to look kind of nasty out to the northeast. So. Yeah. There's a lot of people that I'm the only guy they see every week for months at a time. So 
you kind of got to give them five minutes, let them talk to somebody face to face. All right. Oh, handbag. Yeah, All right, mailbag. All right, thanks, Pete. Hey, I found some graffiti on the wall you might be interested in seeing. Yeah? Yeah. Cool. Let's have a look. Okay. You really kind of get to develop a relationship with these guys, and if they don't walk down to the dock or walk down to the beach when you pull up, it could be scary. I haven't had that happen yet, but uh, you're always hoping that they're going to be there waiting for you when you pull up. <laughs> All right, Lance, we'll see you next week. See you next week, brother. <laughs> Watch that tail back for you, Lance. Oh, yeah. The bush pilots are my heroes. Sometimes Kodiak's violent weather prevents the planes from landing, halting delivery of vital goods and medicine. This weather may dictate what we're doing or where we're getting into. The ceiling and visibility down there is great. It's just the wind. When large ocean swells are the only issue, the planes have another way to distribute supplies. But, uh, the beaver itself has got a, a camera hatch that's up underneath the belly. So it's possible to lift up the door in flight, fly over a spot and throw all the equipment out that you can. Today, Eric will be teaching Pete how to use the camera hatch for target practice. It's another page in the training manual for Alaska's ultimate bush pilots. We got the orange tape. We'll kind of set up some targets with the orange tape and then Got a couple cups of uh, flour in each one of these. That way, if, even from the airplane, when it hits, we'll see it spread out, and that'll mm -hmm. give us a pretty good idea of um, how close or how far we are from our target. Cool. So. Considered the best bush plane ever made, the Beaver was designed for this type of use. It was just a cool made airplane that really thinking when they put this thing together. Eric and Peter will travel to Three Saints Bay, 20 miles southwest of the basin. With its long stretch of beach, it's the perfect location for the train. Obviously, you're going to want me dropping it before we actually reach our target, because it is going to have that forward velocity, you know. All right, I got the hatch set up, Pete. So let's, uh, let's set up our target. Yeah. Now we're also playing with the wind factor here. The high winds will make it that much more difficult for Peter to hit the target. You know, give me a heads up, all right, we're over the beach, and then like a 3 2 1 drop or something like that. Peter's first pass will be low, just a few feet above the beach. So we're lined up with our target. See that X pretty good. All right, three, two, one, drop. <laughs> Pilot Peter Rosendahl is learning how to deliver supplies out of the Beaver's drop door. See, that acts pretty good. Even with guidance from veteran pilot Eric Howard, Peter's first drop was off the mark. under his belt, Peter will now climb an altitude to 500 feet above the beach. Increasing wind speeds will make it extremely difficult to be on target. All right, so we're lined up. Three, two, one, drop. How about them apples? Aren't we better do it again, see if you're uh, actually good or if you're just lucky? Yeah. Once is a fluke, twice is a real deal. Peter will now jump to 700 feet in altitude at full airspeed. I 
Kind of try to do a slam dunk. Drop. <laughs> he proves he is the real deal by dropping just two feet away from the target. No, I don't want to say I'm good at this, but... Doing really well. This wind's really big. All right, this is the hardest part, turn around back in here. Yeah, just to keep it wide, getting a little gusty in there, so... I think our axe is about to get blown away. With wind speeds increasing, Eric and Peter need to head back to the basin but not before they have a little fun with the rest of the bags of flour. Also, show you how many we can drop out in one go? Yeah. I drop it three, two, one, I drop it. All right, one out. Good uh, job, Pete. Oh, wait, you got it down pretty good. It takes hours of intense training to get to Eric and Peter's level of skill. Some would shy away from that much work. Others embrace it. Yeah, if I could fly all day, that'd be amazing. David is a new pilot to Island Air. Originally from California, the call of the last frontier was too strong, and he moved to Alaska a few months back. So it's going to be one out. Out of box. Coming out to Alaska was an easy decision. The flying is comparable to nowhere else, I think. Bob only hires experienced pilots who have finished traditional flight school. We have the new guys that are coming in all the time. They've got lots of energy. They help get us old guys off the couch. But I've found that as I look over all the accidents that have happened, you know, a lot of times it's in those pilots that are at the top of their game. And that's when it's, it's good to, to put a little experience in going, no, it, it can happen to you. I'm looking just for whether you know the basics. So today, Dave and Bob are heading to Calson Bay to see if Dave's got what it takes to make the Island Air team. We're going to climb up and do a 60-degree bank turn, stabilize it, and then I'm going to have you go to a 60-degree bank turn in the other direction. Got it. He knows what faults to look for in a pilot, and he knows how to fix them. It's only had one person fail the intro ride, and really? that person actually ended up dying in an aircraft accident a year after he failed that intro ride for the very thing I failed him for. If you want to survive, if you want to keep your passengers alive, if we want to live, we're not going to be cowboys out there. We're going to keep things safe, so. How many Gs do we have in a 60-degree bank turn? A 60-degree turn, it's two Gs. OK, I want you to maintain the altitude you're at. We have 2,600. Go ahead and roll into a 60-degree bank, left turn, stabilize it. All right, right turn. 63 bank turn, full aileron. Being able to feel the tight turn and fly by the seat of your pants. OK, left turn. Is something you learn through training. I'm not pressed back into my seat. And more training. I'll tell you right now, you're not going to make it. You're right. How are you going to make it? You're too high. Bob is on a routine test flight with Island Air's newest pilot, Dave. Do a couple clearing turns. And he's taking every opportunity to put this rookie through his paces. OK, left turn. Got to make a quick turn. You're looking down here. Yep. So you don't really see it. You got to pull it back to feel it. This makes a big difference when you get in a pass and you're looking outside. Now, what I want you to do is keep the wings level. Keep the wings level. He likes to see it when we start shaking in our seat, literally. He likes to kind of push us to our limit, see if we're going to crack. And that's part of his determining if we're going to be a good pilot for his crew. We've got the municipal airport right under us. If we had to pull the power from right here, would you make it? Yes. You just lost your engine. Roger. 
tell you right now, you're not going to make it. You're right. Not How are you going to make it? Tell me right now, you're a line pilot. Lengthen it out. Lengthen it out. Lengthen it out and get to 80. You're too high. A 60-degree bank causes the plane to lose altitude. So the pilot must consistently calculate, feel, and compensate. Bob's training puts pilots in situations to test emergency procedures of all kinds. A stall, the airplane losing lift, is a situation that every pilot will face eventually. Polar power. It's better to practice now and feel it. So when it happens, you instinctively know how to react. No power, we're just flying. We're starting to feel the stall right now. Buff it, we're coming into it. A lot of times there's a horn. Nose kind of falls off. Full stall. Very good. OK, your airplane. My airplane. I feel in tune with the aircraft, but I'm human. I'll get scared. Most emergencies, people will inevitably freeze for the first couple seconds. That's right. Got to have our procedures down, so I just do it automatically. It's easy to get comfortable, isn't it? Sure. That's what it gets us. Well, good thing to do is constant training. That keeps us sharp. Yeah, it does. I could already tell I was rusty on that simple engine failure procedure. Yeah. OK, head back. All right. You can either fly or you can't when they come to me. I, I go out and figure that out really quickly. What I want to know is how, what they think. Then we walk you through the scenarios to, to teach you how to apply them for our environment. He knows of all the dangers, all the accidents that have occurred up here. He knows how to avoid all those things. So he gets a brand new pilot like myself, and he's going to jam this new information into my head. I took a check ride once, and I got an inspector standing underneath the flaps. I started to drop the flaps. Whoop, bam. Bopped them <laughs> on the head. I looked at him and go, well, have I failed it yet? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's anybody quite like him out here. You passed it. You got to keep working. All right, thanks for the tough love, Bob. <laughs> Part of flying is, is your preparation. Look at ahead. What's going to happen next? Or what can get me in the scenarios we fly at? That's, things start happening pretty quick. Let's go on down, and we'll see how you do. Rigorous training in this environment is critical. Add a little power. Cut it, cut it, cut it. Even experienced pilots will run into the unexpected in Kodiak. Then it started to do the bull backfire. Pop. Bob knows firsthand that complications on this island hit without warning. It was late winter. I had loaded up two passengers. We back taxied out of Paul's Lake in the ocean. And the way the wind was, I had to take off towards the shore, if you, if you can just imagine, inside of a horseshoe. And we back taxied what I considered was plenty of room. I was going to do a single float turn, get airborne, just continue my turn right around. And I simply started to run out of room. But I was at a point, if I tried to pull my power, I knew I was going to wreck the airplane. I instantly went to, I have to use every single inch of this space that I have. I ended up, uh, it was within 10 feet of a rock wall. If you screw up the landing, you're going to wreck the airplane. If you screw up the takeoff, you're going to get killed. Most Alaskan bush pilots have experienced their fair share of trouble in the air. If you screw up the landing, you're going to wreck the airplane. If you screw up the takeoff, you're going to get killed. And Bob is no exception. And we back taxied what I considered was plenty of room. I was going to do a single float turn, get airborne, just continue my turn right around. I simply started to run out of room. I ended up, uh, it 
was within 10 feet of a rock wall, turning in an accelerated stall. I could feel it starting to go, and I had to just keep it on the ragged edge. And I ended up touching the water, stalling, and staying perpendicular to the rock wall at the same time. And we bounced through the, the little reef area in the water, and I was able to just keep the plane moving and flying and, and flew back. I tore up one flow pretty good. And I think that's one of the moments I, uh, I, I asked my maker. We had a little conversation. But I, I, was, I was very upset at myself, and I told him I, I came very close to, to putting him into an accident. So I've learned that healthy awareness in my flying is not to relax and keep asking yourself what could go wrong in the next situation. Bob has had a number of close calls over the years. But what is the veteran pilot most afraid of? What frightens me? My wife's not happy. <laughs> that frightens me. First job in aviation, and it will be my last job in aviation. Bob's wife, Jen, has helped him make sense of the dangerous profession he's chosen. She walked into our office over at Municipal Airport. So I looked at her and immediately smitten. I said, hey, Joel, I'll give you a quarter for your sister. As I remember, he said 50 cents, and I reached in and I paid him <laughs> right there. And uh, we were married six months later. I think my wife's pretty good looking. Yeah, you weren't here the day the guy gave me a $100 tip. When she's getting a little too much attention from the guys, you know, I just come back and uh, I just give her a little squeeze. I just mark my territory. <laughs> If you've seen the movie, The Cronks, they're having earthquakes and the rocks are falling and the dad just reaches out and puts his arms and his body over everybody to protect them. And that is Bob. So I remember I started crying in the movie because that, that was you. Huh? And Lydia and I looked at each other and I was like, that's dad. She goes, yeah, that's dad. He's very, very protective of his family. We're, it's his world. Bob shows that same fierce loyalty to the people that work for him. My family up here is definitely the Stanford family, and everything that good that happens for Island Air, I am really happy about. When you hit the water, <laughs> oh, I'll come in. Everybody works together like a family. Even our, our customers are, are treated like family. So this is showing 4.2 on Alpha Kilo. After uh, flying for uh, Bob for a number of years, uh, he's pretty much become like family. He may not be a friend, but he's definitely family. Good job! <laughs> you win the lotto. I don't get great jobs unless it is a great job. Oh, man. A lot of living going on around <laughs> this company. I get a lot of calls from pilots that want to come up. My job is to find that commitment, and then you can join our family. This is the team of Island Air. Every day, they risk everything. The Kodiak Peaks and Wicked Seas make the island the world's most treacherous place to fly. These are the tales of Alaska's ultimate bush pilots. Off the coast of Alaska is one of the planet's most volatile landscapes. Kodiak, Alaska, the 3,500 square mile island is a vast wilderness. It's different than the lower 48. When we're flying areas that most people would look at and go, you're, you're going where? <laughs> you know, you're landing where? Bob Stanford and his team of pilots at Island Air face danger daily. 
Right straight to the west of us is a monster storm. I'm gonna wait for tide change, I'm just gonna get the plane ready to go. A mix of wild weather and extreme isolation make bush planes the best way to access Kodiak Island. All right, well, I'm going to get my plane ready and get this first one done. The pilots take hunters and thrill seekers up daily, but they are also a lifeline to people living on the island full time. We're going just to Uganic? For residents like Lance Parker, Island Air is their sole connection to civilization. Island Air is my hero. <laughs> As a trapper, Lance's season is short, and any mishap has grave consequences. I was just running my line. It's the last run of the season. I broke my propeller on a rock that I didn't see. I just limped in on the broken one, but it's a miserable go. Replacement parts can be hard to come by in this remote part of the world. Trying to stay ahead of the parts game is uh, it's a challenge. You, you, you have to kind of build a confidence or knowledge of what are readily available and what aren't. Luck is on Lance's side today. They found another boat prop right in Kodiak. Island Air, one out fuel. Pilot Eric Howard picked up the part for Lance and will fly to Port Bailey, 26 miles northwest of Island Air, to deliver it. Around Kodiak here, everyone helps each other. Everyone's willing to drop what they're doing and help because everyone's been in that situation before themselves. Alaska may be the biggest state in the Union, but it's also the smallest state in the Union. And we are dependent on each other. And we made it. A present-day necessity delivered. Thanks, Eric. We'll see you later. Eric's next mission focuses on the past. Morning, guys. Morning, Eric. Morning. Looks like we got some awesome weather to go uh, take a look around. Patrick and Natalie are from the Aludic Museum on Kodiak and are heading out to discover some of the island's archaeological treasures. Pretty much every survey we ever do on Kodiak, we use a float plane. You can't get there without a plane. They're looking for native Aludic villages that date back over 500 years. This is the Aleutic history book, these sites. Eric is dropping the archaeologists off in the Shelikov Strait, a location that troubles the veteran pilot. When you're out on the Shelikov Strait, you have uh, really big tides, and uh, you almost always have winds and currents. When the threesome left island air, the skies looked clear. But on Kodiak, the weather changes drastically from one area to another. Oh, this is looking a little worse out here now. Yeah. Oh, yeah, look at the waves. They're too big. Yeah, pretty much any time you see white on the beach, it's pretty hard to get the float plane to it. Yeah, I don't think we're going to get on that beach today. Kills me we didn't get there. That was where I really wanted to go. High waves are posing problems for the archaeologists. But for another client at Island Air, the waves are a welcome sight. Morning. Good morning. How are you yes. guys today? Good. How are you? Excellent. Ready to go surfing? Um, yes. Jen and Steve moved to Kodiak five years ago. Avid surfers, they didn't let the cold climate keep them from their favorite pastime. Today we're here at Island Air to try and get on a float plane and see if we can get to some new surf spots and some spots that haven't really been surfed by anyone before. Same storms that bring big waves to Hawaii in the winter. They originate up here off the coast of Alaska, so we'll get waves from those storms as well. The only thing is, it's a lot colder here than uh, Hawaii or even California. You have to wear a thick wetsuit, whether it's uh, July or January, it's about the same. Get about two hours out there before my feet start getting completely numb. Peter will take the couple to Surfers Beach, about 25 miles south of Island Air. The area is renowned for its colossal waves. I didn't about this. It's 
First time that we're flying on a float plane. We don't know what we're gonna get in terms of waves and where they're going to leave us. So yeah, it's a little nerve wracking. <laughs> yeah, there's some little line. Trying to have a bumpy ride right now. <laughs> Flat through a little bit of a rain shower. Kodiak's severe storms create massive waves. Perfect for surfing, but they spell trouble for a float plane. Gonna be pretty rough in here. Definitely a pretty big swell, huh? Yeah. yeah. Kodiak Island's notoriously high seas are legendary. Most people try to avoid the ocean when the waves are rough. Today, Peter is taking a couple of surfers out to ride those waves. Kind of a bumpy ride right now. Flat <laughs> through a little bit of a rain shower. Massive waves are exactly what surfers crave, but they're disastrous for a float plane. Landing on swells this size is tricky. It's gonna be pretty rough in here. Okay. Kind of nervous. Just pounding all these rocks out here. With the uh, storm approaching, the swell is so big right now, we don't even know if a plane will be able to land in the spots we want to surf. We might be able to get on the water here uh, with the plane. Just kind of in this back corner, we're protected from that swell. Beautiful. Here you go, guys. We'll get your boards out and kick you out. Sounds good. Awesome. Cool. And they're up. Yeah, we do a little bit differently here in Kodiak. We don't uh, tow you in surf and we'll drop you in a float plane, though. So, hope these guys have a good time. some sea lions out there while we were surfing. Sometimes they start at you. <laughs> We've even had whales come up to us before while we're surfing in Kodiak, so it's a, it's a really cool experience. Did you have fun? It was awesome. Yeah. All right. 40 miles northwest of Surfer's Beach, trapper Lance Parker isn't having fun. The boat prop Island Air delivered this morning doesn't fit his engine. Emily immediately tries to locate the correct part, but it's no easy task on Kodiak. Is Emily at Island Air? Oh, he's in Port Bailey. Oh, yikes. But with no luck. They locate the right part in Anchorage, but a storm there has grounded planes until tomorrow. For tonight, Lance is stranded on a cold beach. I, I worry about it all night. Weather is also posing a problem for Eric and the archaeologists he's transporting. Oh, this is looking a little worse out here now. Yeah. Eric is trying to land in the Shelikov Strait, but high winds have kicked up and the seas are too rough. Pretty much any time you see white on the beach, it's pretty hard to get the float plane to it. Oh yeah, look at the waves, they're too big. Yeah, I don't think we're gonna get on that. There is another village site that hasn't been explored in a Fognac Bay. The shoreline is more protected there, so Eric might be able to land. Oh, look at this beach over here. That's one big village down there. Yeah, I think we can make it in there. All right, here we go, guys. Kodiak has an incredible number of sites. I mean, there's already 1,200 reported ones, and I like found 100 this year, so, and we're gonna probably find a few more today. And see it looks like it's getting a little rough. Uh, a little bit of wind out there, but uh, we'll be back to get you. Okay, right. see you guys. Yeah, thanks. Aha, look, <laughs> a house pit. You know, you have your thatched roof, fish hanging from the ceiling. There's probably some benches. Yeah, this is huge. Yeah, this is a pretty big one. This is probably a winter village. While Patrick and Natalie have been exploring, the wind speeds and swells have increased dramatically. 
a float plane pickup is now impossible. Yeah, it's not looking too good right now. All right. All right, thanks. Bye. I just got a call from Eric. Um, today, we won't be able to go pick up Patrick or Natalie, so I had to call Keller Waterman, and he has a plane that can actually land on beaches. They're gonna be a little surprised to see me. Keller is a freelance pilot who helps out Island Air in these kinds of situations. I love flying whales. Landed on beaches and remote, you know, river banks and tops of mountains, and it's completely different. Keller must make it to a fog neck quickly. The weather has turned, and high tide is approaching. If the beach floods, he won't be able to land, and the archaeologist will be stranded overnight with no shelter on an island full of 1,500-pound brown bears. There's still five, six-foot, pit-foot swells out there. Weather plays the lead role in Alaska's aviation world. It demands respect. If ignored, it can cost a pilot his life. I came to Alaska with a man named Jamie Madsen. He was my best friend. He had done a flight down the Alaska Peninsula, and he was refueled, and he was heading into Kodiak, and it was clear and calm here. Um, but over the range earlier that day, uh, there had been 50 knot easterly winds blowing. And he left King Salmon and obviously he ran into icing. His very last words were, mayday, 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 twin Cessna, one Echo Charlie, losing control ice. I've been flying almost 40 years and I've never used the word mayday. When you say that word, something very serious is happening. bush pilot in Alaska is a gutsy decision. Over the last 10 years, 54 fatal plane crashes have occurred. Bob Stanford has lost close friends over the years he's been flying. One particular crash still haunts him. He left King Salmon and obviously ran into icing. His very last words were, mayday, 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 twin Cessna, one Echo Charlie, losing control ice. I've been flying almost 40 years, and I've never used the word mayday. When you say that word, something very serious is happening. And we looked for him for five days. It snowed five days for five straight days in the Katmai range uh, after he went down. We, we never have found him. I've been going over there for four decades, and I, every trip, I think about him. I still look for him. When you lose somebody close to you, you, you know, you realize it can happen to you. <sighs> you know, it's even after all these years, it still affects me. Alaska's plane crash fatalities are 20 times higher than the national rate. Reading the weather signals is crucial to survival in this dangerous business. Look how high the tide is, man. Pilot Keller Wadham is trying to interpret the tide. He's picking up archaeologists in a fog knack. But if the tide has flooded the beach, a landing will be impossible. With a dropping tide, you can't put the plane on the beach. So you got to kind of like look at it from up here and decide. That's the beach right there, though. Definitely get in there, it's a workable lagoon. We'll see what happens. Patrick, how's it going? Good. Natalie, good Hi. to see you. <laughs> um, I'm picking you guys up today because Island Air couldn't get back with the beaver. We're gonna go on wheels instead. OK, I don't know if I've okay. ever done that. Sounds, <laughs> sounds yeah. cool. It will be fun, so <laughs> let's get you guys loaded up, and we'll be out of here. OK. All right. Kodiak's tidal range is nearly 10 feet. 
and high tide is hitting, Keller must get the plane airborne before the beach is completely submerged. Tide's coming up, so we have to go. It opens back up in this like beautiful flat valley up here. Yeah, this is awesome. Glad we got to get home a little early too. <laughs> With the archaeologist safely heading home, Island Air can now turn its attention to a new member of the family. A seven-month-old Labrador Retriever puppy named Piper. Emily got a puppy that was uh, actually raised out uh, in the bush. Of course, she named it after an airplane. and. <laughs> Piper's part of the family now. An adorable family member, but one who has broken the law. Piper has a criminal record. Piper has violated Kodiak's rarely enforced leash law. I've watched uh, dogs run around down in the basin for my entire life here, and Piper's the first dog I've ever seen get a ticket from, <laughs> from the dog police. When she's on leash with me, she hates it. She hates it a lot, and I don't know that I like it very much either. <laughs> Come on, Piper. Piper's exuberance is exhausting her owner, so the Island Air family has brainstormed a way to give Piper her freedom and Emily a break. Peter and Emily will take Piper to Uganic Bay, 35 miles west of Island Air. Come on, Piper. <laughs> There you go. Thank you. All right, you guys ready to go? Yeah. <laughs> Look at Piper. What up, Bill? I'm on it. You want a glass light? Mm. Piper, you're fogging up my windows. <laughs> you're getting excited about that, huh? Are you having fun, Piper? <laughs> Piper's running free, and she's so happy. It makes me happy to see her this way. <laughs> Overnight, the massive storm that grounded Anchorage's planes yesterday is now heading straight for Kodiak. Right straight to the west of us is a monster storm. You know, I called the weather servers. They're talking about 75 knot winds, 90 miles an hour. You know, we would definitely be batting down the hatches. 40 miles per hour is a no-go for our airplanes. More bad news for trapper Lance Parker, who's been waiting for a replacement propeller for his boat. There aren't any planes making it into Kodiak. With flying on the island at a standstill, Lance will be forced to spend another night in the elements. After weathering a huge storm overnight, Island Air Basin, seven off kilo. Kodiak is flying again. Port Bailey, Island Air, be Lance Shirley. Eric can now make the flight to Port Bailey and deliver Lance's boat prop. Doesn't look too windy, looks pretty nice down there, so we're not gonna have any issue getting in there. And, uh, should make Lance pretty happy so he can get back on his plane. And I think we brought out a a little bit of tobacco too, so that'll, uh, that'll make me happier. I, I didn't think they were gonna make it, but son of a gun, they did make it. And Eric showed up just like perfect, like Island Air always does. <laughs> that looks like the baby. Well, I gotta get back. We'll see you next time, good luck. You bet, man. All right, thanks. Took the prop out of the box and seen that it fit and bolted it on. Now I'm ready to go home. I've got some traps to check on the way home that I'm gonna pull out of the ground and then that'll be the end of my season. To Bob Stanford, running Island Air isn't about money. It's about caring for the people of Kodiak. It's a rush, that's why I do it. It's awesome. It's, uh... 
you know, even at my age, at 59, it's just like being 21 without all the energy. So yeah, this is, this is why I've done this for 39 years. I love the challenge and passing that knowledge on, watching these guys. I'm proud of them. I can trust them too. When I, when I put my head down at night, I know they've got the best drivers of these airplanes when people fly in our air service. I, uh, that's why our pilots are so uh, sought after. People try to hire them all the time from here. Yeah, these guys are awesome. They got it. This is the team of Island Air. Every day, they risk everything. The Kodiak Peaks and Wicked Seas make the island the world's most treacherous place to fly. These are the tales of Alaska's ultimate bush pilots. During the winter time on Kodiak Island, the days become shorter and the weather colder. And you already warmed it up, right? Island Air's schedule calms down and the team settles in to a daily routine. You want me to go or you go ahead? All right. All right. Nice to meet you. As the holiday season approaches, their focus turns to delivering mail, groceries, and presents. Hi, Christian. Today, they're bringing a very special Christmas present oh, to so a family cool. in remote Kodiak. His name is Ruger. Ruger. Yep. Hi, Ruger. <laughs> Piper is jealous. If you can go get him in his kennel get and, and get him ready for the flight, that would be great. Sure. on his first flight. They're heading about a half hour northwest to a lodge on Uganic Bay. We fly a lot of unusual uh, animals, goats, bears have been flown around here, chickens. I'm not a fan of flying chickens. Snakes. I flew a wounded bald eagle in a dog crate once. We're shipping anything that we can fit in the airplane and keep within weight. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Can I chew on it? Holidays, you know, we like to stop and give a few presents, and, you know, we're kind of the Santa sleigh. <laughs> I've seen entire planes loaded with Christmas presents, and then it's pretty fun. It's fun to go to each village and have 20 cars pull up to your plane, you know, spend 10 minutes handing out boxes to everybody. Feels good. Island Air spreads a little extra holiday cheer to its frequent flyers. These gifts are for Larry Carroll. He is down at Kodiak Adventures Lodge. Peter's going to deliver them. take the gifts to Kaluta Bay, about 43 miles southwest of the basin. Island Air, one off kilo is off for Kaluta Bay. All right, Peter, we'll see you later. We run a lodge business, and we rely very heavily on bush pilots because there's no other way in or out. Hey, guys, how you been? Pretty good, good Peter. Pretty good. Here, we got some stuff from Island Air for you. Thank you. OK. Thanks. We got something for you. That's your usual treat you get oh, when you come yeah. in. I always one love coming you, here. Family. I can't then, promise that'll make it all the way back to town. <laughs> <laughs> and those are for you for Christmas. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Hey. Both longtime Kodiak residents, okay. Bob and Larry have worked together for years. We have a great relationship uh, with Bob and his whole family. That's why we work with Island Air. I trust that. A few years ago, 
that trust was put to the test. We were trying to make it out uh, for a funeral. And we were looking at the weather. It was a little dicey. But you know, Bob said, yeah, you know, if we can get you out here in the next two, three hours, it's still pretty good. Uh, they're calling for winds to pick up later in the afternoon. Bob came in, decided to come in on the Beaver because he thought it was a little risky to take the 206. He got here. The winds had picked up. It was one of those situations where it was getting worse rapidly. So we loaded the plane. We got in. We got out around the bay, and we hit 60, 65 mile an hour headwinds. And we hit those winds head on, and the plane almost seemed like it just stopped in midair. One minute you're okay, and the next minute the plane is free fall. It just dropped. When bad weather hits Kodiak Island, it hits with a vengeance. We've had record amounts of rain. There's so many changing conditions. It's thunderstorms, icing. It's really more up to you as the pilot. You have to develop your options and your outs. Larry Carroll has a deep respect for the island's bush pilots. To be a pilot on Kodiak takes some nerves of steel sometimes. Uh, I've been in some nasty weather where it closed in on us, and you're halfway through the flight and you can see the pilot scrambling. A couple of years ago, he had a terrifying experience with Kodiak's harrowing weather. We were trying to make it out uh, for a funeral. The winds had picked up, and it was raining, and Bob decided to come in on the beaver. We got out around the bay, and we hit 60, 65 mile an hour headwinds. It just dropped. That plane fell you know, four or 500 feet. You see that ground coming up really fast, and Bob is doing everything he can to get control of the plane. You're at God's mercy at that point. And it was just like a roller coaster. Your stomach goes back down. The nose comes up on that plane, and we start climbing again. He pulled it back up, got us back up where we were supposed to be. And Bob had this look on his face like he had just cheated death. We hit that dock, Bob tied that plane up permanently for the night, looked at us and said, man, if we'd have been in a 206, he said, we'd have been in the drink. We wouldn't have survived that. That was just like an epiphany, like, thank God I got a great pilot and a great plane. First flown in 1947, the Beaver's rugged versatility made it popular with militaries around the globe. If you're looking for a workhorse, if you're looking for something that runs day in, day out, the beaver. Most of these beavers are, you know, 1952, 1954. When was the last time you saw a 54 Chevy on the road? The plane's production ceased in 1967. Today, a refurbished beaver is worth well over a half a million dollars. The beaver, it's just built tough, it's simple very strong, and, uh, and that's why we still use them today. But like any machine, the plane requires regular maintenance. So every 100 hours, uh, when you're working an airplane for hire, you got to pull it out to a 100-hour inspection. We're about to pull uh, 47 off kilo out of the water. Bob's going to back a trailer in, and we're going to pull it up onto a trailer out of the water, just like you pull a boat out of the water. Usually, pulling the beaver out of the water is routine. Island air maintenance, commercial ramp, crash boat harbor. But with a severe storm fast approaching the island, this may prove to be a daunting task. It just gets more difficult to pull it when the weather comes up. This wind's really big. What's interesting, the wind's coming around that point. It should be pointing out but it's actually spinning him around. When sitting untethered on the water, float planes are at their most vulnerable to high winds. The extraction will not be easy. I'll tell you right now, I'm gonna get wet. I'm gonna wanna keep 
Spanish. Yeah, but once we, if we can get me just out to where I'm not floating, it's gonna be fine. I think if you untie it right now, it's just gonna get worse. Yeah. And then I might back in further and then out. Just start it. Starting the Beaver's engine might give the plane enough momentum to get out. Bob's pickup doesn't have enough traction to pull the plane. If the Beaver drags him into the water, the truck will be trashed. $400,000 airplane, $15,000 truck. There was no doubt in my mind, I'm backing that truck in as far as I have to. Go, go, go! Bob and Peter are attempting to get the Beaver out of the water for an inspection. But strong winds from a storm front are making the task difficult. Bob's truck is struggling to pull the 3,000-pound plane. He can't just stop. Tides are moving. Wind's going to get worse. Peter decides to kill the plane's engine and try a more hands-on approach. Start it up, Pete. Go, go, go! There's your drama for the day. <laughs> the winds were the worst they could be. They were exactly opposite of what we needed. Mission accomplished, but not without a battle scar. He saved me. Yeah. <laughs> of course, he's bleeding all over everywhere. But That's twice your Mark a up. good chief pilot. <laughs> Were you bleeding? Oh, just on my finger. Hey, take one for the yeah. team. <laughs> for the job. Now, they must get the plane with a 50-foot wingspan into the hangar. Anytime time you're moving an aircraft, you want people on the wings to make sure the wings don't hit, the tail doesn't hit. Straight back, just like you're coming. Gotta start turning. Turn it over. You're gonna hit. Whoa. How's the wing for? I need to check that wing. Okay, it won't hit, right? You just stay on that wing. You're in. With the beaver finally in the hangar, Director of Maintenance Adam Lutz now takes over with the critical job of inspecting the plane. We look at the engine, the airframe, um, propeller. You, you, we go through it from, from tip to tip. During 100-hour inspections, we've, we've found some pretty, some pretty bad stuff from time to time. You know, it doesn't happen all that often, but uh, Number one priority is keeping keep, keep the planes safe and keeping them flying. The slow season is also a time for pilots to do a little mental maintenance. We're going to go up to Seal Bay up on the Fognac and uh, go hunting, hope they shoot up some ducks. Done a lot of deer hunting and a lot of other hunting, but uh, we're kind of new at the, uh, the duck hunting, so this will be an experience for us. I'm definitely going to shoot more. Eric's going to miss them all. Peter and Eric will travel to Phoenix Bay, 43 miles north of the basin. All right, let's go hunt. Hey, Luke. Yeah, guys. good to see you. Been a while. Hunting guide Luke Randall from the Afognak Wilderness Lodge will accompany Peter and Eric on their duck hunt. Running a wilderness lodge out here, we're very dependent on island air. And so it, having good pilots like Eric and Peter and Bob is huge for us because um, the reliability and the safety, we know our hunters are in good hands. Hopefully we'll go get a bunch of quackers for you today. Yeah, go whack some ducks. Yeah. I think they'll do pretty good. I know they got the hand-eye coordination down, being pilots. Plane should be good to leave it right here, Luke. No All problem. Right. Sounds good. I'll drive. All right, perfect. So is December usually the best time for duck hunting up here? Yeah, it just if it gets cold in early November, then it's good. Yeah. All right, guys, here you go. So I'll drop you off right on the point. Okay. As soon as you fire your first round, it's going to spook a lot of them that are up in the bay, and then they'll start flying. This is going to be insane. All right, so this is the hot spot. We'll give it a shot. All right, the ducks are going to be coming straight at us. 
All right, we're ready. Here they come. Give it to them. Dude, your shell's freaking hit me in the face. <laughs> Man, we suck at this. Yeah. <laughs> While Eric and Peter warm up their trigger fingers, Bob is heading out on his own adventure. Frank Bishop is a master guide in this area. Today we're gonna go out and find a buffalo. My family and another family own about somewhere around 500 head of buffalo. They're open range animals, they're not fenced. Let's go now. All righty. Frank's bison hunting grounds are in Pasag Shack, 24 miles south of Island Air. Well, what a day, huh? Surprised there's no bear on that whale right now. Something's about eating on it. Yeah, there's bears all over Kodiak, and they can be very dangerous. But with a little bit of common sense, you can make things a whole lot easier. Hey, look at this. What's what's going on here? Well, we better be a little bit careful, because there has been a bear here. This is their environment. They, they live from one end of this island to the other. They're right in town here. So I carry my gun if I'm out. It's common sense to be bear aware anywhere on the island, especially when bringing down a bison. Go up on the hill here, just past those trees up there, there's an opening, and there's usually a pretty good herd in there. All right, let's sneak right up here. Bison were first brought to the island in the 1990s, after ranchers got tired of losing dozens of cattle every year to the island's enormous brown bears. Bison are better able to hold their own in this wild country. There's a good bull right there, though. All right, okay. So which? He's right. He's right there in the middle, Bob. So it's wait till he gets in the open. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. He stopped okay. right there. Okay. Right. Some Kodiak residents mourn the loss of summer. For Island Air. Winter is a welcome respite. Their schedule slows down, and they have time to enjoy all that Kodiak has to offer. Well, what a day, huh? Today, Bob is hunting bison with guide and longtime friend, Frank Bishop. He's right there in the middle, Bob. So it's wait till he gets in the open. OK, OK, all right. OK, he stopped okay. right there. Right. All right, good shot, good shot. <laughs> down. You know, I still get excited. Adrenaline was flowing pretty good. One shot, boom, down. All right, that's, uh, you just put 450 pounds of meat in your freezer. <laughs> now the work starts, buddy. <laughs> you know, I spend so much of my time flying other hunters and fishermen, and so a day like today where I can get out and, and honestly just enjoy the quiet, the outdoors, oh yeah, it's so filling. It's, uh, this is why I'm here. That will fill so, the freezer. You're right. Let's go get the equipment. Let's get it dressed out. All right. Hopefully, Peter and Eric are having the same luck with their hunt. You guys still did good, all in all. I mean, you should see some of my uh. professional duck hunters. <laughs> good job. Great. Yeah. I do enjoy getting out and going hunting. You know, just see some new land where you're not going to see anybody else. Just this constant adventure is. The winter months mean rest and relaxation for the entire Island Air team. January, February, March, it slows way down. You know, the, the whole uh, heartbeat of the island's very slow. 
everyone knows how they want to spend their upcoming downtime. I get longer naps in the afternoon. That's what I get. <laughs> Some focus on work. We had a real busy summer, and uh, now we're working on getting some more planes online, and uh, we're already looking forward to next summer. Some on improving their skills. It'll probably take about two months to train up in the full plane, so I'll be up to speed by spring. Some on their social life. I'll have bonfires at the beach, or uh, go and visit the local brewery. Uh, we have good times. Some on trips. Now's the time of year where people are going to start taking vacations and going in. Um, warming up and thawing out, and it's amazing how just a day or two off the rock will uh, make you want to be right back here. Some on adventures. So I've got a big trip planned in March. I'm going to try to fly the idea to run with a couple of friends and, and go hang out and see, see what that's like. And some just want to relax. After our summer schedule, we all need a, some kind of a rest. I just tell people that it's our time to hibernate. As Kodiak settles in for the long winter, Bob Stanford will stay busy flying necessities around the island. And Al Kilo is uh, about a mile short of uh, Left Cape. Slowing down is not in his nature. I don't think my bucket will ever be full. There's always something new. But as I get older, my, my list of items, they change. You can survive this long enough, you get a little different perspectives. It's a lot wider angle lens, so. Only plane in the world you can hang your elbow out the window. When I get to the whole folks home before, you know, there'll be plenty of stories. That's what this job has given me. That's been the beauty of it. It's, it's every day is different. It still is. This is the team of Tendalian Aviation. Every day they risk everything. Alaska's treacherous terrain and wicked weather make this the world's most dangerous place to fly. These are the tales of Alaska's ultimate bush pilots. It's not until you fly and go places that you can't access by road, then you see Alaska. Being a bush pilot is hours and hours of boredom, broken by seconds of sheer terror. Man, there's drama in doing this. There's a lot of stuff that happens, a lot of tragedies. But when you land on a mountain out there and you get out of the helicopter and look at what is in front of us, it's amazing. You got the fuel valve on? No. Tenalian Aviation is a new breed of bush pilot, flying helicopter charters and tours out of Anchorage, Alaska. The forecast is to gust between 30 and 40. Owner Joel Natwick started the company in 1992. We go all over the state. Their fleet consists of three R-44 helicopters, an R-22, a Bell 206 Jet Ranger, and a Piper Super Cub fixed wing. Tenalian Aviation, this is Carrie. How may I help you? With five pilots and countless dangerous jobs weekly, manager Carrie Irwin keeps operations running safely. I get to do everything in the office that needs to be done. Scheduling, coordinating our flights with our pilots, checking whether the routes are going to go and really help take this business to the next level. When are you looking at doing an ice climbing adventure? So I just got a call from three ice climbers. They want to go out to Knick Glacier. I'm going to set them up with Josiah because he is the perfect pilot to take him out ice climbing because he's an avid ice climber and outdoorsman himself. Hey, guys. Hey, how's it going? Ready to go ice climbing? Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Originating in the Italian Alps, the sport is similar to rock climbing, but ice axes and crampons are used to ascend the frozen surface. So it's your first time in a helicopter? Yeah, super excited. Oh, it's going to be the best. Cool. What could go wrong? Yeah, well, hopefully nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. 
Okay, everybody ready? Yeah. Let's go flying. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. The group is flying to the Kinnick Glacier, about 50 miles east of Anchorage on the northern end of the Chugach Mountains. Uh, it's a great valley up there. Get the grand. Oh, yeah. Flying around up here is just, it's incredible. The wilderness is so big here. And the beauty and a lot of times I'm kind of in church up here. Yep. We're in Alaska. It's as dangerous, it's scary, but we get to go to some of the most amazing places on Earth. Let me get a couple wrenches. Back at the hangar, Chief Pilot Mark Barker is performing routine maintenance on one of Tenalian's helicopters. This is a 2200-hour overhaul, so we're making sure all the wiring's good. We just have ended up putting in the transmission, the main rotor gearbox. The big thing we're waiting for now is the engine. When we do these overhauls, we sort of do them in a component fashion and then bring the whole component in. I know it looks like it's all apart, but it's actually pretty close to being done. <laughs> the overhaul means a helicopter is completely disassembled, inspected, and reassembled. It can take months. Proper maintenance on these things could be the difference between life and death. A reality Mark knows all too well. If you fly in Alaska any time at all, you're gonna have close calls, whether it's a mechanical issue or whatever. My buddy John Eshelman, he was a high-time pilot, so they had this big cargo airplane, a C-123, kind of a Vietnam-era airplane, and he's flying to Fairbanks. When you fly from here to Fairbanks, there's about a 10-minute period that there's just nowhere to land. The river's at the bottom of a valley, and the highway hangs on the side of the valley. There's just nowhere to go. And we really don't know to this day what happened. It appears either one engine went bad, or one engine failed, or the propeller failed, or something. And they ended up crashing right in Denali National Park. Alaska averages 100 aircraft accidents annually more than any state in the U.S. A lot of the accidents could have been prevented if uh, people would have done more maintenance. Because if something happens, yeah, it could be catastrophic. A big reason for Alaska's many plane crashes, the weather. It's a little windy. Which Josiah and his group of ice climbers are experiencing right now. Do that for turbulence here locally. Okay, thanks, Jeff. What's that? So normally when we head out to Connect Glacier, we'll start climbing right away and go go up and over the mountain. But today we got high winds and some cloud cover up in the mountain, so we're kind of having to go around a little bit. Flight plans are frequently changed due to threatening weather. A seemingly safe route one minute can quickly turn lethal. This is usually the worst spot. It is more dangerous to fly in Alaska than other places. It's the unknowns. It's the weather and the wind and the, the mountains and all the things you encounter that you can't predict. We'll get a few bumps here crossing this ridge line and then we'll drop down out of the wind because it's nasty. Alaska is not a tame lion. Beautiful, majestic, but not to be messed with. So we fly with the right mixture of let's get the job done, but with caution. While taking a group to ice climb on Kinnick Glacier. I'm gonna approach into the wind here. Josiah runs into high winds and extreme turbulence. It's pretty windy out here today, pretty bumpy. So I'll just take it nice and easy. I think being a bush pilot in Alaska kind of covers a lot of areas. It's everything you have to deal with. The weather, the mountain flying, the wind. So flying in Alaska brings unique challenges. Actually, it looks a little better here. Let's go and see if we can check out the clutin. The glacier's always changing, so we don't have a specific spot we always go to. 
Sometimes you'll see a spot that looks good from up high and you'll get down low and it's not as good as it looked from up high. Hey, there's some ice. Yeah, I don't know guys, I don't think I want to land on this ice. I don't trust it. It's just been so warm and uh, the ice could be rotten, we just don't know. Yeah. So we're not going to land on it today. If you land on the glacier in the wrong spot, it can be a million dollar mistake. The worst thing that could happen is you land on the ice and, and break through and go in the water. Actually, let's run up here and check out Hunter Creek real quick. Oh, there's some ice back there. Yeah, look at that. Can you land on like that type of shrubbery stuff there? No, I'm looking for a spot right now. Let's see if there's a place on top of this thing to land. Oh, look at this. Okay, guys, I think I got a good spot here. Nice and level. Looks like some good climbing nearby. Yeah. The glacier in the winter can be pretty tricky. The snow will mask crevasses and holes on the glacier, and you could end up falling right through the snow into, the, into a brulon or a crevasse. Right. Ice thickness can be determined by color. Blue is the strongest. Light gray to dark black, the weakest. Yeah, this looks good here. While Josiah and his group search for a good climbing wall. Oh, that's good. Right there. Flight instructor Johnny Lukens and owner Joel Netwick are gearing up for a training day. OK, we got the door clear. Yeah, you're clear. Commercial pilots must be reviewed annually. Watch your head. So frequent practice is essential. Joel and I are going to go out to practice for his 135 check ride. One major component of the exam, how to recover from engine failure. We'll go ahead and fill the main up first. We'll top off. Today's test has Johnny in an uncomfortable position. He'll be training Joel. It's a little weird training your boss, but we have a good enough relationship to where uh, we can put aside the employee-employer relationship and change it into a instructor-student relationship. Johnny will make me sweat. Johnny will try to ruffle my feathers. <laughs> Johnny will put me under simulated stress. Yep, that's the idea. <laughs> He's going to see how I do. It's kind of tough, because I'm the boss. <laughs> I think what we'll do today is work on, you know, a little bit more advanced stuff. We're going to do some zero airspeed autos. Zero airspeed? Yeah. OK. Uh, what he needs to work on today are auto rotations, which is the maneuver that we do to practice for engine failures in a helicopter. During auto rotation, the engine is put into idle and the helicopter falls. On the way down, the pilot must keep the aircraft angled to allow airflow upward, which keeps the blade spinning. So we probably got some turbulence we up in the Kennecker River Valley. We got some weather coming in, yeah. The only thing that's tricky today is that the winds are scheduled to pick up, to gust up to like 30 knots, and that makes things a little more hectic. But let's go, man. Let's see what happens. Helicopter 7083 Mike, we are 1,000 feet up below, just two miles to the east, to the west of the old Glen Highway Bridge. I always get my east and west mixed up. Did You're one of my pilots? <laughs> <laughs> Joel and Johnny are heading 40 miles northeast of Anchorage to the Kinnick River Valley, about the same place Josiah battled high winds. We're going to be in the lee of this big mountain. The wind is going to be spilling over. That's going to add to the turbulence that we're going to get when we get in there. So you're going to have to tighten your uh, controls a little, even that much better to keep everything within tolerances. Yeah. You always need to pay attention to the wind. You're flying along every single day. You better know where that wind is coming from and have an idea how strong it is, because it can make the difference between life and death. Go ahead and pick up, fly on board, get ourselves up to about 1,000 feet. RPMs are good, airspeed's good. OK, we're at 1,000 feet. All right, give it a shot, right? Engine failure, three, two, one, here we go. Suddenly, we're dropping straight down to this spot. It was very intense, and I was a little scared. Flying helicopters and airplanes in Alaska brings challenges that a pilot in the lower 48 might not have. Some good, some bad. So you always want to be prepared for an emergency.
Joel and Johnny are simulating helicopter engine failure above the Kinnick River Valley. Your airspeed is going to be fluctuating a bunch because of wind gusts. The high winds don't make the complicated task any easier. We've got wind coming straight down the valley. Kind of in, a, in the lee of the wind a little bit. Yeah. When you're trying to estimate just how strong is that wind and what should I do here, you got your work cut out for you. Because of that headwind, we're just going to drop. OK, I'm going to watch my altitude really closely. The wind pushes against the helicopter with such force, their descent angle will be aggressive. Auto rotations can be dangerous because normally when the engine is on, the helicopter regulates the speed of the rotor disc. When we practice auto rotations, we roll the throttle off. The pilot is responsible for keeping the speed of the rotor disc where it needs to be. And if he doesn't do that properly, we fall out of the sky and there's no way to recover from it. Engine failure. Three, two, one. Here we go. Yeah. Johnny, this feels so weird, man. Yep. Coming in this deep, but we got it. I know. We kind of came almost straight down, maybe a 75 degree angle. Normally, you'd come down at a 45 degree angle and you would have a longer ground run. This time, we came straight down like an elevator. With the steep descent angle, any mistake could be deadly. Okay, I can tell right now we're short. Yeah. Look at that, we're not going to hit our spot at all. We've got the horn going off. I'm seeing the effect of the wind on your uh, descent profile. Yep. It shows you how important it is to always be thinking about the wind while you're flying. Yeah, exactly. We saw fluctuations in our uh, airspeed going 15, 20 knots. And so flying in those conditions with the engine uncoupled is nerve wracking. All right, man. Let's try that again. OK, there's 1,000 feet. All right. There's that turbulence again. Yeah. Okay, we're going to go super steep this time. Give it a little bit more time. Engine failure in three, two, one. Nice. Oh, yeah. Looking good now. <laughs> I'd say that was a darn good one. That's pretty good, though. Yeah. With the spot. Right where? Right there. All right. Yeah, we made it. We entered the max glide to get her to our spot. You handed it. You ended right where you wanted to be. Yeah. You got it. I felt like it went really well. And I felt like I learned a lot. He told me I did great. <laughs> That's probably the most realistic training we've done yet. Oh. We would have walked away from all those. Right. That's the main goal. That's the main goal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> gotta stay alive. That's gotta nice. stay alive. Well, I'm glad we got that in. Oh, that was great, man. On the other side of the valley, Josiah and his passengers are climbing Kanik Glacier. It's one of the largest in South Central Alaska, with an ice field 25 miles long and five miles wide. About just this whole wall, this that looks pretty steep, but. Yeah. It's steeper than you'll get on most any waterfall. When I'm climbing, watch out for ice breaking off. Oh, nice. uh, what we don't want is to get underneath one of these overhanging um, blocks of ice. Glaciers are frozen rivers. They're always moving. Overhanging ice can break away, a very real danger that often kills climbers. It's, it's going to be hard keeping your feet on the wall and with ice. Climbing. Climb on. Oh, got it. Keep your toes pointed straight. There you, there you go. go. Yeah. Don't turn your heels in. <sighs> this glacier ice is really hard right now. Makes it tough. It's a lot harder than it looks. Ah! This is not. Ah! Oh boy. <sighs> There's a lot that could go wrong ice climbing. Anchors can pull out. Gear can fail. You have to know what you're doing. Be careful. <sighs> Being a pilot in Alaska, I'm all about an adrenaline rush, and my job gives me that every day. So I could not be happier with my job. I love it. Josiah and his climbers are attempting to tame Kanik Glacier. <sighs> but right now, 
the glacier is taming them. <sighs> These are holds or not. It's steep. It's really steep. Ice climbing can be tough. The ice we had on this climb was really hard. Um, so your picks aren't going in very deep, your crampons aren't sticking into the ice very deep. Oh, man. Ah! Oh! Yeah! yeah. Don't, don't, pull the, don't pull the axis towards you. Just pull down on them. Oh, man. It's really hard. Uh-oh. Watch the anchor. Watch the rope. One wrong axe chop could sever her rope and send her crashing to the ground. There you yeah, go. just like that. Man, she's cruising. Nice. Woo! Yeah. Woo! Nice work. Woo! How do your forearms feel? Uh, I can't feel. I'll let you know when I can feel them. <laughs> oh, that was a struggle. <laughs> totally worth it. Nice. Jillian, are you ready to come down? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, bud. Yes, I, I didn't can't die. I can't believe you kept moving on that. I like doing tours because I get to show off the state and we get to go to some of the most amazing places on earth. Yeah. Besides the awesome pilot, he feels safe with him, so it's... Mm -hmm. You can definitely tell he knows what he's doing. Yeah. It's not his first rodeo. One of the reasons I feel really good about Tenalian Aviation is that we have a lot of depth and a lot of experience and everybody who's out doing the hardcore flying, the, the bulk of our flying are very aware that they could be next. Though they fly some of the most dangerous skies on the planet, Tenalian's experienced pilots are not risk takers. They aren't daredevils. They're just Alaskans who love to fly. This is a dream job for me. People spend thousands of dollars to come up here and experience what I experience every day. Watch your head, Josiah, coming around. Do you know what you're doing? No, <laughs> I have no idea. We're trying to make this fun. And sometimes you're busy, 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 and you just go home and you're sick of flying this stupid helicopter and you just want to go home. But it's a chance of a lifetime, and we get to do it every day. It's crazy. This is the team of Tedalian Aviation. Every day they risk everything. Alaska's treacherous terrain and wicked weather make this the world's most dangerous place to fly. These are the tales of Alaska's ultimate bush pilots. Tenalian Aviation's main focus is salvage and charter flights, but today there's a lot more at stake. Nephi would have started right here. This is the uh, Prospect Heights trailhead. Anchorage National Guardsman Nephi Soper left on a hike two days ago and never returned. It's pretty urgent. We want to get out there and see if we can find him, help locate him. There's a massive hunt on right now for him. Tenalian's owner, Joel Natwick, and lead pilot, Josiah Freeman, are helping with the search, along with rescue expert, Corey Williams. Altogether, it was a 20-mile hike. He started off at about 7, I think it was like 7 p.m. It was already dark. It was already dark. Corey is very in tune with hiking back in this country and also getting inside the mind of other hikers and what, what they may have, decisions they may have made. I'm 100% sure what he did was he uh, took this trail here. Okay. So he was avoiding all the snow yeah. in this area. Nephi was extremely qualified to make this hike. I mean, he was trained, but this is Alaska. I and mean, no matter how much heart, how much knowledge, how much skill you have, this can still take you. What were the weather conditions like the day he went out? We had a big storm right after. Yeah, I remember. The conditions were so bad. 50 knot winds and maybe two miles of visibility at the head of the lake. It was bad. 
I'm really familiar with the area up there. There's a lot of places you can hike on a trail where you end up with a 2,000 foot drop on the other side of you and uh, pretty gnarly terrain. Josiah, have you been hiking back in there? Mm hmm The snow is melting fast out there. Do you expect there to be stable snow, avalanche possibility? Yeah, when he was going up there, I think there was a high possibility for avalanche. The avalanche is an issue. And with the sun heating the snow during the day and then freezing at night and then heating it, the snow can become unstable and he could have gotten into an avalanche. They didn't find any footprints anywhere near Ship Creek Valley. And this whole area back here is just really deep snow. So if he is anywhere in any of this, he has to be back behind that spot. And the problem today is that the weather, it's nice here, but it's really windy up high. Yeah. Um, we may not be able to get in this couloir. Just depends on the wind. You guys know what to do. Okay. And uh, just be careful of the wind with the turbulence. Yeah. Let's not make more problems. Yeah. So go out and take it as best you can and look for him. But if it gets too turbulent, get out of there. Yeah. There's urgency to find Nephi, but if we run into turbulence that's just too much, we're not going to create a couple of fatalities. All right, here we go. Josiah and Corey start their search in Chugach State Park, about 10 miles southeast of Anchorage. The big question, can they find Nephi before it's too late? So these are your planes? Well, this is two of them. Tenalian's chief pilot, Mark Barker, and flight instructor Pablo Niera are taking to the skies. Man, this is I a, love I it. I got the Kristen Eagle here, and that's the long easy. Not unusual for a couple of pilots, but this ride's a little different. They're flying in one of Mark's home-built planes. I built both of them. How long did it take you to build this? It took me about three years to finish it up. It's a world-class unlimited aerobatic machine. Up, down, sideways, anything we can stand, the airplane can do. Mark Barker is really into aviation, is one of those aviation geeks, and he builds his own plane, so I feel privileged to fly with Mark today. On this particular one, the pilot sits in the back. So I'll be sitting in the front? You'll be sitting in the front. I don't trust you to sit in the back <laughs> yet. That's tomorrow. This is the first time in uh, one of those biplanes, and the that's loops and stuff, so I'm skeptical about this. <laughs> First thing we're gonna do is we're just gonna climb up the altitude here. When you're doing aerobatic maneuvers, you wanna have a lot of altitude underneath you. You want it safe to recover. Yeah, I want enough room to recover. This is gonna be a simple aileron roll. We're gonna get a little speed here. And as I pull up, we're just going to send the airplane around in a nice, gentle way, just like this. Whoa. Oh, man, that's cool. Look at that. We're coming out of a roll. Wow. <laughs> we're going to pull up. And we'll push forward and send it around. I don't want to make you sick. <laughs> but you don't want to go back to town without doing one more aileron roll. <laughs> now I'm getting sick. This is crazy, Pablo. What are we doing? He's having fun today, but Mark's experienced other flights that weren't so enjoyable. Me and a buddy are in the Super Cub, and I'm trying to teach him how to how to pull gliders. We're up in the air, and the engine kind of goes, burr, burr. and we're going, whoa. Now we're just over the trees off the end of the runway with a glider on the back. And we get about 100, 200 feet above the trees, 300 feet above the trees, and the engine just quit. Vroom. Alaskan bush pilots face danger on a regular basis. We're up in the air and the engine kind of goes brr, brr While pulling a glider, Mark had a brush with death. 
And we're going, whoa, now we're just over the trees off the end of the runway with a glider on the back. And we get about 100, 200 feet above the trees, 300 feet above the trees, and the engine just quit. Vroom. Well, the first thing you do, the engine quits, is you reach down and pop the glider loose. That guy just turned around, and he landed back on the runway. So you're just above the trees. And I told Bob, I said, don't go in the trees. He goes, I'm not going in the trees. Don't go in the trees. I'm not going in the trees. And we're going down together. Both of us look down, and there's a big open field. And this little field is right next to a lake. So he's kind of gliding down. Get down near the ground. And he just starts to level out to start to flare and land. And the engine came back wide open. Wow, shoves us out over the lake and it quit for the last time. Man, as soon as those landing gear hit the water, boom, upside down, the window blew out, full the, filled the cabin with water, and now the thing's going blub, blub, blub down underneath the water. I helped pull Bob out of the thing, and we swam to shore. We get up on the beach, and Bob, the ultimate joker, he looks over at me and kind of goes, well, now what do you want to do? I tell all my folks here at Tenalian, the number one rule is just land. We don't have to take the risk. We're not rescuing refugees. We don't need to push and push and push and push and push. We're just doing a job. Usually true, but today Tenalian is flying a rescue mission. The original search took place starting here. Pilot Josiah and rescue expert Corey Williams are scouring the Alaskan landscape for a missing hiker. Where do you want to start? You want to see if we can climb up the ridge where you think he went first? Yeah. Mephi Soper disappeared in Chugach State Park two days ago. Rescue personnel are working night and day, but still no sign of him. I'm a big hiker myself. I understand the area. I understand the, the risks, the dangers. And so, you know, I feel like I can relate to him and, and the way that he did things. OK, so this is the trail that he was on here. All right. We're on the right track here, for sure. My hope today is that we can get up there and at least circle around the area that I believe he's in. I'm hoping uh, we can find him today. Every hour that goes by diminishes our chance of getting him back successfully. We've got to get back there. We've got to find him as soon as possible. Big updraft there. Oh, these drops are major. We're at 2,000 feet right now. The higher we climb up here into the mountains, the more the wind is affected by the terrain um, as it comes over these peaks. And you get more downdrafts and more turbulence. Josiah is smart enough to fly in, poke his nose into it. If it gets too rough, he'll get out of there. But he will try to find Nephi if he can. OK, so here we go. These on the left side here, this is our uh, our peak. OK. I think we can pretty much rule out that he's still stuck up here. Because I'm not seeing anything. No sign. However, I can see where he'd go down on this other side. All right. So right below us here, we have the Willow Out Lakes. One of my fears is that he might have been hiking up in the Willow Out Valley and may have somehow fell into some sort of crevice which dropped him down into the lake. Cold water robs body heat 32 times faster than cold air. Freezing water kills within 30 minutes. Center weather advisory 106 for all level winds here in turbulence. There's our turbulence. Wow, yeah. That is a little turbulent. It'll just be windier and the, and the bumps, the gustiness will be more the higher we get. Whoa. Whoa. That was a very interesting drop. Yep. Pretty good wind shear here. Oh, yeah. Wow. We got about 40 knots of wind on the nose right now. Whoa. OK. It wasn't until we really started getting close to the peaks, getting up close, that it, the, the flight started getting real scary. We're kind of going like this, up and down. And it's just like, I'm thinking, wow, this could be the end for me. I feel like the wind is getting a little crazy here. I think it's a good time to turn around. We're getting some pretty good bumps here, some pretty good wind shear, so. Yeah. It's just no good here, so. Yeah, whoa. We'll just make a turn and head on back out. All right. Start getting big bumps like that. There's no reason to be there. So while I do want to find him sooner, I'd rather be safe. 
Well, I really appreciate you guys donating your time to do this. Yep, we'll just keep watching the weather and get a good window. We'll try it again. The nice thing is I'll be able to go back to his family today and at least give him some sort of update, you know? Yeah. Every day that we can't fly is another day that the family has to go uh, without you know, knowing what happened to him. So I'm hoping that we can get out there sooner rather than later to find him. Corey's coming in this morning. Mm -hmm. The Tenalian crew and rescue expert Corey Williams are hunting for a lost soldier. Nephi Soper was a, uh, a guy that was working out here for the National Guard. One night, he decided to go take a late hike, and uh, it, was a, it was a 20 mile hike through the mountains, but he didn't return um, to, to report into duty. Is anybody on the ground? Yep, they've got ground crews searching. Josiah and Corey went up yesterday looking for him, but high winds forced them to turn back. There's some urgency because the weather's changing fast. It's still windy, but it looks like a little break, um, but it's probably not gonna hold, so we're gonna head out right away. We'll see if we can find him. You got good chances here, bud. Yep. So I'm clear for takeoff. Josiah will go and do what he can today to get in there with Corey. But rule number one with all of my pilots, don't crash. We're not going to push it. So on this trip, I think what I want to do is head straight back into that area where we can uh, see that ridge that I believe he went over. Yeah. yeah. OK. They're searching Chugach State Park, just seven miles east of Anchorage. Although close to town, the area has 280 miles of trails reaching deep into Alaska's wilderness. Nephi has a lot of training in cold weather conditions, and that's why I think there's a good chance he's alive. The biggest problem after Nephi went missing was that it was really windy. Flurries would come in and just snow the place out. Yeah, there was no visibility. So what's really hard is even if he did find a place to, you know, hunker down, he had to keep moving. Another thing we need to do is keep our eyes out for footprints. OK. So here we are. We're on the backside of this uh, steep pass that he might have come down. So the biggest problem I'm encountering now is the fact that there's so many black spots, so many spots here that look like they could be legs, they could be arms, it could be just somebody laying in the snow. But it's like, there's a rock. That might be a bush. Hard to tell. So we're looking for a guy who's wearing dark pants and a camouflage uh, jacket. So really, he's matching in with a lot of the rocks out there. So the problem is we need to get down really close, close to the mountain, to be able to look. There's a million things that could go wrong. There's a big avalanche that ripped out right there below us. Oh my gosh. Big avalanche. Oh my god. This area is scary, I'm not going to lie. In the past decade, 38 people have died in Alaskan avalanches. The most dangerous time of the year, spring. As everything starts to melt, it's just becoming more and more of a hazard. Oh my god, dude. You know, even though there is a chance that he's stuck in an avalanche, they are survivable. I mean, if you get stuck on the top of it, if you're able to at least pull yourself out of it, I mean, there is a chance that you can climb your way to safety. Oh yeah, it's the real deal. Not seeing him, though. Not in that area. But my heart sinks after I see this because I know now just how bad it could be. No. Uh huh. Hang on, just say, I see something right down there. Right down there. Okay. okay. It looks like it's dug out. Like somebody might have been there. If we can land here, that'd be perfect. Just if the wind is bad right now, just fighting this big downdraft here. Yeah, I feel it. The wind was swirling. It was going up and down. We didn't really know what was happening. It was like the wind was caught between two saddles around the, that little hill that we were on. Nope, I don't like this. That's scary. OK, I got to pull out of this. Boy, the wind is just so weird here. I've never seen anything like this. It seems like it's spinning all around, swirling. Huge updraft. I don't want to land here. Hang on, just say, I see something right down there. Right down there. OK. If we can land here, that'd be perfect. While on reconnaissance for a lost hiker in the Chugach Mountains. Boy, the wind is just so weird here. I've never seen anything like this. Josiah and Corey are battered by erratic winds. It seems like it's spinning all around, swirling. It was bad turbulence, and the blades on a on a rotorcraft 
don't handle turbulence all that well, it makes it rough. Yeah, I don't want to land here. Maybe we'll go to the other side. I'll just circle around it for a minute here. Drop down. How's it looking? I think I see a good spot. I'm seeing. So we're coming down, and it is windy. It is really hard. And honestly, I'm kind of shaking. Corey, will you pop your door open and look at my tail rotor and see if it's clear as I land? You're good so far. Okay, okay man, uh, I'm, I'm not going to shut down right here. It's too windy. Okay. So you can hop out and, and uh, take a look at that. And uh, just stay low and hold on to your hat. Will do. I get out of the helicopter, and right in front of the helicopter, uh, there was a big pile of bear poop. And that was, I mean, it was super fresh. So the bears are out. Um, then I made my way over to the bush, and it was absolutely what I thought. It was the perfect shelter. There was this little spot just underneath that somebody could have easily uh, slept in. I see a good spot, but he's not here. Unfortunately, we didn't find him or any signs of anyone, but you know, that's, we tried. When you think you see something, obviously you get excited. You get your hopes up, but it wasn't him. Yeah, man, it, it's getting bad out here. It's getting windy and, and uh, it's coming down right, right in behind us. Let's get out of here. All right. Let's look again tomorrow. Good idea. I am sad that we didn't find Nephi, but you know, uh, I'm not giving up. It's just gonna take more time, that's all. I just hope we can find him before it's too late. It's been seven weeks since Nephi went missing and it's hard now to believe of any positive outcome. When it's one, two, three, four, five, six, ten days, maybe there's a chance, but now there's, it's just been too long, and the state finally called it off and said we're in a recovery mode now. Yeah, it's unforgiving out there, especially he went at night, and then that storm rolled in, and man. If and when the family comes up, I'd like to give him a flight up there. Show him where he was, what yeah. he was doing. Yeah, I would want to know. Yeah. I try to put myself in their shoes. I'm not sure how you deal with it. It's just tough. As the book closes on one chapter, it opens on another. 20 minutes ago, my daughter had a baby boy, and I'm stuck here working on a helicopter. Congratulations. <laughs> Way to go, Mark. That's awesome. There's her and her husband and the new baby. How cool is that? Quit talking, get to work. <laughs> the Tenalian pilots joke, but for them, nothing is more important than family. I have a friend of mine, and I hopped in this buddy's airplane once, and he had a picture of his family on the dashboard. He said, I always want to remember that this flight right here, this flight right here is the most important flight I will ever take. And that picture helps me remember that. Being a bush pilot is hard on a family because the life of a pilot is you have to cut and run when the job is there or when the need arises. But I know that I can't be stuck in a routine every day just doing same old, same old. I gotta be a bush pilot. This is the team of Tenalian Aviation. Every day they risk everything. Alaska's treacherous terrain and wicked weather make this the world's most dangerous place to fly. These are the tales of Alaska's ultimate bush pilots. That's all I got for you. Thanks for the meal, you want some crab? Thanks, Jim, yeah, okay. this is awesome. With over 250 remote villages, Alaskans rely heavily on air transportation. Here, we got some stuff from Island Air for you. All right, thanks, Pete. Between private and commercial pilots, hundreds of flights occur daily. With that much air traffic, 
Crashes are inevitable. One of the things Tenalian Aviation we're known for, and Joel Natwick specifically, is our aircraft salvage work. I've probably gone and got 30 to 40 airplanes over the years. All over Alaska, there's a high demand for guys like us. Even though the crash might be significant and it might be a bad crash, a lot of very expensive parts do make it through. A headset's a thousand bucks, the Tundra tires can be five thousand dollars, and on and on. All right, so we got the coordinates. We're heading up near Yentna. We just got a call that there was a Super Cup that uh, a guy crashed into the trees. He was flying in uh, kind of bad weather. Next thing he remembers is waking up in the hospital. The pilot was lucky. Alaska averages 100 plane crashes annually. One in 10 are fatal. It sounds a little iffy where it's at and where it landed. So we're doing a scouting flight to get out there and see what we're going to need to get the thing out. We'll find a landing zone, places to stage fuel, and set down. Perfect. We have the coordinates that were provided by uh, the Rescue Coordination Center. And they have said that the airplane should be within 400 yards of those coordinates. OK, let's do it. Two big fat guys in a helicopter. Two? Mark and Joel are headed to the remote upper Yetna River, about 80 miles northwest of Anchorage. Welcome to looking for a crashed airplane. Out where this wreck is, we're in the middle of nowhere. It's about as far from any road system, I think, as you can get. There's a good amount of snow out here. One of the things that's difficult is we're looking for a white aircraft in the snow. It's going to be tough to find. OK, we're going over the spot right now. Let's just keep going straight. But he's close to these hills here. Yeah. Man alive, this is the hard part. OK, the trees are really thick right here. Yeah. And every tree that's fallen over looks like a wing to me. It's got to be in there, Mark. Man. we got to find this thing. Man, I feel like an idiot here. Let's just go this way for a little bit. I'm going to pull up coordinates. Let's make sure okay. the coordinates are in there correctly. Yeah. GPS coordinates are critical for any operation like this. So if I have one number off, it could be hundreds and hundreds of feet. Being off by a couple hundred feet might mean whether we can find it or not. GPS finds your location by communicating with four or more satellites in orbit. OK, we are 0.6 beyond our point. Yeah, I think the guy sent us wrong coordinates. This is when it gets frustrating. Man, maybe it's in the next stand yeah. over. Yeah, yeah. Let's go all the way into those trees over there. I got it. I got it right off my nose here down low. See that big tree right there, the yeah. big green tree? I yeah. see it. Right, right. That is hard to see. You need to log the best landing spot that's closest. We can't land right on top of the wreckage because it's in the trees. So we're going to have to land about maybe a quarter mile away and walk in through the woods to get to it. Is this OK? Yeah, that's good, man. All right. Joel can't see the crash location from the ground, so Mark goes back up and acts as Joel's eyes in the sky, leading him to the crash site. But as soon as Mark gets in the air, the plan goes awry. Uh. The trees are so dense, he can't find Joel. Where is this thing? I am looking on the ground to see if I can find it. Man, I can't believe this tree cover is so thick. It's tough. It's, this is tough. Yeah, I'm going to have a hard time keeping track of him. I kept seeing a helicopter going around and around and flying by, and I, I figured out what's going on. He can't find me. He can't see me. Maybe he's having a hard time finding the wreck again. I don't know. But man, the tree cover's so thick, I'm losing his tracks in the snow. I'm going to get a fire going, get some smoke, try to help Mark find me. Yeah, good smoke. I am looking on the ground to see if I can find him. There. That's what we need right there, man. It is so hard to see here in the trees. Now, hopefully, he's looking in the right spot. This smoke has got to get above these trees. Here it comes. I think he sees the smoke. I'm going to get out in this clearing. 
Darkness is descending, and the temperature has dropped below freezing. Making matters worse, they're burning up precious fuel needed to return home. Ah. While guiding Joel to a crash site, I lost the... Mark loses sight of him in the dense trees. That's weird. I smell smoke. But I look down in the trees and I see a light column of smoke coming up through the trees. Yeah, there we go. Let me divert over here. There's the fire over there. I, I know what he's trying to do. He's showing me where he is at, knowing that I lost track of him. OK, there he is. I'm going to hover over him. I see him down there. I'm going to hover over him and point toward the wreck, point my nose toward the wreck. And I'm just going to slowly hover that direction toward the wreck. He's coming upon the wreck. Oh, there we go. OK, I got the wreckage. Man, that thing is mangled. I'm walking up to the wreck thinking, how in the world did anybody survive this? It's just pancaked in. It's demolished. The cockpit is about 50% the capacity or the size that it was. Oh, I'm going to move that. For getting this out of here is to come in and finish taking that wing off. And then I'm probably going to cut the fuselage where it's twisted like a dish rag and sling what remains of the fuselage and this engine out in one load. We can do it. With a salvage game plan in place, Joel returns to the helicopter, a quarter mile hike in deep snow. Slowly, uh, I began to get pretty hypothermic. My boots are packed. Yeah. They are packed with snow. It's so deep in there. Joel's core body temperature is rapidly dropping. The hour-long flight back to Anchorage will be brutal. Yeah, let's go. And on the way back, I start paying attention to my fuel gauges. And I had one thought in my mind. This might be a little tight. We might be a little on the edge. We might not be able to make it all the way back to Anchorage with this fuel load. Yeah, shoot. Well, fuel lights on again. Yeah. That's our A3 mic. Yeah, we had a low fuel light. Come on, sir. Helicopter A3 mic, Roger. We're flying back, and here comes the inlet, and the low fuel light's coming on. I'm only four minutes from the airport, but we have a rule at the company here. When the low fuel light comes on, you're landing. We're not going to stretch it. We have no choice but to put the helicopter down to land as soon as we can to be sure that we don't have an engine failure. OK, let me get down here low level. Just pick out a place to land over there. Ah, shoot. I got it. Give me a break. We landed on the other side of the inlet here, and I just didn't want to go across the water. There's a lot of people who've crashed from running out of gas, and I don't want to be one of them. That decision making right there is a make it or break it in Alaska with a lot of pilots. It's called get home itis. You want to get home so bad. Your fuel is low, and you start thinking, ah, I can push it. Well, that's when a lot of guys go down. Ah, oh, sorry about that, boss. Oh, man. Mark turns off the helicopter to save fuel. Unfortunately, that means no heat for Joel. I'm about to dump a gallon of water out of my boot, man. This is not a good time, because I'm getting a fever. I really am. Oh, I think I'm just hypothermic. <sighs> I'm going to get back inside. Even this tiny little breeze we got is something yeah. I don't need right now. Mark makes an emergency call to the hangar. Hey, Pablo. Mark here. Hey, Mark. Yeah, we got a low fuel light. So we're right across the inlet on the other side. We're four minutes from Merrill, but I don't want to go 
go across the water. I want to be safe with everything. If you can bring me five gallons of gas over, that'd be great. OK, so just two, two jugs? Yeah, and Pablo, if you can, kind of hurry it up. Uh, we're right over here, but Joel's really cold. He's been walking through the snow a lot. And if you could rush it up, that would be great. OK, cool. When you get wet and cold in Alaska this time of year, it's that perfect time of year to get hypothermia. Are you doing OK? Really cold. You know, I can keep this thing running for the heater. You want to do that? No. He's only bringing five gallons. I'm staying in here sheltered from the wind just because of hypothermia. Yeah. Hopefully Pablo gets here quick because it is cold. It's getting dark out. I'm wet. And we are literally in the middle of nowhere. And we need to pay attention and be careful because anything could happen. While returning from a salvage scouting trip, oh, feel right on again. Joel and Mark almost run out of gas. Just pick out a place to land over there. Pablo is bringing them fuel, but time is of the essence. Joel is becoming hypothermic. This is not a good time, because I'm getting a fever. I really am. Ah, there he is. Sorry about that, boss. It's nicer to be sitting here than swimming. Yeah. I try to go out and get a job done safely. But that does mean sometimes you get in a little bit precarious situations. That's the nature of the business. OK, guys, here's the pictures that I took when I was on site. Salvage jobs are unpredictable, so a detailed plan of attack is crucial. Let's talk about some of the dangers here. What can get us in trouble? I'm not that experienced uh, slinging. I've done a few uh, jobs, but I've never done one in the trees. You're going to have to really be technical and come up real straight to not start mm -hmm. snagging branches. Yeah. That's going to be brutal. This can be a dangerous mission. Um, it's definitely going to be tricky and challenging, and uh, there's a lot that can go wrong. This airplane, it's just a gangly mess. It's going to yeah. want to mess you up strategy in place, the crew gears up to retrieve the wreck. One critical piece of equipment, bear protection. All right. Bears are out. Yeah. I'm serious. The bears have come out of hibernation. We actually had one in our neighborhood a couple nights ago. I didn't think we'd see one, but I was prepared. This is going to be a tough one. Salvage jobs require hundreds of pounds of gear. Two helicopters are needed to split up the weight. Rock and roll. OK, I got a pretty good wind on my deal when I circle here. I got to keep up a little bit of speed. OK. And it'll be a handful with this wind. If it's windy, it's that much harder because the wind is grabbing the load, the wind is grabbing the helicopter and moving it around, and it can, be, it can get dangerous. Yeah, there it is. Man, look at that thing. It's a bad crash. Holy cow, that is a crash. I cannot believe the guy survived that thing. Man, that is a tight spot. Bucky, you're so good. Ah, uh, yeah, right. How are you feeling about it? Uh, I'm scared. Yeah, I'm glad you're doing it, not me. <laughs> It'll be interesting to see what it looks like from the ground. And here we are. Oh, cow. Wow. Every time you go flying, you think about where you're going to land if you have an engine failure. And you take the risk of crashing every time you leave the ground. So it just kind of brings it home when you walk up on a wreck like that and see it. That's fuel coming out. Yep, that's not good. There's no fuel in it? There's fuel coming out. Untangling the wreckage from the tree requires cutting the plane into pieces. One spark could ignite the aviation fuel and cause an explosion. OK, ready? Mission accomplished. Now, 
They must disassemble the Super Cub. Okay, right wing's off. Nice. I think this is frozen into the ground, actually. Oh, okay. We may have a real job on our hands. Okay, the prop's off. There you go. Josiah, why don't you uh, go get the Jet Ranger? We're ready for you. Okay. The team straps up the wreckage. This is going to put him and the helicopters to the test. This is going to be a real strain. I'm nervous. I got the butterflies. It'll be, uh, it'll be challenging. We're right underneath you. OK. Josiah must thread the 150-foot line between the dense trees. You're going to have to go up to about 450 on your altimeter, I think, to uh, clear the trees with the hook. Man, this is a long one. It's really tense. You have to be super precise and not lose focus for a second, because um, you get the hook tangled in the trees, and you're going down. If that hook lets go, bail. Get out of the way. Oh! If the load is too heavy, the line could snap, and 700 pounds of debris could fall on Mark and Joel. OK, you guys, be careful. OK, Mark, get out of there. The Tenalian crew is slinging a Rex Super Cub out of a thick forest. Hey, Mark, tell them to back up. Back up just a bit. The 700-pound load is taxing for both the helicopter and the pilot. The line really started to swing. The hook started to oscillate. Once I uh, got the weight of the fuselage on the line, you're looking at the load, and you're glancing at your torque gauge, and it was right at 100% picking it up. Straight up, looking good. That's about as good as it gets, right there. And that's Josiah Freeman, right there. He's a free man. <laughs> Woo! Very good. Good job. The celebration is short-lived. Josiah must sling three more loads of wreckage. He's on! Yeah, you're good to go. Straight up, beautiful. You're clear. You're totally centered. woo Very nice. Looks good. Next load will be the net with all the parts and pieces. OK, we're ready for him. Just coming up, nice and slow. He's good to go. And we're hooked up. Pull it up slow. Be careful. And you're clear of the tree. Is that all of it now? Should I shut down? Yeah, that's all of it, Josiah. Yeah, you're good to go. OK. Josiah was nervous going into this. I, I knew he could do it. I mean, I probably have more confidence in him than he does himself. And he did it better than all of our expectations. Josiah is good at anything he does. Yeah, very good. Man, great job. That was, man, that was a tight one. Yep, I'm worn out. They may be tired, but experiences like these are the stuff of dreams for every Alaskan bush pilot. We all kind of thrive on adrenaline rush, on the fear. You kind of want to be put to the test. That's what makes you feel good, is when you have to overcome something you're not sure you can do. OK, man, I think it's fear 30. Time to start drinking. One more wrecked airplane out of the woods. Unbelievable. I love Alaska.
This is the team of Tendalian Aviation. Every day they risk everything. Alaska's treacherous terrain and wicked weather make this the world's most dangerous place to fly. These are the tales of Alaska's ultimate bush pilots. Right here. Oh, wow. right there. Oh, yeah. Look at her. Alaska is a bucket list destination for many. Holy cow. <laughs> yeah. The last frontier draws visitors from around the globe. Almost four times the state's population visits Alaska every year. And so it's a huge tourism state. One of the tours I really like to do is taking people heliboarding or heli skiing. It's crazy, the sights are amazing, you're landing on mountaintops. It's just a stunning, out of control opportunity. It's a chance of a lifetime tour. Is the guide in the loop already? I've already brought the guide into the loop. Good. Tenalian manager Carrie Irwin books these special tours. We just got hired by professional snowboarder Mike Bassich to go heliboarding. Heliboarders are dropped off on a mountaintop. They board down, are picked up, and return to the summit. Essentially, the chopper becomes a chairlift. Just getting in a helicopter is a rush itself. Um, but going out where we're going to go today, out in the middle of nowhere, is kind of like that level of just letting go to feel something very independent. It's amazing Alaska can do that for you. You think you can get us in some tricky spots if you need to? Yeah, yeah. OK, I like that. Lead pilot Josiah will fly Mike and guide Mark Barajas deep into the Alaskan bush. This is probably one of my favorite things to do. I'm very excited to get a chance to take these guys out and get them in the, in the mountains of Alaska. Mark has been an Alaskan backcountry guide since 1995. Mike and I have been working together for a long time, so we have a lot of trust in our relationship. The avalanche danger has just been considerably high. We really have to be on our game, guys. Heads up out there. You touch one sweet spot, and that whole slope is going to explode, bounce off there, and take you with it. I definitely have had some close calls with avalanches. It's a pretty unique experience when you go from riding to total fear, out of control. So I think the first thing we should do is try to head out here towards Palmer Creek. It's close. I know the clouds are coming in over there. What's that elevation over there? Probably about 5,000 foot OK, that, that'll work. If that doesn't work out, we can head out to the Connect area. The weather's better out there. It's a good backup. It is a lot farther, though. Our alternative is about 45 minutes in, so it's pretty remote, and we just got to not make any mistakes. Let's make this happen, guys. All right. All okay. right. Sweet. <laughs> yeah. Let's get loaded up. Palmer traffic, helicopter, Foxtrot Zulu Hotel, Kilo taking off from the fuel pumps, and we'll be eastbound. All right, let's go heliboarding. The guys are heading to Palmer Creek, 35 miles southeast of Anchorage. Looks like some sheep down low right down there. Oh, yeah, I see them. Yeah, I'm going to go do some fun after this. <laughs> All Being a bush pilot is in the Tenalian crew's DNA. Joel's making sure that this passion is passed on to the next generation. We're going to climb up to about 1,500 feet and okay. work on spin control. Today we're going to go flying. Micah, my son, he wants to be a bush pilot. No, I've been flying since I was about 11 or 12. OK, what do you do when you get into a spin? You let the plane fly. It's kind of been a dream of mine to have one of my kids want to be a bush pilot. And Micah is passionate about it, so I'm letting him get the feel for the airplane with me. Today's lesson, recovering from a potentially deadly spin. All right, so let's go practice. It's kind of like getting into a sardine can. And crank it. Do a right turn. Do a left turn. OK, good. Way back by the bridge now. Yeah. 
Hey, Micah, you start getting in trouble, that's what your brakes are for. All right. Teaching Micah how to handle emergencies is paramount for Joel. He's seen his fair share of trouble in the air and knows what's at stake. I was flying out west of Port Oldsworth, so I was crossing a ridge at a 45 degree angle, but slowly was fighting the wind, the downdraft I was getting into, so my airspeed was dropping. Well, then when I turned away, I probably got a hit of about 60 or 70 knots on my tail, and that's when I went into a spin. And the updraft was so dramatic that it flexed my airframe, my door flew open, the GPS flew off my panel, hit me in the face, and I thought, this is it. Take forward, get your tail up. Be ready with right rudder as the tail comes up. Joel is teaching his son, Micah, how to recover from a potentially deadly spin. It's a lesson Joel learned the hard way. All of a sudden, with a rush of wind, I'm doing like probably like 180 knots, which is unreal for a Super Cub. With the wind hitting my airplane so hard, and I was also I had just come out of a spin, the tendency is to want to pull back and slow your airspeed down really quick. But you have to ease it back. You have to ease it back. Had I recovered facing the hillside, I wouldn't be here. I recovered facing away and flew out of it, climbed really high above the mountains, and kept going. And those experiences, the more you have, the more you start to feel small. I got five kids, man, and I've seen enough death. I've seen enough crashes to know that it can happen to me tomorrow. There, you've got the plan. I've got the plan. Because of flying's inherent danger, safety is Joel's number one lesson while teaching son Micah how to fly. Yeah, let's just do a nice big circle. Yes, sir. What's my airspeed? 60. Okay, here's all we do is spin right here. Releasing the stick. We're back in it. Okay. Go more. Do not lose altitude. Pull that stick back, 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 back. If you start losing, add power to keep from stalling. And hold altitude, just hold altitude. Got it, group. Uh, a little more. Good. Atta boy. Touch down that circle by that bush. Oh, that's awesome. Pass off. Hit the brakes slowly, gently. Oh, and that was nice. That was really nice. OK, you're good to go, man. Joel wants to give Micah an appreciation for flying in Alaska. Every day, I'm saying, look how beautiful this is, and what do you do? I, I agree. <laughs> no, you don't. He goes, come on, man, you say that every day. Today, the state's beauty is touching the entire Tenalian crew. Oh my gosh, it's so beautiful. Josiah is taking snowboarder Mike Bassich and guide Mark Barajas to Palmer Creek for a heliboarding adventure. We might be able to ride all the way down this valley, Mikey. Uh, nice. The way down here. Alaska is breathtaking, but it also has a dark side. The biggest peril? Unpredictable weather. I don't know, guys, this is where I wanted to get you, but it's, uh, these clouds are starting to move lower and lower. It's built from Prince William Sound and trying to push over this way, so. When you're going up into these mountains, if you're not scared at all, then there might be something wrong with you because everything out here is against you. And you're in Mother Nature's house right now. Yeah, it's just, it's just rolling in right here. We don't want to get in here and get trapped. It looks like we'd be better off trying over by Connect Glacier. I agree, Josiah. We'll just cruise straight across the Chugach Range and go check out that area. Sound good, Mike? That sounds great, man. Safe game. The majestic glacier north of the Chugach Mountains is 45 minutes away. I'd like to get in here and make sure this happens before those clouds get in. We don't want them to roll over and take over our gang. Now let's get me on one of these peaks, which we can, before that weather whirls in. Downside to those mountains are 
It's 45 minute flight. So we are super deep in the back country. That's why it's so important to make sure that everybody has an understanding about what kind of situation they're putting themselves in today. Hey, we got enough fuel to stay out here for what we need to? Yeah, we can stop and get fuel in Palmer. Right on. Flying in Alaska is challenging because you're dealing with remote weather. You're dealing with fuel uh, management. You can't just stop anywhere for fuel. You know, you have to make sure that you can get there and come back. Severe weather and fuel shortages aren't the only threats today. Avalanches are also an unforgiving hazard. I saw this morning the uh, report for Avalanche. 2,500 was kind of our sketchy layer. Yeah, we don't want to be anything lower than 3,000 by any means. At this time of year, spring, the snow below 3,000 feet is dangerously unstable. If we go into the wrong spot, you're gonna have a lot of rotten snow. That snow could collapse the layers below it and cause big avalanches. I saw the avalanche report. Our avalanche danger has been considerable. You think it's pretty, pretty ready to go? The snow is already starting to rot underneath. We see a lot of activity today. We are gonna see it. Oh, look at the beautiful Connect Glacier in front of us, gentlemen. Josiah is taking snowboarder Mike Bassage and guide Mark Barajas to helleboard on Connect Glacier. You see these little avalanches over here that release during the storm? Yeah. It's springtime here, so the avalanche conditions are pretty, pretty big right now. The group must find a spot where Mike's boarding won't trigger an avalanche. Right now, it's just healing up. It's just waking up right now, you guys. Yeah, the sun's hitting it. Yep. We're just going to have to get a look up here and take a look, see what's loaded up, how reactive they are. Somebody gets buried in an avalanche, which is high potential right now. You only have about four and a half minutes before somebody has possibly permanent brain damage. There's a little bit of activity. They're still loaded up in here that hasn't gone, hasn't done anything. We're going to see a lot of activity today. We are going to see quite a Look bit. Look at that stress right there. Nine o'clock. Yeah, guys, I don't like that slope over there. It looks like a pretty high risk of avalanche. People die in avalanches all the time up here, every winter. Let's go on over here to this other side. The other danger they face are snow bridges, thin layers of ice that appear solid but hide deep crevasses. You see all those depressions over there, Mikey? Yeah. Those low spots could be sagging snow with little bridges on them. Those are more terrain traps that could just be iced over. I don't really like this in here. It's just too much, too long of a run and terrain yeah. traps. Yep. Too much, too much stuff in there. See this ridge right here, Mike? Yeah. Yeah, it looks, it looks really great to work with. You see this, where that's nice and yeah. flat? Yeah. It doesn't have as much um, depressions in it. I haven't seen any fracture lines at all yet. Nope. Yeah. Got a good run out. There's not much consequences from the left or right. Oh yeah, look at that. Oh, I'm liking that a lot. I'm we liking that a lot too. We're at 5,500. Perfect. I love that. All they need now is a safe landing spot in some of the trickiest terrain on Earth. Oh, the slope's looking nice. You guys tell me where you want. Basically sh straight ahead, but a little more out in the middle where we're not going to be affected because those avalanches run farther than you think. You know, as long as I have just a, a spot as big as a skid, so we can get in there. A lot can go wrong if you try to put it down on a spot where you really shouldn't. If you mess up, it could be a million dollar mistake. I think this is pretty good right, right in here. Uh, yeah. Far away enough, right? Yeah. You think you can get us in here? I think I see a spot. OK, Mike, uh, this spot, I'm not going to be able to set it down. I'm just going to tow in right here with my right skid. So a tow in is where you don't actually land the helicopter. You just kind of put part of the skids against the slope or the ridge line and get it close enough where they can get out safely, but you haven't actually landed. A tow in maneuver takes skill, experience, 
and a steady hand. We're right next to a big corner. Did you see those rocks right below you, Josiah? Stand by. When these helicopters are landing on ridges, they don't know what's underneath the snow. They don't know how much snow is there. They don't know how far they're going to sink down, you know, whether one side's going to have a rock underneath it. So we're all at risk. All right, here we go. I'm going to get set here. It's coming down. OK, I got my right skid on. It also means Mike exits the heli while it's still technically in flight. The whole back half of my skids are sticking off the ridge line, so just get out really slow. Anytime the weight changes like that significantly, it'll rock the helicopter, and I'm still just barely touching the ground here. Okay. Got quite a bit of wind coming out over the ridge here. So just hang tight till I give you a nod. All right, go ahead. Okay. Well, I'm just barely teetering here. Be clear. Coming in, is everything uh, secured? Yes. Yeah. Josiah is dropping off heli border Mike Bassage on top of Connect Glacier. Okay, I'm gonna get set here, coming down. Because the ridgeline is so steep, Josiah can't land. He must perform a toe in procedure, meaning his front skids touch the snow, but his back skids will not. Okay, I got my right skid on. I'm just barely teetering here. This dangerous maneuver means Mike will exit the helicopter while it's still in flight. Just get out slow, Mike. When you get out, just stay right there next to the helicopter, and I'll depart. Gotcha. It's the moment of truth, not just for Mike, but for the two men whose job it is to keep them safe. We're clear. All right, I'm out of here. We'll see you at the bottom. Okay, Mark, I'm going to circle around and watch him as he goes on this first run. Make sure, uh, make sure it's all good. Roger that. Okay, there he goes. Yep, he dropped. The guide and I are both kind of on point, kind of watching him really closely on the first run to see what the snow is going to do and see how he's feeling. Yeah, if we see anything rip loose, we're gonna go right in there and get him. Yeah. This looking good? Oh yeah, look at that. Oh man, he's flying down there. Oh, the snow is so good. So yeah. Oh yeah, I know. It's killing me not making runs, but me not too. this way. Me too. <laughs> That's the life of a guy, a pilot well, sometimes. I know. He's so smooth and fluid. At any speed that he's going, he makes it look really good. Okay, let's circle back down to the bottom and pick him up. Man, he went fast. This was some fun vertical. For the most of it, I got to just let it flow and uh, have some fun out here. Man, that was crazy. Let's do that again. All right. I almost kind of want my board on this one to go down with him after. <laughs> Alaska is amazing. You get the point where you want to go. The pilot, if they're skilled enough, like this one, they'll take you there. Look at those clouds coming in on us. I know bird. it. I know it. This probably be the last one. Looking at fuel and everything. Okay. I like to try to learn something new every time I fly. And so these kind of drop-offs up on the ridge line are tricky and fun. And I was really excited to get to do this today. Ah, oh, there it goes. Nice. You can have all the greatest riders in the world. You can have great guide, but without an awesome pilot, we're all at risk. How did that snow feel, Mike? Felt good? Awesome. Cool. Uh, look at all that ice moving down the Connect Glacier. Beautiful over there, guys. Man, I would actually really love to see this right now. <laughs> Jealous. Heli in Alaska is amazing. I highly recommend it for at least once in your life. Get out here, experience something you never have, because you cannot find this anywhere else. The Tenalian crew 
are not traditional bush pilots. They're modern day aviators flying a new route. We all have a picture from 20, 30, 50 years ago of the Alaska bush pilot and what it is. I, I think in many ways that's kind of disappeared. Technology, safety, really good equipment, uh, talented people out there flying. So that mental picture of the Alaska bush pilot has changed. The rewards of being a bush pilot in Alaska especially are, it's an adrenaline rush. It's adventuresome. You don't make a super good living being a bush pilot, but it's a quality of life. This is the team of Tendalian Aviation. Every day they risk everything. Alaska's treacherous terrain and wicked weather make this the world's most dangerous place to fly. These are the tales of Alaska's ultimate bush pilots. Alaska's abundant wildlife draws hunters from around the globe. Add world-class fishing into the mix, and the last frontier is paradise for outdoorsmen. This is exactly what I'm looking for. In a state twice the size of Texas, with only 5,000 miles of paved road, Alaska is the definition of remote. Though gorgeous, Receiving supplies in this part of the world isn't easy. We're we'll probably going to do four and four now, so we'll have all this and four. Yeah. So aircraft are a lifeline for both residents and visitors alike. A good solution for delivering smaller items, but the only way to transport large equipment? Since we took the engine off, it's going to be tail heavy. Helicopter swing. So this should be big enough to yeah. slide the snow machine onto it and sling it out of there. Okay. Today we're going to go out to Port Allsworth and uh, sling a snow machine across Lake Clark into the mountains. I'm going to get the line hooks out there. You got a 50-foot line there? Yeah. Okay. There's just no roads out where we're going. None. You can't drive there. So it's a very Alaskan thing to go out and pick up a snow machine and sling it. Here you go. All right, man. Let's go fly. Joel and Josiah are picking up the snow machine in Port Allsworth, an hour and a half flight southwest of Anchorage. How come we're slinging the snow machine out there? Well, for the past three years, Lake Park has not frozen over. So Leon has not been able to drive his brand new snow machine over there. Leon, like many remote Alaskans, uses his snow machine to set trap lines in wintertime. One thing we got to watch out for is the way we rig that snow machine. It's got to be rigged correctly so it doesn't spin as you're going along. So we're going to make a little platform out of plywood, drive the snow machine up onto the plywood, and then wrap the net up and around and hook to the net. I've never flown a snow machine before, so it'll be interesting to see how it flies. Usually you ride them. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I've never flown one either. Well, I have been airborne on a snow machine. Yeah, I have too, yeah. <laughs> Not below a helicopter, though. <laughs> the weather looks great. The time for snow is over. We're expecting it to be a really smooth flight and a smooth trip. But in Alaska, smooth can turn rough in the blink of an eye. He's moving in. We've got these squalls, these almost like little thunderstorms building over there. What's weird is that looks like snow. It looks like snow coming out of it the thunderstorm. It doesn't look like rain. Yeah. Reset, it looks like snow. And here we are in May. I know, it's crazy. Dealing with 
with Alaska's wild weather will be a new experience for the pilot March training today. I'm just gonna turn around here so we're closer to the fuel hose. We're taking a experienced helicopter pilot out and teaching him how to land on a glacier. I've been on glaciers before, okay. but not Have on you ever a landed? helicopter. Not, oh, no. oh, very good, okay. No, it's first time. Uh, Tenalian's been training helicopter pilots for about the last three years, but we just have started uh, doing a little more advanced maneuver training like glaciers and mountaintops and emergency procedures. So man, let's double check everything and I think we're almost ready to go. I think so. They'll practice on the majestic Kinnick Glacier, about 30 minutes northeast of Merrill Field. Proper flight training is essential in Alaska. We're going 90 right here, and look at what your ground 77. Yeah, we yeah. got a nice headwind. But here, where extreme is a way of life, even the best pilots can go down. I had a really good friend of mine who was on a search and rescue in a, in a helicopter. He had already picked up the person who needed to be rescued, and he was just transporting the poor person a short distance. But there was a lot of things against him. It was nighttime, and he got in a weather situation that just quickly became bad. Alaska experiences some of the planet's most extreme weather. I got my eye on this snow squall. In Alaska, you always keep one eye on the weather. Even an experienced pilot can fall victim to an unpredicted storm. I had a really good friend of mine who was on a search and rescue in a, in a helicopter. It was sort of half snow, half rain, and these little squall lines were moving around. I personally think he flew into one of those little rain squalls. All of a sudden, you can't see anything. And he couldn't keep control of the helicopter and ended up crashing the helicopter. So that particular crash, because it happened to such an experienced pilot, I think it flipped the switch on in all of us to say, if it can happen to that guy, we need to really be careful. To Mark, good decision making is first and foremost when teaching pilots. Look how beautiful it is out there. Isn't it gorgeous? This is great. And critically important right now, as he's helping a student learn to land on frozen terrain. What are the things I need to watch out for up here? The Alaska weather is a huge, huge deal. There's airplanes that have crashed just up around here, and they never found them for weeks and weeks and weeks. Ah, OK. Uh, here, things can happen in an instant. We could very quickly be in a survival situation. When I'm up here in the mountains, I really pay attention to where the wind is at. I can feel a little bit of wind difference now. Oh, now look at your wind. Feel that down? Yeah, got the down. So don't feel too much difference. Just yeah, come back just come on the back side a little, little bit. bit. Glacier makes its own wind. So you tend to get this down flow of cold air coming down the glacier. It can be really challenging. Boy, these cracks are for foreboding, aren't they? Oh, man, they're huge. Oh, look, look it's flowing. Yeah, see, see all flowing. that water down yeah. there? The thing you're really careful of is you want to make sure you have a solid base under you. I'm yeah, going. we don't want to go in the water. Yeah. Let's say that it had just snowed a foot, and right. you keep wandering around here, and you go, man, this is a perfect spot. Look at this, look at this. And then you come up on it, and you land and fall all the way right. through. These glaciers are very treacherous. It, the, it snows up here. All of the valleys, the low spots, all the holes can get covered up with snow. Usually every winter in Alaska, somebody is snow machining across a glacier and runs into one of those holes, and it's usually a tragic end. Let's head a little to the left. See 
kind of spot over here. That second gully, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, up there. Up there not right yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. And just take your time. Take your time. The wind is just crazy gusty. It's right on our nose, but it's swirling right. around all that crap. Just stay on that. Now, let the skids just kiss. Let them just kiss. Don't, whoa, baby, you gotta push sideways. Push side, there you go, yeah. You're not on pavement anymore. Right. Okay, now right about here, let's wiggle around a little bit and see if we, do we like where we're at? So just wiggle me around a bit. Yeah, that feels good. Yeah, it feels pretty good. Whoa, oh. yep, that's good. That's excellent. Never thought you'd be landing on 2,000 feet of ice. No, no, <laughs> not, not till now. <laughs> Man, this is fun. Excellent job. Excellent, excellent. Stan's incredible. Man, he caught on really fast. He's a great pilot and did a great job. Two hundred miles to the southwest, Joel and Josiah also face challenges today. That's about as tight as it'll get right there. They're tackling a tough job, slinging a quarter-ton snow machine. When you're lifting up, I'm going to be watching for webbing to catch on plastic cowling mm -hmm. or stuff that can get damaged. So yeah. if I start waving frantically, <laughs> I mean, set it back down. Show me how, how you would wave. Okay. <laughs> when we get ready to do this, I'm going to pick up and hover over here and have you connect the hook to the belly. So you want me to get underneath the helicopter while it's hovering? OK. I'm not scared. OK. I'm not scared. I'm not scared. OK. <laughs> With a 2,500-pound helicopter hovering above him, the slightest mistake could mean disaster. If the engine quit and he came straight down, if the skids land on me, it's game over. Now it's all systems go. Okay, you're good to go. Okay, pick it up. Until Joel spots a problem. Okay, come on back down, come on back down. The shackles twisted, the shackles in position the wrong way. Only a third of Alaska's roads are paved. So moving large machinery with aircraft is common in this vast state. Clear. Canadian Aviation often does these jobs, and today is no exception. Joel and Josiah have been hired to sling a snow machine to a client's remote home. Okay, you're good to go. Okay, picking up. But seconds into the flight, Joel spots trouble. There's a shackle and it ended up upside down. That's something that can split and possibly break that ring. Joel makes another risky run under the helicopter to fix the shackle and reattach the line. It was a little daunting to have 2,500 pounds hovering above my head and then go hook the line on. the Super Cub and lead Josiah to Lorraine Strip, half an hour northwest of Port Allsworth. Josiah, you got me? I don't see you, but I hear you. OK, I'm going to do a left 360, OK, so you can see me, and then I'm going to take you through Red Pass, set my 12 o'clock. OK. If Josiah can't find Joel, there's a lot more than a snow machine at risk. Josiah flew out light on fuel because he's carrying a heavy load. So he really couldn't afford to get off track very much. How are you doing on fuel? 
I don't have enough fuel to wait for him. He can't afford to fly around and just burn fuel. He's got to get to where he's going. I don't see you. I got my lights off. I don't see you yet either. OK, now we're uh, at your 5 o'clock, same altitude coming up on you. Did you see me, Josiah? Yeah, I got you. All right, just follow me. They're back on track until Mother Nature throws them another curveball. I hate to think we're looking at snow, but look at that. Yep. Alaska skies are famous for dirty tricks. It looks to me like that snow squall, like it's a line, a line of snow, five to ten west of the rain strip. Okay, that's going to be moving probably into position by the time we get out there, Josiah. I don't have the snow baffles on. Snow baffles keep heavy, wet snow from clogging the engine's air inlet. You don't purposefully take off and fly in snow without those baffles on. Without them, the engine could flame out and the helicopter would crash. That's precept coming down. We can't mess around with thunderstorms and turbulence like that. It's really good visibility. Pretty unfriendly. Definitely snow coming down from a huge cumulative build up here. We got a tailwind right now. Turbulence from the squall has the Jet Ranger and its 700-pound load in its grip. Pretty strong wind right here. No, I don't like this. It looks like the load is really clinging there. That was just a turbulence pushing me around. I've known of guys that have had loads come swinging right up next to their rotor blades. And that's bad. like it's spinning all around. If necessary, Josiah will punch the load and the snow machine will crash to the ground. Of course, you're always ready to punch off a load if something goes wrong. Your finger's uh, ready near that trigger. Did you, did you slow down to like 10 knots or something? I'm not going to talk to you that much, Joel. I'm just working it. Just thought you doing all right? I'm not going to talk to you for a minute. If you got a punch, to get back out over the water. Okay, Joel. Josiah is fighting to control his sling load in the middle of a vicious snow squall. Josiah, you doing all right? I'm not going to talk to you for a minute. When Josiah told me he's, he can't talk for a while, I knew that he had his hands full. I've never heard him say that before. I can't talk right now. It just makes you wonder what's going on, man. If you got a punch, you get back out over the water. OK. Josiah was dealing with snow and turbulence and a load that was oscillating. And it was a very tense moment. I don't have to punch it. I was just working that turbulence and that uh, squall, and I don't have the snow baffles on. I just couldn't talk to you back then. OK, I understand. Just figuring out how to get back over the load and stop the swing was intuitive, but it definitely caught me by surprise. I was also watching the deck angle of the helicopter. It was like nose down and nose up, and so the load was kind of looked like it was pulling on the helicopter. Oh, yeah. Just like back in the old days when I used to ride bulls. <laughs> Bowls, now you're slinging bowls. It's really hard. <laughs> yeah. That's looking pretty stable now. Did you see me, Josiah? Yeah, I got gotcha. you. We'll take a right and go through this valley, and it'll take us right around a sharp corner into the rain strip, OK? OK, see you there. So does he want him closer to his cabin or closer to the runway? Leon wants us to set this machine down between the little airstrip there and the cabin. OK. Did you land to the west? Yes. OK, thanks. I'm shut down. Just when they think they're home free, another crisis hits. Because I was so much faster than uh, the Jet Ranger, I got to the valley way ahead of Josiah, and he actually lost track of me. And given the Jet Ranger's light fuel load, there's no time to spare. Joel, you on here? You on here, Joel? Josiah, you're flying past the mouth of the valley. You're going to the wrong valley. Oh, where am I going? Oh, I got you. 
The feeling you have when you complete a job like that, especially with some difficulties in the middle and you set the load down safely and nothing's bent or wrecked, it's a, it's a great feeling. Hey, you guys. Thank you. It's not even Christmas. Yeah, just add snow. Just add some snow, yeah, that's right. All right, looks like it came out just great. Can't wait. Perfect. You can drive it off. <laughs> there it goes. All right, we'll see you guys. My clients are really happy, and uh, they'll be playing all winter on that snow machine next year. I love doing these things with Joel. He's, he's a great boss, and we have fun together. We just end up doing all kinds of crazy things in crazy places. Good job. Yeah, that went well. You add all these little kind of experiences up, it just makes life worth living. With such a perilous job, the pilots at Tenalien have come to rely on each other like family. Obviously, there's ups and downs like any family, but we want it to be fun. We want it to be happy. We want people to have a good time. We want people to just drop by. If they're driving down the road, they go, man, I got 10 minutes. I want to stop by Tenalien, have a cup of coffee, and see what's going on. This is the team of Tenalian Aviation. Every day they risk everything. Alaska's treacherous terrain and wicked weather make this the world's most dangerous place to fly. These are the tales of Alaska's ultimate bush pilots. With 70 million acres of public land, Alaska attracts sportsmen from around the planet. It looked like a pretty good bear. I hope we get a better chance at it here. The state issues almost 600,000 hunting and fishing licenses annually. One shot, one kill. Hunters and anglers' main mode of transportation to access the bush, planes. You want me to go or you go ahead? All right. So during hunting season, hundreds of flights traverse the last frontier. This amount of air traffic adds to the state's high number of crashes. But technological advances over the past decade have reduced aircraft accidents in Alaska. Did you get the coordinates? Yeah, we got them in there. What would we do without GPS nowadays? However, when they do occur, Tenalian's there to clean up the wreckage. I'm gonna get this line in first. Today we're gonna fly out and do a underwater salvage. We're gonna go under the water and tie onto a piece of wrecked airplane, and we're gonna try to sling it off the bottom of a lake using the Jet Ranger. It's, it's gonna be a challenge. Oh, this is a heavy one. Yeah! Clear! This was a fishing lodge airplane. He took off in really windy, gusty conditions and got airborne maybe too soon. A gust of wind got him, he couldn't overcome, and he cartwheeled literally like a gymnast, wingtip over wingtip, engine tail, and this wing snapped off and went flying away from the rest of the wreckage because they got the rest of the wreckage out of the water, but they never got that wing. Going out and getting this wing. I've been wanting to do this for so long. Oh, I'm excited. Tenalian lead pilot Josiah and diver Tammy Lou Shaw are helping Joel with the wing recovery. Always down for a dive. I know, right? Freshwater dive, too. <laughs> the duo's heading to Six Mile Lake in Nondalton, almost 200 miles southwest of Anchorage. Joel is on a fishing trip around Port Allsway, so the team will rendezvous at the crash site. Okay, uh, I'm airborne. Okay, I'm right behind you. It's kind of like an urban legend. Pilots talked about it for years. 
Hey, we should get that wing, man. I bet it's really worth a lot. A salvaged beaver wing in good condition could be worth up to $25,000. But no one was sure where the beaver wing landed until now. Some of the local natives in that village actually took a boat out and they believe they found the wing. So we have some pretty good general idea of coordinates of where to start looking. What do you think of that squall over there heading our way? I think it's affecting the wind. I mean, the winds on the water here are showing a few different directions. Maneuvering in Alaska's unpredictable weather can be extremely dangerous. A lesson Chief Pilot Mark Barker learned the hard way. When I first started flying, I was up at about 6,000 feet, and the two passengers I had were big guys, and I'm not Mr. Miniature myself. And of course, when you have big uh, working guys, they have big giant toolboxes. And it was one of those typical things, the weather starts moving in. I tell the guys, come on, hurry up, we gotta get going. We go, oh, almost done, almost done. Finally, they get done, we load the helicopter up. So we're at high altitude, three big guys on board in a toolbox. And so I'm, I'm power limited up there. Picked up to a hover and I started moving forward and I didn't have enough power. Rotor speed starts going down. Light comes on, horn comes on, man. Hey, did you check the weather cameras before we head out? Alaska's extreme weather is a formidable hazard for bush pilots. Hey, check the weather it is deteriorating, it's getting windier. Pilot Mark Barker battled the elements during a harrowing flight he'll never forget. It was winter time, I'm on the top of a mountain. So we're at high altitude, three big guys on board in a toolbox, and I didn't have enough power. And so I just picked the best place to kind of plant it on the ground, and I slid along a little bit at an angle, and it's like a 4,000 foot drop off on the side. Almost to a stop, buried under the snow was a big old rock, big old rock and I slammed into that rock, kind of cocked me sideways, and I'm sitting right there on the mountain, kind of going, oh baby, oh baby, oh baby. Now it's starting to get dark. We're kind of getting to a survival situation. I gotta keep moving fast. I shut it down, look the whole machine over. The machine looks to be okay. And then I told one of the guys, okay, I'm gonna take one guy at a time down. At that time, I'm lighter hop off the mountain, go down and land, go back up to the top of the mountain, picked up the other guy, left the tools up on the mountain, and I came home. I said, I am never doing that again. Joel and Josiah are prepared for their own questionable weather en route to Six Mile Lake today. What do you think of that squall over there heading our way? But a different culprit is causing trouble. Oh, an eagle on my nose. Look at the eagle, man. I just missed him. I saw that. Oh my gosh. Those things are afraid of nothing. I was moving like crazy and he was as steady as a rock. Wow. I'm glad I didn't hit him. The team searching for underwater wreckage from a decades old crash. Okay, I'll let you land. Because there's no runway, Joel and Josiah must land on the rocky shoreline. I'll sit down there and uh, be looking for you. Roger. Touching down on a gravel beach is easy for a helicopter. The uneven surface is challenging for a wheeled aircraft. Oh nice job. That looked good. OK, I'm coming into my spot here. I see you turning around there. The dive crew and their gear are safely on the ground. Now to find that needle in the haystack. First thing we'll do is we have a boat hired. We'll go out on the lake and try to find the wing. We have coordinates for it, so um, hopefully that'll be the easy part. Josiah and Joel are hoping a side scan sonar will give them a visual of the wing. What's MacGyver got that we ain't got? The side scan sonar is like a 
super high deluxe fish finder, but it can actually see the bottom of the lake. It can see outlines of things. This is the eyeball. It's a thing of beauty. And so we use that at the coordinates and see if we can't see this wing. See We're in 21 feet of water, okay. and I can't see a thing. Oh, yes, I can. Hold on, man. I'm holding on. I got to find my glasses. <laughs> There's fish. There, there it is. is. That looks like it right there. Yep, that's it. All right, let's head on in, Chuck. We got it. So how do you want to do this? Do you want to try and take the boat or go from shore? I think it'd be easier to go from shore. OK. All right, let's get suited up. OK, can you make sure that's tight around my neck and no hair? The lake temperature is probably 36 or 37 degrees, somewhere in there. So we're going to have dry suits and hoods and gloves and all the cold water Alaska diving gear that you need. Just go for it and be careful, all right? OK. okay. We'll be waiting here. Sounds good. In addition to freezing water, the wreck site is teeming with other dangers. On a dive like this, a wreck dive, there may be a fair amount of current where the wing is. We just don't know yet. Visibility is another issue. Could be zero visibility down there. There's a debris field down there from the wrecked airplane. I don't want them to rip a wetsuit or get Snag. They've been down there a long time. I wish I was down there with them. I could see what's going on. I feel kind of out of control. Of course, the wing was nowhere in sight once we got to the bottom. So we just started swimming a grid around that area. One of the concerns is that silt, seaweed, just stuff could have covered the wing over, and they could swim right across the top of it and won't even see it. I couldn't believe we found it. So, yeah, we uh, we high fived and it was awesome. Yeah, awesome. But it quickly becomes clear Tammy must come out of the water before the wing does. I got a leak, <laughs> like in my suit. Water pouring down my back. I didn't know it at the time, but Tammy was dealing with uh, a leaky suit. I gotta get out of the water. Let's go. Cool. So wet. Let's go. Cool. Let's go to shore. She was swimming down there basically with 37 degree water filling her suit. I got a leaking suit. Tammy's so cold wet. and wet, yeah. Soaking wet on the inside. It poured as soon as we descended, poured down my back. Really? Yeah. I felt some water when we first went in. I mean, look at that. Wow. Not yeah. good. She had classic symptoms when we got her out of that dry suit and by a fire. She had the shaking chills and the classic signs of hypothermia. I mean, her lips were blue. She was shaking. I am soaking wet. Ooh. Let's get you warm. Thank you. Aircraft salvage jobs are riddled with unforeseen dangers. If that hook lets go, bail, get out of the way. Many times with threats that are completely unassociated with flying. All right, so getting warmed up. Soaking, I am soaking wet. During a salvage dive for a wrecked beaver wing, Tammy's dry suit springs a leak, exposing her to the frigid Alaskan water. She was swimming down there basically with 37 degree water filling her suit, and she got hypothermic. So I went and built a fire and got her next to it. Do you think you have a defect in your suit, or was something not put on right? I don't know. It poured down my neck as soon as we descended, which is not normal. I had different layering set up where you have to have a really tight seal on your neck and on your wrists. And what I think happened is I just didn't have a tight enough seal on my undergarments. With Tammy literally chilled to the bone, 
bringing up the wing will have to wait. Let's figure out how to get you into some dry clothes. Let's start gathering up our gear so we can come back and hit it in the morning. It's when you get really tired, really fatigued, that you can make bad mistakes. Let's get out of here and go home. All right? I have spoken. It is written. Now it is law. Now it is law. After yesterday's suit disaster, the team is taking no chances today. You're in and in. Attachable weights. The first order of business the second day was to make sure Tammy's suit wasn't going to leak. Final OK? Final OK. Woohoo! All right, let's go diving. All right, good luck, you guys. wondering if there's going to be some kind of like, if it's not, not going to be like suction, like stuck, almost glued to the bottom because of settling into the silt. The wing had sunk down into the mud pretty far, and the wing was upside down. So I had to scoop out a whole bunch of mud at the wing root to find some place to, uh, to hook a line. Somehow got a good place and got a line on there and then was able to get it all rigged with one tank of air. I had serious doubts um, I was going to be able to pull it off the bottom. What do you think, Josiah? It's not very good because it's going to try to lift the wing flat. It'll no pivot. leverage, you know, but... It'll pivot. Yeah. It'll pivot as it comes up. It's not going to come up flat. Yeah. Like a halibut. <laughs> right. <laughs> I think we should try it. All right. We're going to head to shore. I'll get out of this suit and put my helicopter hat on. <laughs> right on. All right. I'll be out here waiting for you. We'll hook on. Clear. Dip your uh, hook. OK, I'm picking up. Okay, we got a south wind, so the, the wind's going to try to blow the hook from the south to me. Weather is something you deal with in Alaska, so sure enough, true to form, we had winds, squalls going through, so weather is always something that you're dealing with, and uh, this time was no different. Okay, I'm coming up to you, Joel. I'll try to get it in your hand. Catching the hook while standing in a small fishing boat is easier said than done. The wind is blowing the ship around up aloft, and it's blowing the long line. And Josiah's coming in, and he's and the hook is swaying. It was tense. It was a little challenging. Yeah, there it is. Grabbed it and hooked it on the line that was attached to the wing. I'm hooked. I'm gonna start picking up on it. Okay, I'll give you a chance to get out of the way. All right, we're moving, we're moving. Slinging over water can be super dangerous. Um, I, I hooked to something that was on the bottom of the lake and I had no idea if I'd be able to budge it. Okay, I'm just gonna start putting a tug on it and see what I get here. And then he starts to lift and that's the moment of truth. That's, that's when we find out, are we successful or not? Yeah, you're going up a little bit. Yeah, just hold your position. Okay, I'm just going to start putting the tug on it and see what I get here. Josiah and Joel are trying to dislodge a wrecked beaver wing from the bottom of Six Mile Lake. You just, you don't know how it's going to go. All right, I see a bunch of mud. I think it's moving. I just started tugging on it and, uh, felt it give a little bit, and then all of a sudden I looked down and I could see mud below the surface, and I knew it was moving. Moving. Right on, man, I see mud on the water. Yeah, you're going up a little bit. Yeah, there it is, it's up the surface. Woohoo! Yeah! And then you see it come out of the water, it was just awesome, it was woohoo! Right on, Josiah, you're doing it. OK, 
Okay, I'm just gonna sit here for a minute. I'll put a tug on it and see if I can get it to drain. Yeah, just hold your position for a couple of minutes. Just let it drain. A dry wing weighs about 400 pounds, but loaded down with water and silt, it's almost 800 pounds. I can see water just pouring out of it. Yeah, water's pouring out of it like crazy. I just saw three fish fall out of the wing into the water. Ah, oh, there's more! There's fish pouring out of the wing! Ah, oh, another fish just fell out! Those are actually freshwater lingcod. We call them bourbon. We call them poor man's halibut. But before they can enjoy a fresh caught dinner, Josiah must get the wing to dry land. You guys, he's going to the grass. He's going to the grass. OK, everyone's getting out of the way. Go ahead and take it to the grass over here by the campfire. And set it down. You're looking good. You're down. That's good. He's holding a link cod in his hand over here, Josiah. This is how we fish. Go ahead and sit down. That is some of the coolest stuff we've done yet. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> Besides the fish, the wing is a total bust. This is probably $100. This here? Yeah. In better condition? The wing could have been worth up to $25,000. But for the Tenalian team, it's never just about the money. Oh, it was totally worth it. It was such a fun mission. And the fact that we found it and got it out of there is just so rewarding. It's awesome. All what right. a day, man. Yeah, what a good day. That was good. It just felt like a real sense of accomplishment. And it's always fun when you share that with friends. The poor fish is still flopping around in there. I don't consider this work. Work is when I'm at the desk with papers. <laughs> this was fun. It was a fun adventure. This is what we do. We're good at what we do. We love what we do. It's fun to have a job that you love doing. This is the team of Tedalian Aviation. Every day, they risk everything. Alaska's treacherous terrain and wicked weather make this the world's most dangerous place to fly. These are the tales of Alaska's ultimate bush pilots. Alaska's wild beauty is breathtaking in every season. But during summer, people flock to the state, many wanting to experience the last frontier from the air. Thank you for calling Tenalian Aviation. This is Carrie. How may I help you? Tenalian's manager, Carrie Irwin, sees a 75% jump in business June through August. Summer months are very busy for Tenalian because we have our tourist season. Everybody wants to go out on trips. Land of the midnight sun. We play almost all day long. How many people are looking at going? All right, I'm going to touch base with my pilot, and we look forward to seeing you in a few hours. We just had a phone call come in, have clients that want to go out paragliding. All my pilots are currently out fishing at the moment, so need to figure out a way to make both things happen. Taking a much-deserved break, Joe, Mark, and Josiah are fishing at Eklutna Lake about 40 miles northeast of Anchorage. Alaska has, I think, the most exciting and widest variety of fishing up anywhere in the world. Alaska's an angler's dream come true. The state's rivers are home to five different species of salmon. Freshwater lakes are filled with six-foot pike, and 100-pound halibut are often snagged in the ocean waters. 300 non-resident fishing licenses are issued annually bringing almost $13 million into the state's economy. OK, 100 bucks for the first fish? 100 bucks for the first fish. OK. I did get a bite. Does a leaf count as winning the contest? 
<laughs> My phone just vibrated. Should I check it? No! All right, I got a text from Carrie here. All right. She says a couple guys want to go paragliding. We're fishing! She says, should we fish or make money? One of those. I, I think fish. <laughs> nah, I make money. <laughs> yeah, we do. Paragliders jump from cliffs wearing steerable parachutes. They fly below the clouds propelled by wind power. The sport, invented in the 1960s, resembles hang gliding. Hey guys. Hi, Josiah. Ready to go paragliding? Yeah, definitely. Typically, paragliders hike to their launch spot. But today, Joe and Monty are seeking a more extreme adventure. I think with the uh, helicopter, it's going to give us a really unique opportunity to scout out some, some pretty fun new sites. One of the things um, we'll be a little bit concerned about is if we get some big cumulus clouds. We can see them from here kind of starting to build over that way. Cumulus clouds, as they get bigger and bigger, there comes a point where there's too much um, activity. Wind shear, turbulence, they can hold hail, all kinds of terrible things. OK, everybody ready? Yep. Ready. The guys are heading to Moose Creek Valley in the Talkeetna Mountain Range, about 40 miles northeast of Anchorage. We'll be in the big mountains, and there's nothing around there. So we just want to make no mistakes out there, and we got to be on our A game. Aviators avoid danger when they fly, but Chief Pilot Mark Barker has spent most of his life embracing emergencies. My first career and probably my first love was a firefighter. So there's a group of four of us that manage and run the Alaska Fallen Firefighter Memorial. Because of Alaska's size and remoteness, fires are commonly fought from the air. 99% of all of the wildland fires are fought with aircraft in it. About half of the firefighter deaths on the memorial are pilots that were engaged in firefighting. One that sticks out in my mind, the DC-3, a large DC-3 firefighting aircraft was taking off from McGrath. Many of the residents of McGrath saw the airplane take off. They saw it start to climb into the air, and for whatever reason, it then nosedived down and crashed. Because of Alaska's immense size and rugged terrain, wildfires are often fought from the skies. So many of the state's firefighters are pilots that battle the infernos from above. There's no roads in Alaska. There's just no way to get to these locations. So there is actually a very close tie between Alaskan aviation and firefighting. Mixing two of the most dangerous jobs in the world can be a recipe for disaster. Large DC-3 firefighting aircraft was taking off, and on takeoff, either an engine failed or they were overloaded, and for whatever reason, it then nosedived down and crashed. There was 27 people on board the aircraft. Four people died in the incident. It was a number of years ago, and safety and investigations and finding out what went wrong was just not at the level that it is now. So we will never know to this day what could have happened. And maybe that's the big tragedy of it all, because we aren't able to then make changes so that it never happens again. Safety is first and foremost in Josiah's mind as he transports paragliders into the Alaskan backcountry. OK, guys, it looks like a good spot in here. Right. See what the wind's doing up in here. They're searching the Talkeetna Range for a takeoff and landing zone with low wind. Anything over 15 miles an hour, the risk factor does go up. Because your wing is soft, it's not a rigid wing, it can cause the wing to partially collapse. How's the wind speed looking? 25 knots right there, guys. Really? Yep. Yeah, 25 knots. Yep, I just got a huge guess. Oh my gosh, let's go down. Yeah, yeah. we're not flying at 25. It's too windy. Wind speeds are typically slower closer to the ground. So Josiah drops down to 5,000 feet. 
Are you more concerned with downdrafts than updrafts? Both, but yeah. mostly updrafts. Okay. You just don't want to get sucked up into a big cloud. Yeah. Big cumulus clouds that form over the mountains is basically a sign of a lot of lift. And they can actually suck you up into the cloud, which is really dangerous. We're seeing some cumulus clouds that are starting to build over the Talkeetnas. Yeah, they're looking big already. Uh -huh. We'll just have to keep an eye out for overdevelopment. Paragliding really is an inherently dangerous sport, and we try to do whatever we can to minimize the risk, but people do die paragliding. While some visit Alaska for extreme adventure, others come to strike it rich. In Alaska, people can claim ground to look for gold by staking it for free. There's people making serious money up here. Today, Mark and Joel are staking a claim for a small mining company. They'll fly to the coordinates and from the air, drop numbered rebar stakes to mark the claim. It's sort of like a big kid's version of playing darts. How come the boss gets the noise canceling headset? That's what I want. Because know. he's so cool. Oh, OK. <laughs> Mark and Joel are headed 270 miles northwest of Anchorage to the Iditarod Gold Fields, an area rich in mining history. Both Iditarod and Flat were mining areas back in the 30s and 40s, and quite a bit of gold was taken out of there. With technology now, a lot of the geologists have found new places that they can get gold out of. It is right on our left there. OK. Mark and Joel land close to the coordinates and prep the stakes. I'll put the ribbons on. You can just do the stake, claim stakes. Putting together the rods is a simple process. The tricky part, dropping them out of a moving helicopter from 300 feet up. This is the part right here that I'm glad I'm flying, and I'm glad you're back there, because I would be dying. When we're doing the claim staking, Joel's having to hang out the back of the helicopter. I wish I could do it, but I can't do it. I have a hideous fear of heights. My joke is I get scared standing on a thick rug. I didn't sleep at all last night. <laughs> I would have made you sit back here and do it, except that I know you would have quit. I can't I would have. I would have quit. <laughs> he has a phobia. Here we go, getting ready to pick up. Hey, there's a moose. Oh, very good. So if I drop this on that moose down there, Mark, would that be a moose steak? That would be a moose steak. That would be a very good moose steak. <laughs> all right, I'm swinging out. Okay. I'm watching my GPS and listening to you. Okay. Wow, this is freaky, man. You got number nine? I got number nine. OK, we're coming in on number nine. OK, there's 300 feet out. 300. There's 200. 200, gotcha, getting in position. Pulling up to a stop. Three, two, one, drop. Ah, oh, I hit the skid. Mark and Joel are staking a claim at the Iditarod Gold Fields. Ah, oh, I hit the skid, man. Darn it. Ah, oh, we way missed it. Ah, oh, shoot. Let's go back around. OK, coming around. Three, two, one, drop. Bombs away. Yeah, man, it's stuck. OK, coming up on eight. And three, two, one, now. Got it. Just as they get into a rhythm of hitting the target, Mother Nature makes them a target. OK, shoot, the wind's pushing me around. Just a minute. Oh, man, alive. Oh, this is killing me. Shoot. Wow, man. Turbulence can throw you. So I'm always aware of the potential to slip out. It's weird. The wind is just whipping around all different directions down there. It's probably from that big cumulus right there. Cumulonimbus is like a vacuum cleaner. On this side of it, it's pulling the wind this way. On that side of it, it's pulling the wind this way. So there's these localized winds that can really be swirling. Man, alive, I got a gust killing me here. Shoot. That doesn't feel good. That made me feel like I was going to fall out. It's weird. I got a 90 degree crosswind there. Let me try to come at it from an angle. 
Then I'll be dead into the wind. Okay, let me know when you're ready. Okay, I'm coming up on seven, swinging into position. Stay on your line, stay on your line. Okay, straight ahead, straight ahead, straight ahead. And I got the line. And three, two, one, and here we go. Yeah, got it, beautiful, man. Oh, oh we man. got it. That's the best one yet. Woo! Hanging out of the helicopter made me feel alive. You're living in the moment. You're not thinking about yesterday or tomorrow. You're thinking about right now. <laughs> right now. I'm the king of the world! <laughs> this is something that people don't get to do really anywhere else. Boy, Good job of flying, Mark. That was great. Man, that was cool. 300 miles northeast, Josiah and his paragliders are dealing with the same unpredictable wind. I'm feeling some thermal activity already yeah. here. In the... They're searching the Talkeetna range for a good launching point. We'll just circle here, gaining altitude, and see what it's like once we get up in here. Challenges for me are going to be to get them in a good spot up in the mountains. The drop off is going to be the tricky part. What are you looking at? What about this snow field over here? Top of that. Be a great launch spot. We could fly all the way down into the green down there. Okay. So if we pick a spot with snow and it's in the shadows, we'll have to really, really watch out for the flat light up there. Flat light occurs in snow covered areas when skies are overcast. The condition might affect Josiah's death perception and he could crash. A lot of variables on the landing zone on this one, so we just want to make no mistakes out there. Looking at this this saddle, this flat spot just above the, yeah, just up from that little cornice, that okay. little roll over there. Yeah, okay. If you feel good about that, I think that'd be a really stunning place to fly. Holy moly, look at that. I think I'm gonna circle around uh, and get right up on top of this ridge line before I try making an approach in there. Yeah, that's in the shadow, so that cloud is right over the top. Uh-huh. You can see it, they're just lined up. Yep. The good news? Cumulus clouds form and dissipate quickly. And as the group gets closer to the potential launch site, blue skies break through. I see some, some shadows, so I'm going to see if I can get in here on this saddle. As we get closer, it's looking a little bit better, Monty. Yeah, these clouds look actually pretty good, I think. Good sign of thermal activity, but nothing too wild yet. Not too tight for you? I think it's good. Plenty of room. You're on the snow, so nothing gets snagged. Wow. Right on. We made it. All right. If you guys want to hop out and start doing your thing. Sounds good and then I'll meet you at the bottom. Okay, that sounds great. The drop-off is complete. Josiah must now race down to the landing zone where he'll communicate via radio with Joe and Monty. Holy moly, Monty, dude. This is amazing. Paragliding, there's always an, there is an element of, of danger. Um, I guess I've never done any activity where you feel as exposed as you do. Um, when you're up there in the air by yourself underneath this wing and getting tossed around by some turbulence, you, you feel like you are very vulnerable. We've got this big cumulus cloud above us, which is going to be lifty, so we have to really be careful. You just don't want to get sucked up into the cloud. Don't forget to check your reserve. I still do get the butterflies when I'm at a launch site, especially if it's a new launch site and the conditions aren't perfect. How you looking, Joe? I think good. I'm feeling a little something here, Monty. Yeah, me too. OK, we're feeling it here. Here we go. Got it, Joe. You're looking good. Whoop, whoop. Woo! Go. Got it, Joe. You're looking good. Paragliders Joe and Monty are about to launch off a 5,000 foot peak in the Talkeetna mountain range. Feeling good. Woo -hoo. Woo -hoo. 
but large clouds and high winds may make the flight turbulent and dangerous. Little Thermic. Right after launch, I could tell it was going to be a little bit raucous. And so I wound up taking a little bit of a collapse. Wing collapse occurs when turbulence causes the parachute to invert. But it uh, went right back out very quickly. Ow! It's good, Monty! Did you see that 25% collapse I took? Oh, you got, a, got some, got some uh, turbulence, huh? Some shear? Yeah, I bought a valley wind. Jeez. When you're seeing a paraglider in the air, oftentimes you're just seeing, well, it looks like they're just floating around, but they're actually active piloting the whole time. And when you have raucous wind like we had today, you're really on edge quite a bit. Yeah, it was rocking and rolling out of the chute there. Yeah, that looked like you sunk pretty good. Pretty smooth here in the valley. Cool, looks like you're soaring. Looks like Joe's catching some nice lift off the east ridge there. We might be able to make it up a little higher and have a little bit longer flight. Nice. Woohoo! Oh, you're catching some beautiful thermals, man. Woohoo! Yeah, there's a climb. Just say, how is it looking on the ground in terms of wind speed right now? I feel like I got about eight, eight to twelve knots and a couple little puffs that are maybe up to 15 right here. Okay, we'll try and land, but we may have difficulty penetrating. Copy that. I think I'm gonna make my way into the middle of the valley and go for a landing here soon. Okay, I got my eyes on you. I'll be watching. Seeing them work their way into this little landing spot is cool because I know what it takes to get a helicopter in a spot like this, but I've got power. I can uh, abort the landing. I can pick a different spot. They're totally powerless gliding in, just working the wind in their in their wings. So it's a, it's a trick to get in a spot like this. Coming in hot. Just let me know when you're down. I kind of lost sight of you behind the trees there. Okay, we're both down. I just landed right behind Monty's. Hey, sounds good. I'll head your way. All right. Yeah, How man. was it? It's awesome. Right on. Thanks. It was really good. Right on. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, cool. Awesome. You know, we really enjoy the outdoors up here in Alaska. We feel very blessed that we get to live up here in such a majestic place. And then to have a day when we have access to a helicopter to, to play up here is, is, is amazing. I doubt anybody's jumped from there before. I don't think anybody's <laughs> jumped from there before. Definitely nice. not. It's cool. a great day. Yeah, right yeah, on. Yeah, super let's, awesome. Let's get out of here. Thank you, Josiah. This job is so cool because there's such a huge variety in the kind of flights we do. Everything from salvage work to tourists, photo flights, heliboarding. It's just amazing out here. This is the team of Tendalian Aviation. Every day they risk everything. Alaska's treacherous terrain and wicked weather make this the world's most dangerous place to fly. These are the tales of Alaska's ultimate bush pilots. As fall approaches, hunters from the far corners of the globe are drawn to Alaska. Well, we better be a little bit careful because there has been a bear here. The big game season opens with doll sheep and caribou. He's right there in the middle, Bob. So it's wait till he gets in the open. Out of the million that call the state home, around 22,000 are harvested annually. That was one of the best hunts ever. That was really fun. Tenalian owner Joel Natwick and his daughter Dana have already bagged their caribou for the season. 
what I don't like is it's bigger than anyone I've ever shot. <laughs> Holy cow, look at that. It's a huge caribou rack. Isn't it? It's the biggest I've ever gotten. I've never gotten one this big. How far was the shot? It was about 110 yards. One shot, one kill. It was good. It was good. Congratulations. It was fun. Yeah, we got enough meat for the winter. Right on. Well, I got the day off. I'm going to go raft that river out on the Kinnick Glacier. Oh, are you? The whole surface of the glacier is melting, and all this water has to go somewhere. So it's running downhill, forming these rivers, and they start melting out these huge holes called moulons. So we definitely have to get out before we get to the moulon. It's a one-way ticket if you go down that hole. Oh, Just going to go play, huh? <laughs> Got some buddies together, and we're going to go get it. Hey, can I go? Um, let me think about it. No. Uh, OK. <laughs> no. <laughs> Joel's apprehension is well-founded. This extreme sport is hazardous, and medical help isn't accessible on a remote glacier. All right, so we're out here bright and early. What's All the right, next guys, step? I know. But these adrenaline-filled adventures are what people like Jeff and Katie are looking for in the last frontier. I came to Alaska for the mountains for the wilderness, and it has not let me down yet. We got everything loaded up. All we got to do is go find that river. I've never gone rafting before, so I, I don't know what I'm getting into right now. But I'm excited. This is going to be awesome, guys. guys. It's yeah. awesome. It's going to be sweet. All right, everybody ready? Yep. Let's go. All right, we're picking up. The trio is flying 20 minutes east onto Kanik Glacier. Because the ice moves about three feet daily, they need to find where the river is today. The glacier is so dynamic, it's just changing every day. It's different out here. It's melting so fast. Do you find rivers like these on the glacier often? There are rivers all over the glacier, but this is the biggest one I've ever found. Really? How long is it? It's probably four miles long. Wow. I mean, it's a full on whitewater river down the glacier, so I'm just lucky I got crazy friends to go with me. Yeah, you're pretty lucky. Yeah. <laughs> Looking good here. Back at the hangar, Joe and Mark are prepping for an unusual safety check. Danger, high pressure cylinder, don't drop. Mishandling may cause injury or death. I know. I'll do the injury, you do the death. Today we're going to go out and deploy our pop-out emergency floats on our R44 so that if we go down and we're over water, we can pop these floats and it'll keep us from sinking or rolling over. It could save our lives. What it does is it pops these snaps instantly and the floats blow up like a big sausage. And it's a little loud. It's a little thrilling. Water in Alaska is deadly, everywhere. No matter where you are, if you go into the water, it's going to be cold, and you won't last long. Man, I hope these work. <laughs> I think on a scale of 1 to 10, my apprehensive level is probably at about 14. OK, I hope this side works. Because there's a lot of things that can go wrong. When we pull the trigger, the cable could break. If the helium doesn't go down the hoses and into the floats, we can go down into the lake. I'm a little worried about this whole thing. So you're sitting in this seat when I pop the floats? Yep. That's mm -hmm. good. That's good. The floats are inflated by a can of pressurized helium stored below the passenger seat. So when that bottle blows up, no more children for me. <laughs> Let's go. OK, I think we're ready. Are you scared? <laughs> Never. I'm scared. I'll take care of you. OK. Joel and Mark are headed to Birchwood for the test, a 20-minute flight northeast of Anchorage. Man, I hope these floats work. This is crazy. I hate doing this. <laughs> it's going to go perfect. Man, no, it's not. I'm Mr. Negative. I'm the Tenalian Aviation negative person. I'm the positive. OK. We're not going to crash. 
I don't think. <laughs> there are countless perils bush pilots must overcome. One of the most feared, mechanical issues. Okay, we just had an alternator failure. We got an alternator getting weak or else the belt is kind of loose. Yeah, I, I just don't know. The red light is on. That's a little odd, isn't it? The alternator is the helicopter's only source of electrical power. Without it, they're running on a limited amount of battery power. What's your power? I'll check your power. Power's coming down. Shut this thing off, man. While en route to Birchwood to test the R-44's emergency water floats. OK, we just had an alternator failure. Joel and Mark run into trouble. This isn't a drill. We got an alternator getting weak, or else the belt is kind of loose. Yeah, I, I just don't know. The red light is on. That's a little odd, isn't it? The battery is the source of electrical power for the helicopter, and the alternator is what keeps it charged up. And so if we lose our alternator, we're in trouble. What's your power? I'll check your power. Power's coming down. Why don't you shut this thing off, man? Good idea. I hit the reset. Resetting the alternator should get it going again, but there's no guarantee. Nice and easy, pulling the power back in. It worked. There we go. The alternator's working again, but now the weather is causing issues. Wind is pretty strong. So the wind, it's like a weather vane. It'll try to turn you around. So just stay on it. OK. There's a pretty good lake down there we can go try. Yeah, man, that looks good, Joel. OK, buddy. <laughs> Why am I freaking out over here? <laughs> Gee whiz. Mark's fear is justified. If the floats don't deploy, the helicopter could end up in the water. OK, the trigger's armed. We're ready to pull. I hate this part. We're deploying the floats. Three, two, one. Ah, is yours blown up? Are both of them blown up on your side? Mine both are. I'm looking at, yes. OK, I'm going to set it down close to shore here. OK. Nice and gentle. Nice and gentle. We are on the water. OK. We are on the water. We've got to push forward. We're drifting into the reason. OK. Here. We're backing up. We're backing up, backing up, backing up, backing up. Push forward. I know I'm a little bit of a nagging mom doing this, but we only blow these floats every three years. And I'm a little bit out of my comfort zone because we don't do it all the time. OK, let's lift up. Wow. It went perfect. <laughs> Joel, you're incredible. Good job. OK, my heart's beating out of my chest still. Do we own any anti-adrenaline? <laughs> doing anything with Mark is fun but especially when there's tension or adventure or something a little bit scary involved, because he magnifies it 10 times, and he's talking a lot. <laughs> I don't mind doing it when I'm driving. <laughs> it's like teaching your daughter how to drive a car. You're just sitting over here going, holy crap, holy crap, holy crap. It's all good. Woo! <laughs> That's fun. Man alive! Woo! <laughs> Forty miles to the east, Josiah is having a little more fun than Mark. Wow, look at that. Oh, man. He and some friends are going whitewater rafting on Kanik Glacier. So we're just coming around the corner here, and the glacier looks amazing. Wow. Yeah, it looks really nice out there. They're searching for a river created by the melting ice. I'm going to raft down with you, kind of as guide. Pablo's going to be in the helicopter above us, um, and he's going to be kind of watching us, keeping an eye on us. But he's going to make sure we don't fall in a crevasse? He's going to make sure if we do go down a crevasse, somebody will know where we are. OK. That's good. Crevasses, or moulons, 
are massive glacier holes that can be hundreds of feet deep. Wow, look at these crevasses. Yeah. This whole glacial river ends in a huge moulin, which is a, a massive hole straight to the bottom of the glacier where all this water is running. And we definitely don't want to go into the moulin. That's a one-way ticket. You're not coming back out of there alive. Extreme sports like this are riddled with dangers. We're going to really have to scout out this river and pick a good place to run it and make sure we all stay safe up here. The ice is extremely sharp. So we want to be really careful and uh, not cut ourselves up. And don't put your feet down. If you put your feet down as you're floating downstream, you have a really good chance of getting your foot caught in a crevasse and snapping your leg. a little chilly, right? That's another thing we really got to be aware of is hypothermia. We're going to be completely submerged in ice cold glacier water. And uh, if we get a rip in our suits, we got to make sure we get out of the water right away because that, that will debilitate you very fast and you won't even be able to uh, climb up out of that ravine. A little scared. Oh, my mom, I love her. Okay. <laughs> Also scary, flying above a glacier, the ice emits cold air that can create unpredictable and violent winds. Oh baby, we're getting some turbulence right here. I think I'm just gonna drop down lower and uh, kind of get close to the ground, try to stay out of these big bumps. I think it's just coming down this other valley here. Once we get by here, it'll probably smooth out. Wow, we're twisting everywhere. Helicopters um, with this rotor rotor system don't handle, don't handle turbulence that well. So if we start getting bumped any bigger than what we just had, we're going to have to find a different, different place to go. Oh, look at those glaciers up there. Pretty cool. Josiah and his friends are flying above Kinnick Glacier. They're searching for a river that has formed on the surface. I'm feeling a little nauseous back here. But high winds and turbulence are taking their toll. I'll open the vents here and try to find some smoother air. How much longer is this one gonna last? I think as soon as we get across this, this valley here, we'll be fine. Do you have any bags just in case? Some thick bags? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Right in your, that pocket behind your seat. Yeah, we got good air here now. This is all good. Smooth sailing. That feels better. All right, here's the river right here. Oh, wow. Is that the blue one? Yeah. Yeah, this is going to be pretty bumpy. You know, we fly over this crevasse and it just goes down, straight down. There's another big crevasse right down here. Yeah, here's another crevasse. That the, that the river is running over and through. If that crevasse opens while we're floating in there, we go right down. I don't want to be in that. You think the water's better further up? Yeah. I'm gonna make just a little tiny detour here. Josiah will head a mile upstream to see if that section of the river looks more stable. This is looking really nice through here. This might be a good spot to put in. Nice pool there. Yeah. Ooh, here's a oh, waterfall. waterfall. Yes, I'm doing that. Yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> we're going to have to drink some whiskey or something we're gonna when we get done We're going to have to take this. some shots of something. Got to get some liquid courage. <laughs> OK, cool, you guys. I think I think this is going to be great. I like it. All right. I think I got a good landing spot really nearby here. I think I can set down right here. All right, you guys, we're down. We're on the glacier. What a smooth landing. Well, thank you. You ready to do this thing? I don't know. <laughs> They'll all wear dry suits, which should keep them warm in the freezing water. That is, if they can get them on. I don't think it'll fit. Does my butt look all right? <laughs> Joking aside, the first order of business is making sure they stay alive. We definitely have to get out before we get to the Mulan. 
So we have a big cargo net and we're gonna set some ice screws in ice and uh, stretch this net across the stream. That way if anything weird happens, uh, we get knocked unconscious. That net will catch us. It's kind of a last chance. Okay, should I start to pull it across? Yeah, go for it. I'll grab this side. All right. All right, I'm clipped. Current's really strong. Yeah, I'm fighting it. Be careful. Get that thing clipped. All right, All right. we're good. All right. Hey, Pablo. <laughs> hey, Josiah. You sorry took me a little bit. Oh, man, you made it. Yeah. We got the net set up. It looks good. We got all suited up. We're ready to go. OK, great. So I think I'm going to hover on that side of the channel. Yeah, so. just keep an eye on us. We're going to put in way up there. Man, if we get into trouble, land and help us out. OK, I'll be watching you. All right. <laughs> OK, you guys ready? We're ready to do this? To go. Cool, man. Awesome. Yeah. We got to go get our pool toys, our blow-up turtles. We got Pablo in the air spotting us. We got the net set up. We got all the safety stuff. We got all the right gear. You still got to be careful. There's danger getting in, danger getting out, sharp ice everywhere. So, you know, it's good to just to keep your heads in the game because you never can tell what's going to happen. All right, here's our butt in. Josiah and his friends are rafting down a river on Kanik Glacier. What do you think? Think it looks good? Yeah, right on. A fun but extreme adventure that could quickly go awry. I'm going to go ahead of you in case you get into trouble. I'll keep an eye on you. I'll be right there. We got these toys, these pool toys. They're going to be awesome, but they might pop or you might lose them in, in some of these waves here. If that happens, just turn over on your butt. Just keep your hands and your feet up. Don't try to stand up in this current. You can end up stepping right into a crevasse or a hole, and the current will just snap your leg off or your arm. All right, lead the way. All right, let's do it. It's kind of taking a chance jumping in. We scouted it really good, but you never really know what you're going to get coming coming through some of those holes. A little shallow spot here. Oh! How you doing, Katie? Oh, on well, there. I'm going really fast. So oh, fast. <laughs> Woo! Go, go! Keep go going! Go on! Woo-hoo! Go! Woo! Yeah! That was sick. Oh my oh god. My god. <laughs> Bubble, man. Hey. I'm out of control. <laughs> Jeez. Thanks for keeping an eye on us, man. No problem. Man. How would it look from up there? It was great. Everything looked good. I'm, but I, I wish next time um, I'm going to be in the water. <laughs> man, it was cold, but it was wild. It was amazing. It was a once in a lifetime opportunity. That was sick, you guys. I can't believe we just did that. That was awesome. I don't think the turtles made it. I think the turtles are done. It was the best water slide in the world. It was a little hard to control where you were going, but I let go of my fear a little bit and just kind of went with the current, you know? Only in Alaska. Only in Alaska can you float down a, a whitewater river on top of a glacier. Ice rafting. Only, Only in Alaska. <laughs> Who else does that? Who has done that? I mean, we must be one of just a handful of people who've ever done that. Well, man, let's go start drinking. <laughs>